Cassandra Rising, edited by Alice Lawrence. Copyright 1978 by Laura W. Haywood. Narrated by Barbara Caruso. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. About the editor. Alice Lawrence is a freelance writer whose stories have appeared in many magazines, including Galaxy and Vertex, and have been anthologized several times. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. Except for historic figures, and where otherwise indicated, all of the characters in this book are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. In Memoriam, Joan Weber Janus, 1946-1973, Elizabeth Haywood Woody, 1939-1964. Contents. Preface, Alice Lawrence, Side 1. Forward, Andre Norton, Side 1. S.Q. Ursula K. Le Guin, Side 1. Flirtation Walk, K. Rogers, Side 1. Troll Road, Joan Bernat, Side 1. There Was a Garden, Zena Henderson, Side 1. Night Rise, Catherine McLean, Side 2. Mother Beast, Kathleen Sky, Side 2. Escape to the Suburbs, Rachel Cosgrove Pays, Side 2. Alien Sensation, Josephine Saxton, Side 3. Last one in is a rotten egg. Grania Davis, Side 3. The Way Back, Raylin Moore, Side 3. Schlossy, Alice Lawrence, Side 3. Lady in Waiting, Anne McCaffrey, Side 3. Impact, Steve Barnes, Side 3. The Slow and Gentle Progress of Trainee Bell Ringers, Barbara Paul, Side 4. Nightfire, Sidney J. Van Skyuk, Side 4. Selena, Beverly Goldberg, Side 4. Uruguayan and I, Miriam Allen DeFord and Juanita Coulson, Side 5. The Vanilla Mint Tapestry, Jacqueline Lichtenberg, Side 5. Space Time Arabesque, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough, Side 6. Preface by Alice Lawrence. It seems to be traditional for editors of science fiction anthologies to offer their own definitions of science fiction, which is why there are as many definitions as there are anthologies. Purists may note that not all anthologies contain a definition, but it must be kept in mind that there are unethical individuals who offer definitions without editing anthologies, which evens things up. When I teach science fiction, I tell my students it is fiction which takes place elsewhere, else when, or else how. Elsewhere, in some other part or dimension of the universe. Else when, in the future, the distant past, or in some warp of time. Else how, no matter how normal and familiar the setting and characters may seem, something isn't quite in sync with reality as we live it. The joy of science fiction is that it offers scope. The writer doing a mystery or mainstream story creates people and a situation. Only the science fiction writer can go all the way, inventing the world where the characters, not necessarily people in the usual meaning of the word, play out the situation. Geography, racial characteristics, history, customs, language, government, law, these come not from what is, but from the part of the writer's mind which deals with what if. Science fiction gives a writer, and by extension a reader, scope in another sense. It is the only genre genuinely and necessarily concerned with ideas. The science fiction reader is a daring soul who, far from fearing the unknown, actively seeks it. Science fiction is wide open to intellectual speculation. In the 1977 Nebula, SFWA Banquet, Isaac Asimov noted that while science fiction writers can and often do successfully venture outside the genre, writers from other fields rarely succeed in bringing off an isolated science fiction story. Nobody dashes off a really good piece of science fiction. The very scope of the field demands discipline and hard work. The writer setting his story in the world that is can describe his characters and their situation in relatively few words. 
the reader can be relied on to bring certain knowledge to the reading. The science fiction writer starts with no such advantage. The reader cannot possibly possess knowledge of that which heretofore has existed only in the writer's imagination. The writer has to create the world, but he or she also has to communicate it clearly, naturally, and without interfering with the narrative. It isn't easy. Nor is it easy to create those worlds. Even God needed six days of hard work to make just one. The writer faces the same challenge God did. The whole thing has to be internally consistent to work. There are ramifications to the smallest details. If characters are given exceptionally keen hearing, for example, there has to be a reason why this trait developed. Perhaps some predator in the past emitted a warning sound, which the race had to learn to hear to survive. But then the writer has to account for the predator. Moreover, that keen hearing which the writer included only to solve some small plot problem, how did Jumplug know of the invasion? Ah, his keen ears allowed him to overhear a whispered conversation is probably going to affect other things in the culture being invented, such as art forms, music. The writer has to account for that, too. So, science fiction is the most challenging, and depending on your success, the most frustrating or satisfying literary form. For a number of years it did not seem women were accepting the challenge of science fiction. Andre Norton, in her foreword, will point out that seem is the operative word in that sentence. Today, women are more and more evident in the ranks of science fiction writers, in quantity and particularly in quality. Cassandra is on the ascent. In her time, the original Cassandra was not believed when she told the truth. The twenty Cassandras you are about to read are also telling truths. I hope you will believe them. Forward by Andre Norton The Girl and the B.E.M. One needs only to look at the crudely bright jackets of some of the early pulp magazines, now rare collector's items, by the way, to gauge the standing of feminine characters in the stories then appearing in practically the only market open to writers of science fiction and fantasy. More often than not, an extremely lightly clad girl was either struggling with or fleeing from what was generally known in the trade as a B.E.M., a bug-eyed monster. Though what salacious interest a crab-handed, eight-legged worm spider or something of like nature might have in a human female was never explained. The role of such a heroine was well defined. She existed to be rescued, to sustain the ego of the hero, to provide a decorative touch which really hardly affected the progress of the plot. At the same time, the woman writer in the field lurked in disguise. She either assumed a pen name, which could be considered masculine, or used initials to conceal what editors maintained was the off-putting fact that she was rashly invading what was considered to be a strictly masculine field of literature. The proper protagonist was always, of course, male. Only C. L. Moore in those early days dared defy custom when she wrote her famous Gyral of Jory tales. Fortunately, recently again made available for the enjoyment of a new generation of readers. But she balanced these with the adventures of that superfighter, Northwest Smith. Lee Brackett's haunting and beautifully visualized adventures on other worlds followed the approved pattern. The creations of Eric John Stark, as well as her accounts of the wonders of Mars and Venus, are just as readable today as when they were first conceived and certainly stand equal to the present much-acclaimed characters and action created by Robert E. Howard or other giants of the period. E. B. Cole, in the series of stories centering around the philosophical core, again followed the market's requirements of that time, but her ingenious intrigues were very well handled. The presentation of a believable and important female character by a masculine writer of that same day must, however, require extensive research to find. Robert Heinlein, in the novelette Magic Incorporated, gives us Mrs. Jennings, a notable example of a practical witch. A. A. Merritt's Snake Mother, in The Face in the Abyss, is a totally enchanting but very feminine alien. It was left to Powell Anderson to develop the first equal partnership and eventual marriage in the three novelettes now appearing as Operation Chaos. His werewolf hero and witch heroine are so well matched that neither overshadows the other. They mesh instead into an important single force when there is need. 
In They'd Rather Be Right by Mark Clifton and Frank Riley, an unforgettable character, Mabel the Skid Row dropout, almost walks away with the book because of her courage and determination. But when James Schmitz wrote The Witches of Caris and later The Telsey Stories, a great step forward was taken for heroines, for he created girls and women who were independent of men, with powers and strengths all their own, who dared to challenge hero and villain alike. Then came a new age of women writers, who could and did, since the atmosphere of the times had changed, center on notable female protagonists. Anne McCaffrey produced Restoree, The Ship Who Sang, and Dragon Quest, all landmarks for having heroines who not only fought for and rescued themselves, but gave the heroes more than just encouragement in times of danger. Zena Henderson's fine stories of the people alternated between hero and heroine naturally and realistically while Ursula K. Le Guin's famous work, The Left Hand of Darkness, is almost wholly masculine in treatment, her priestess, in the tombs of Atuan, stands by herself courageously. Madeleine Langles, A Wrinkle in Time, also a prize winner, shows the reader an unattractive heroine, prickly, unhappy, uncertain, but possessing a stubborn will which carries her to victory. The Shattered Chain, Marion Bradley's latest novel, presents a detailed picture of a feminine revolt in a masculine-dominated society, written with deep empathy. Patricia McKillop has gone even farther into the field of subtle relationships between the sexes, using a new concept, that rape may exist on other planes than the physical, and the trauma of such a violation can be even greater in an aftermath of wrath and despair. The Forgotten Beasts of Eld will not be forgotten in a hurry by any careful reader. Tanith Lee's women, with their cruelty and lack of empathy, reflect well the degenerate alien civilizations of which they are a part. The heroine of the birth grave remains a startling and compelling portrait of an alien we cannot begin to judge by our standards at all. On the other hand, C. J. Chera also presents an alien woman driven by the lash of duty and wholly through the eyes of a very well-realized hero. But here the reader can identify with both, even when they stand at cross-purposes, and there seems to be no way of resolving their difficulties. Ms. Chera and many other women writers can envision well-rounded male as well as female characters, to leave the reader well satisfied. In my own case, I began writing when the masculine name, the hero alone, was in primary demand— when I first worked on a heroine-oriented book, Ordeal and Otherwhere, the publisher was very dubious of success, saying my approach could well limit sales. But this gloomy prophecy did not prove true. After years of steady selling, the book is still in print. Now I feel entirely free to present any plot from the point of view which seems to me in accord with the situation, either through a hero or heroine. Sometimes I alternate between them in a single book, giving different points of view of the same action. One thing is true. I have become aware during the past ten years that my fan mail is changing in character. More and more of the letters I receive are written by girls and women. With science fiction classes now common in both high schools and colleges, the number of readers is increasing yearly, with apparently women readers well to the fore. It is my hope that future writers will consider the point of equal billing for both hero and heroine. There is no reason why... The separate abilities of a man and a woman, though differing somewhat in nature, cannot be fitted together, each to supply what the other may lack, to form a much stronger whole. This is a purpose I have been trying to follow for some time in my own work. The girl with the BEM is past history. Now let us have the girl who can take her own chances and stand shoulder to shoulder with any hero. Cassandra Rising Introduction to S.Q. Ursula K. Le Guin has twice won both the Nebula and Hugo Awards, in 1969 for The Left Hand of Darkness and in 1975 for The Dispossessed. Her other awards are too numerous to list. While one doesn't automatically associate humor with Ms. Le Guin, one tends instead to think of the strength of steel, paradoxically combined with the delicacy of poetry. She displayed a delightful sense of humor in the introductions to her stories in The Wind's Twelve Quarters. In S.Q. she again reveals this side of her talent. But the story is far more than an amusing tale. It is a devastating portrait of the political mind, fanatic in its quest for power. S.Q. by Ursula K. Le Guin I think what Dr. Speakey has done is wonderful. 
He is a wonderful man. I believe that. I believe that people need beliefs. If I didn't have my belief, I really don't know what would happen. And if Dr. Speakey hadn't truly believed in his work, he couldn't possibly have done what he did. Where would he have found the courage? What he did proves his genuine sincerity. There was a time when a lot of people tried to cast doubts on him. They said he was seeking power. That was never true. From the very beginning, all he wanted was to help people and make a better world. The people who called him a power seeker and a dictator were just the same ones who used to say that Hitler was insane and Nixon was insane and all the world leaders were insane and the arms race was insane and our misuse of natural resources was insane and the whole world civilization was insane and suicidal. They were always saying that. And they said it about Dr. Speakey. But he stopped all that insanity, didn't he? So he was right all along, and he was right to believe in his beliefs. I came to work for him when he was named the chief of the Psychometric Bureau. I used to work at the UN, and when the world government took over the New York UN building, they transferred me up to the 35th floor to be the head secretary in Dr. Speakey's office. I knew already that it was a position of great responsibility, and I was quite excited the whole week before my new job began. I was so curious to meet Dr. Speakey, because, of course, he was already famous. I was there right at the dot of nine on Monday morning, and when he came in, it was so wonderful. He looked so kind. You could tell that the weight of his responsibilities was always on his mind, but he looked so healthy and positive. And there was a bounce in his step. I used to think it was as if he had rubber balls in the toes of his shoes. He smiled and shook my hand and said in such a friendly, confident voice, And you must be Mrs. Smith. I've heard wonderful things about you. We're going to have a wonderful team here, Mrs. Smith. Later on, he called me by my first name, of course. That first year, we were mostly busy with information— the World Government Presidium and all the member states had to be fully informed about the nature and purpose of the SQ test before the actual implementation of its application could be eventualized. That was good for me, too, because in preparing all that information, I learned all about it myself. Often, taking dictation, I learned about it from Dr. Speakey's very lips. By May, I was enough of an expert that I was able to prepare the basic SQ information pamphlet for publication, just from Dr. Speakey's notes. It was such fascinating work. As soon as I began to understand the SQ test plan, I began to believe in it. That was true of everybody in the office and in the Bureau. Dr. Speakey's sincerity and scientific enthusiasm were infectious. Right from the beginning, we had to take the test every quarter, of course, and some of the secretaries used to be nervous before they took it, but I never was. It was so obvious that the test was right. If you scored under 50, it was nice to know that you were sane. But even if you scored over 50, that was fine, too, because then you could be helped. And anyway, it is always best to know the truth about yourself. As soon as the information service was functioning smoothly, Dr. Speakey transferred the main thrust of his attention to the implementation of evaluator training and planning for the structurization of the cure centers. Only he changed the name to SQ Achievement Centers. It seemed a very big job. Even then, we certainly had no idea how big the job would finally turn out to be. As he said at the beginning, we were a very good team. Dr. Speakey valued my administrative abilities and put them to good use. There wasn't a single slacker in the office. We all worked very hard, and there were always rewards. I remember one wonderful day I had accompanied Dr. Speakey to the meeting of the board of the Psychometric Bureau. The emissary from the state of Brazil announced that his state had adopted the Bureau recommendations for universal testing. We had known that was going to be announced. But then the delegate from Libya and the delegate from China announced that their state had adopted the test, too. Oh, Dr. Speakey's face was just like the sun for a minute, just shining. I wish I could remember exactly what he said, especially to the Chinese delegate, because, of course, China was a very big state, and its decision was very influential. Unfortunately, I do not have his exact words because I was changing the tape in the recorder. He said something like, Gentlemen, this is a historic day for humanity. Then he began to talk at once about the effective implementation of the application centers, where people would take the test, and the achievement centers, where they would go if they scored over 50. 
and how to establish the test administrations and evaluations, infrastructure on such a large scale, and so on. He was always modest and practical. He would rather talk about doing the job than talk about what an important job it was. He used to say, once you know what you are doing, the only thing you need to think about is how to do it. I believe that is deeply true. From then on, we could hand over the information program to a sub-department and concentrate on how to do it. Those were exciting times. So many states joined the plan one after another. When I think of all we had to do, I wonder that we didn't all go crazy. Some of the office staff did fail their quarterly test, in fact, but most of us working in the executive office with Dr. Speakey remained quite stable, even when we were on the job all day and half the night. I think his presence was an inspiration. He was always calm and positive. Even when we had to arrange things like training 113,000 Chinese evaluators in three months, you can always find out how if you just know the why, he would say, and we always did. When you think back over it, it really is quite amazing what a big job it was, so much bigger than anybody, even Dr. Speakey had realized it would be. It just changed everything. You only realize that when you think back to what things used to be like. Can you imagine? When we began planning universal testing for the state of China, we only allowed for 1,100 achievement centers, with 6,800 staff. It really seems like a joke, but it is not. I was going through some of the old files yesterday, making sure everything is in order, and I found the first China implementation plan with those figures written down in black and white. I believe the reason why even Dr. Speakey was slow to realize the magnitude of the operation was that even though he was a great scientist, he was also an optimist. He just kept hoping against hope that the average scores would begin to go down, and this prevented him from seeing that universal application of the SQ test was eventually going to involve everybody, either as inmates or as staff. When most of the Russian and all the African states had adopted the recommendations and were busy implementing them, the debates in the General Assembly of the World Government got very excited. That was the period when so many bad things were said about the test and about Dr. Speakey. I used to get quite angry reading the World Times reports of the debates. When I went as his secretary with Dr. Speakey to General Assembly meetings, I had to sit and listen in person to people insulting him personally, casting aspersions on his motives and questioning his scientific integrity and even his sincerity. Many of those people were very disagreeable and obviously unbalanced, but he never lost his temper. He would just stand up and prove to them again that the SQ test did actually, literally, scientifically show whether the testee was sane or insane. And the results could be proved, and all psychometrists accepted them. So the test ban people couldn't do anything but shout about freedom and accuse Dr. Speakey and the Psychometric Bureau of trying to turn the world into a huge insane asylum. He would always answer quietly and firmly asking them how they thought a person could be free if he suffered under a delusional system, or was prey to compulsions and obsessions, or could not endure contact with reality. How could those who lacked mental health be truly free? What they called freedom might well be a delusional system with no contact with reality. In order to find out, all they had to do was to become testees. Mental health is freedom, he said. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, they say, and now we have an infallible watchdog to watch for us, the SQ test. Only the testees can be truly free. There really was no answer they could make to that except illogical and vulgar accusations, which did not convince the delegates who had invited them to speak. Sooner or later the delegates, even from member states where the test ban movement was strong, would volunteer to take the SQ test to prove that their mental health was adequate to their responsibilities. Then the ones that passed the test and remained in office would begin working for universal application in their home state. The riots and demonstrations and things like the burning of the Houses of Parliament in London, in the state of England, where the... Northern European SQ Center was housed, and the Vatican Rebellion and the Chilean H-bomb were the work of insane fanatics appealing to the most unstable elements of the populace. 
Such fanatics, as Dr. Speakey and Dr. Waltrout pointed out in their memorandum to the Presidium, deliberately aroused and used the proven instability of the crowd, mob psychosis. The only response to mass delusion of that kind was immediate implementation of the testing program in the disturbed states and immediate amplification of the asylum program. That was Dr. Speakey's own decision, by the way, to rename the SQ Achievement Centers Asylums. He took the word right out of his enemies' mouths. He said, An asylum means a place of shelter, a place of cure. Let there be no stigma attached to the word insane, to the word asylum, to the words insane asylum. No, for the asylum is the haven of mental health, the place of cure, where the anxious gain peace, where the weak gain strength, where the prisoners of inadequate reality assessment win their way to freedom. Proudly let us use the word asylum. Proudly let us go to the asylum to work to regain our own God-given mental health, or to work with others less fortunate to help them win back their own inalienable right to mental health. And let one word be written large over the door of every asylum in the world. Welcome. Those words are from his great speech at the General Assembly on the day World Universal Application was decreed by the Presidium. Once or twice a year I listen to my tape of that speech, although I am too busy ever to get really depressed. Now and then I feel the need of a tiny pick-me-up, and so I play that tape. It never fails to send me back to my duties, inspired and refreshed. Considering all the work there was to do, as the test scores continued to come in always a little higher than the psychometric bureau analysts estimated— the World Government Presidium did a wonderful job for the two years that it administered universal testing. There was a long period, six months, when the scores seemed to have stabilized, with just about half of the testees scoring over 50 and half under 50. At that time it was thought that if 40% of the mentally healthy were assigned to asylum staff work, the other 60% could keep up routine basic world functions, such as farming, power supply, transportation, etc. This proportion had to be reversed when they found that over 60% of the mentally healthy were volunteering for staff work in order to be with their loved ones in the asylums. There was some trouble, then, with the routine, basic world functions functioning. However, even then, contingency plans were being made for the inclusion of farmlands, factories, power plants, etc., in the asylum territories, and the assignment of routine, basic world functions work as rehabilitation therapy, so that the asylums could become totally self-supporting, if it became advisable. This was President Kim's special care, and he worked for it all through his term of office. Events proved the wisdom of his planning. He seemed such a nice, wise little man. I still remember the day when Dr. Speakey came into the office, and I knew at once that something was wrong. Not that he ever got really depressed or reacted with inopportune emotion, but it was as if the rubber balls in his shoes had gone just a little bit flat. There was the slightest tremor of true sorrow in his voice when he said, Mary Ann, we've had a bit of bad news, I'm afraid. Then he smiled to reassure me, because he knew what a strain we were all working under, and certainly didn't want to give anybody a shock that might push their score up higher on the next quarterly test. It's President Kim, he said, and I knew it once. I knew he didn't mean the President was ill or dead. Over fifty? I asked, and he just said quietly and sadly, Fifty-five. Poor little President Kim, working so efficiently all that three months, while mental ill health was growing in him. It was very sad, and also a useful warning. High-level consultations were begun at once, as soon as President Kim was committed, and the decision was made to administer the test monthly, instead of quarterly, to anyone in an executive position. Even before this decision, the universal scores had begun rising again. Dr. Speakey was not distressed. He had already predicted that this rise was highly probable during the transition period to world sanity. As the number of the mentally healthy living outside the asylums grew fewer, the strain on them kept growing greater, and they became more liable to break down under it, just as poor President Kim had done. Later, when the rehabs began coming out of the asylums in ever-increasing numbers, this stress would decrease. 
Also, the crowding in the asylums would decrease, so that the staff would have more time to work on individually orientated therapy, and this would lead to a still more dramatic increase in the number of rehabs released. Finally, when the therapy process was completely perfected, including preventive therapy, there might be no asylums left in the world at all, because everybody will be either mentally healthy, or a rehab, or neo-normal, as Dr. Speakey liked to call it. It was the trouble in the state of Australia that precipitated the government crisis. Some psychometric bureau officials accused the Australian evaluators of actually falsifying test returns. But that is impossible since all the computers are linked to the world government's central computer bank in Keokuk. Dr. Speakey suspected that the Australian evaluators had been falsifying the test itself and insisted that they themselves all be tested immediately. Of course, he was right. It had been a conspiracy, and the suspiciously low Australian test scores had resulted from the use of a false test. Many of the conspirators tested higher than 80 when forced to take the genuine test. The state government in Canberra had been unforgivably lax. If they had just admitted it, everything would have been all right, but they got hysterical and moved the state government to a sheep station in Queensland and tried to withdraw from the world government. Dr. Speakey said this was a typical mass psychosis, reality evasion, followed by fugue and autistic withdrawal. Unfortunately, the Presidium seemed to be paralyzed. Australia seceded on the day before the President and Presidium were due to take their monthly test, and probably they were afraid of overstraining their SQ with agonizing decisions. So the Psychometric Bureau volunteered to handle the episode. Dr. Speakey himself flew on the plane with the H-bombs and helped to drop the information leaflets. He never lacked personal courage. When the Australian incident was over, it turned out that most of the Presidium, including President Singh, had scored over 50. So the Psychometric Bureau took over their functions temporarily. Even on a long-term basis, this made good sense, since all the problems now facing the world government had to do with administering and evaluating the test, training the staff, and providing full self-sufficiency structuration to all asylums. What this meant in personal terms was that Dr. Speakey, as chief of the Psychometric Bureau, was now interim president of the United States of the world. As his personal secretary, I was, I will admit it, just terribly proud of him. But he never let it go to his head. He was so modest. Sometimes he used to say to people, when he introduced me, this is Mary Ann, my secretary, he'd say with a little twinkle. If it wasn't for her, I'd have been scoring over fifty long ago. He truly appreciated efficiency and reliability. That's why we made such a good team, all those years we worked together. There were times, as the World SQ scores rose and rose, that I would become a little discouraged. Once the week's test figures came in on the readout, and the average score was 71, I said, Doctor, there are moments I believe the whole world is going insane. But he said, Look at it this way, Marianne. Look at those people in the asylums. 3.1 billion inmates now, and 1.8 billion staff. But look at them. What are they doing? They're pursuing their therapy, doing rehabilitation work on the farms and in the factories, and striving all the time, too, to help each other toward mental health. The preponderant inverse sanity quotient is certainly very high at the moment. They're mostly insane, yes, but you have to admire them. They are fighting for mental health. They will, they will win through. And then he dropped his voice and said, as if to himself, gazing out the window and bouncing just a little on the balls of his feet. If I didn't believe that, I couldn't go on. And I knew he was thinking of his wife. Mrs. Speakey had scored 88 on the very first American Universal Test. She had been in the Greater Los Angeles Territory Asylum for years now. Anybody who still thinks Dr. Speakey wasn't sincere should think about that for a minute. He gave up everything for his belief. And even when the asylums were all running quite well and the epidemics in South Africa and the famines in Texas and the Ukraine were under control, still the workload on Dr. Speakey never got any lighter because every month the personnel of the Psychometric Bureau got smaller, since some of them always flunked their monthly test and were committed to Bethesda.
I never could keep any of my secretarial staff any more for longer than a month or two. It was harder and harder to find replacements, too, because most sane young people volunteered for staff work in the asylums. Since life was much easier and more sociable inside the asylums than outside, everything so convenient and lots of friends and acquaintances, I used to positively envy those girls. But I knew where my job was. At least it was much less hectic here in the UN building, or the psychometry tower as it has been renamed long ago. Often there wouldn't be anybody around the whole building all day long but Dr. Speakey and myself, and maybe Bill the janitor. Bill scored thirty-two regular as clockwork every quarter. All the restaurants were closed. In fact, most of Manhattan was closed. But we had fun picnicking in the old General Assembly Hall, and there was always the odd call from Buenos Aires or Reykjavik asking Dr. Speakey's advice as interim president about some problem to break the silence. But last November 8th, I will never forget the date, when Dr. Speakey was dictating the referendum for world economic growth for the next five-year period, he suddenly interrupted himself. By the way, Marianne, he said, how was your last score? We had taken the test two days before, on the 6th. We always took the test, every first Monday. Dr. Speakey never would have dreamed of accepting himself from universal testing regulations. I scored 12, I said, before I thought how strange it was of him to ask. Or not just to ask, because we often mentioned our scores to each other, but to ask then, in the middle of executing important world government business. Wonderful he said, shaking his head. You're wonderful, Mary Ann. Down two from last month's test, aren't you? I'm always between ten and fourteen, I said. Nothing new about that, Doctor. Some day, he said, and his face took on the expression it had when he gave his great speech about the asylums. Some day this world of ours will be governed by men fit to govern it, men whose SQ score is zero. Zero, Mary Ann. Well, my goodness, doctor, I said jokingly. His intensity almost alarmed me a little. Even you never scored lower than three, and you haven't done that for a year or more now. He stared at me almost as if he didn't see me. It was quite uncanny. Some day, he said in just the same way, nobody in the world will have a quotient higher than fifty. Some day, nobody in the world will have a quotient higher than thirty. Higher than ten, the therapy will be perfected. I was the only diagnostician, but the therapy will be perfected. The cure will be found some day. And he went on, staring at me, and then he said, Do you know what my score was on Monday? Seven, I guessed promptly. The last time he had told me his score, it had been seven. Ninety-two, he said. I laughed, because he seemed to be laughing. He had always had a puckish sense of humor that came out unexpectedly, but I thought we really should get back to the World Economic Growth Plan, so I said laughingly, that really is a very bad joke, Doctor. Ninety-two, he said, and you don't believe me, Mary Ann, but that's because of the cantaloupe. I said, what cantaloupe, Doctor? And that was when he jumped across his desk and began to try to bite through my jugular vein. I used a judo hold and shouted to Bill the janitor, and when he came I called a robo-admulence to take Dr. Speakey to Bethesda Asylum. That was six months ago. I visit Dr. Speakey every Saturday. It is very sad. He is in the McLean area, which is the violent ward, and every time he sees me he screams and foams. But I do not take it personally. One should never take mental ill health personally. When the therapy is perfected, he will be completely rehabilitated. Meanwhile, I just hold on here. Bill keeps the floors clean, and I run the world government. It really isn't as difficult as you might think. Introduction to Flirtation Walk Kay Rogers is a Pennsylvanian, a green-eyed redhead who has somehow contrived to remain single, if anyone who lives with thirty-four cats can be said to be single. I've only read two stories by Ms. Rogers. One is Experiment, originally published in fantasy and science fiction, and later anthologized. Flirtation Walk is the other. 
I love them both. Flirtation Walk by K. Rogers. Cadet Scott closed the inner lock. He crossed his narrow living quarters to the even more cramped security cells. There he checked the temperature of a tiny compartment, adjusted a dial. From a special pouch on the crossbelt over his chest, he brought out a plyo-covered packet and stowed it within the compartment. He did this without distaste. By now, he decided he was proud of his control, and he spared only a quick, flicking glance at the empty prisoner cubicle. His eyes, gray-blue and clear with youth, were emotionless, but he was glad he had the package, and the cubicle carried no passenger. In this N.O., because of Number Three's image maintenance, the ten citizen leaders had issued what Cadet Scott called a direct directive— they hadn't wanted a prisoner to torture and brainwash through an educational public trial. He went into his control room. Already he responded to the difference in the air. This supplied air was cool and tasteless, and he was glad to breathe it again. Disciplined air. And his one-man pursuit spacer was comfortably familiar. The wildness on Loris had been sweet, but tomorrow always came. You were trained to it, and you expected it. There had once been a brave little band who cried, Tomorrow the world. That was what Terran cadet training did for you. Taught you how to live in discipline for tomorrow, which the CLs promised to the cadets personally. So, there was this extra pride to know he was fit, mentally as well as physically, to serve remote, nearly godlike leaders. Cadet Scott's fingers moved expertly, programming the return trip from the pleasure planet. He strapped in, without caring for a last look at the Lurisian's gaudy spaceport. This was partly arrogance. They wouldn't dare touch him, now. For the rest, Cadet Scott's self-portrait didn't include indulgences, like backward glances. Besides, wasn't he the first cadet on an N.O., exposed to a place like Loris, and now headed straight for the barn, mission accomplished? The clicking in control depth stopped. An even hum began— and there was a faint no-color flash across the board, stirring something deep in Cadet Scott's mind. He had dials to watch. He was out of the atmosphere before he permitted the nagging unpleasantness to surface. What color were her eyes? He moved uneasily in the straps, realized suddenly, and hit the release. His return would be an event, although he felt a curious lack of appetite for it. But she was the niece of Citizen Leader Three. Face had been saved. The whole cadet program was justified, ready for activation for the mysterious high goals of the leaders. And Cadet Scott's name would shine, forever burnished in the old cadet hall with those others, which went back so far into hoariness that their glory was a matter of interpretation. But what color were her eyes? He couldn't remember. He recalled Laura's spaceport, boiling with color and motion, steaming with sound, all overlaid with the scent of the ever-close creeping jungle, the smell of spice and sweet corruption. He remembered specific colors, the lax, Lurisian customs, an official informal bottle-green tunic, carelessly waving the cadet by, eager to greet a friend whose black skin was spectacular against his red robe and tiger cloak. Cadet Scott considered it disorganized. He didn't like any of it, he was at a loss and felt vaguely inferior. A cadet. These undisciplined, gaudy rogues looked and acted straight out of the underground. They ran their spaceport efficiently. In his cadet mind, two and two always totaled four. He did not appreciate the paradox of the port. He did not speculate. He squared his helmet and his shoulders. He started off on his mission, not at random, but almost as if at drill— "'marching straight for the pleasure city which adjoined the port "'and was its reason for being. "'Somewhere in that glittering frivolity "'among many other fugitives from the scattered worlds, "'there was one for Cadet Scott to find. "'He moved with ingrained, disciplined arrogance. "'G2 experts on Loris swore a cadet was safe enough "'if he didn't throw his weight around, "'but mobs on Loris formed readily "'and were notoriously mercurial.' and he always must remember he was a despised Terran. All Cadet Scott wanted was his quarry, the foolish girl traitor, 
who thought a miraculous escape was her last word with Terra. She didn't know she was the last link. Those extraordinary circumstances would never recur. The other links were separate, discarnate, could never dream to forge a chain again. The pleasure city dreamed before him under an artificial twilight. There was a crescent moon, a wistful star. It was a determined April mood, laid on a bit thick. But Cadet Scott had no mathematics to slipstick an April mood. He simply didn't see it, or the moon gates tempting into shadowed gardens. He was looking for practical information. So practically, and a trifle bluntly, he stopped the first Lurisian he met. This was a sober individual. He wore three colors, a minimum of jewels. His speech was something else. Our sweet guides? He laughed at the somber figure of the young cadet, the bald question. A lad like you, still in ship rig. You're too dull a bird to appeal to our pretty little girls, and a Terran, too. Drawing it out too flatly. Scott simply waited until the Lurisian had finished his sour smile and decided to give him an answer. He waved an arm behind him toward a stardust of light in the distance. There you'll find them. But perhaps they won't have you, eh, death bird? And he sneered at Cadet Scott's proud elite uniform. For a moment the cadet was startled until he realized this was just stock outworlder to Terran talk. They all tacked on some macabre reminder of why they hated Terrans and kept away from the accursed planet. He forgot the taunt and considered his immediate problem. The guides of Loris were famous, and they were guides with no other obligation unless by mutual arrangements. The Pleasure Center laid no compulsion upon the girls, and this was the part for which Cadet Scott secretly felt inadequate and unprepared, although his briefing had postulated a fake guide, eager to find a permanent protector upon the strange world. They told him she'd be easy to trap. He was to do it that way with smoothness, arousing no notice to what was purely a Terran concern. At least the first part, finding her, wasn't difficult. Even in the big plaza she was easy to spot, though through some feminine magic she looked just like the others, but the same dazzled bewilderment Cadet Scott had felt was in her eyes. Her skin was an imprisoned ivory glow against the careless gold of her companions, and the sight of her and those companions only increased Scott's puzzlement. If these were women, what were Terran females? Even at stud service, his turn had come up once. The girls weren't like this. They wore severe white tunics. They were handsome, husky, capable breeders. In no way were they an interpretation of the fantastic, wishful whispers of the cadet barracks. And the cadets were forbidden other commerce. Their seed was too precious to the future. No American sweethearts for them. Once, Cadet Scott had seen some of the sweethearts promenading by the river, as if they wished to tantalize... They did. How tawdry their coarse pink robes seemed now. They were as crows to hummingbirds. How did you snare a hummingbird? He tried to modify the bluntness he had used on the Lurisian as he dutifully accosted the pale girl. Her eyes, already large, grew larger and darkened in reaction to his uniform and the white-starred helmet. Cadet Scott smiled down at her, only a little stiffly. Lady, I am a stranger. I fear lest I lose my way. With that traditional preliminary, he accepted her as a Lurisian, and he saw her relief. She didn't imagine the swiftness with which the CL's apparatus had traced her. She didn't know the precious cadets had been qualified to execute null orders. He saw the glimmering hope that when her nemesis did come, which she didn't really believe, a cadet companion would be the perfect camouflage. "'Stranger, welcome,' she replied, and hesitated. She hadn't been drilled in the formula as he had. At last she managed the question which accepted him. "'May I show you the way, lest you become lost?' Her voice was sweet smoke. Well, she had been a singer. That was how she'd been led into treason. He stared at her very frankly, in his curiosity. The silks she wore were one with her skin— she smelled like a strange flower, and like one she looked fragile and exotic. 
Cadet Scott wished he had entered more into those whispered speculations in the barracks. He wished he knew more. She was going to guide him about Loris, and she was of his planet, another Terran. Beside her he felt alien, large and awkward, too warm in the uniform's tight collar. He was grateful to see that she was uneasy, but as an artist she had belonged to the tiny social life of their scorned and quarantined planet, and she could better mask her nervousness. Quite naturally she put her hand on his arm, and they began to walk aimlessly. Will you be here long? And she gave him her name, moving her fingers caressingly on his arm. It was a stiff little gesture, and her fingers were very cold. Would the heat of his flesh disgust her? She smiled again, more naturally, and he saw a little dent beside her mouth. He had never seen such a thing. Something else to watch for was that ridiculous trick of slanting a look at him under her lashes. Of course she couldn't look him in the eye, the traitress, but this subterfuge certainly kept you looking at her. That was how he found she did dare look into his eyes, and she was seeing him, not the shadow of the helmet. When they entered a tiny park, the noisy plaza was far behind, and there was no stilted chatter left to use. Scott was compelled by the tremor of that small, cold hand to lay his own large, hot palm over it, and traps were far from his mind. They looked at each other. The same hunger was in both glances. There was a nearly audible click, with no one listening, as something turned off in Cadet Scott. Scott learned, not without embarrassment, how a small, luxurious house might be had. Since traps were far from his mind, he never considered he didn't require so elaborate a snare. His companion, covering her ignorance, insisted whatever he did would be pleasing. Flattered, Scott bought certain items at the gem bazaar, thinking briefly of the CLs with gratitude for that practicality which supplied him with many Lurisian lores. He learned the trick of procrastination. He learned how to deafen that third ear his training had inflicted upon him. It was the quickest study he had ever made, and Cadet Scott had led his class. Last of all, in that little house, he learned there was a shared sweet ignorance which the barracks ramblings had never imagined. This was a complex learning which held back many tomorrows. But even on Loris, time is not suspended. Tomorrow does come. Tomorrow masking is another today. Oddly, it was a phrase of the traitress's beloved forbidden music which made Cadet Scott hear again and remember he had turned something off. They had gone to some sort of a festival. She had been bubbling with excitement, which Scott shared without reason, listening to the sweet husky voice, watching the deep eyes. Music. A strange, bitter drink. The music of old Terra. Scott didn't like the drink. Some of the music made him uneasy. Songs like a restless wind and lonely walking. The courage for it. So her enjoyment was hard to bear. Again he felt alien to her, strangely envious of her pleasure. Then they were playing a soft ballad, and she sang with the performer. The days dwindled down to a precious few. From the others she won a murmur of appreciation, but she turned to Scott, innocently waiting for him to share her pleasure in the music and her own voice. Cadet Scott stood abruptly. We must leave now, he said without explanation. Outside he took her arm. You didn't like the music? No. He was blunt, and there was no aimless walking tonight. Cadet Scott kept a dogged silence, ignoring her questioning glances until they stood again in the tiny isolated park. Among trellised irises and orchids, he demanded, Was it for that music you went to the underground? The two rosy moons Loris featured tonight blushed shadows across her face. Her eyes were wide and incredulous. Her eyes. No, she whispered. Not you. Oh, never you. We coddle our artists, he said loudly, and you are the niece of number three, so you were twice coddled. How could you betray your birthright? 
birthright. She was very bitter. We had to lose it to defeat both our enemies, but they'd never teach you that. How else could you betray me? What you sang about, the precious days, the cadet stumbled. I spent them with you. You gave me a little longer, she agreed bleakly. She looked at him, realized his words were awkward, dying blossoms. Quickly bitter again, she whipped at him. Was that part of the punishment? Was it? He knew her answer, as he knew his own, realized he hadn't needed so elaborate a snare, and knew it had been too large. He remembered her cold hands. He was as cold now. When she bowed her head, turning from him, he drew breath in a harsh sob, but struck expertly with the edge of his palm. Alone, in the scented double moonlight, he retched dryly until the rosy shadows spun. He wiped his mouth. He took his evidence of mission accomplished, doing what he had to do. In haste he heaped ferns, green and bronze, between the trellised flowers. He didn't require many. Cadet Scott went quickly from that place. Bronze and green the ferns, purple and purple the flowers. What color were her eyes? Yesterday's question and Cadet Scott had only tomorrow. And it was already beginning. He had passed orbital patrol. He made his prelim-coded report, received clearance, the coordinates ticking forth on the bright red tape clearing him to Penthauer's high set port. Free air control curtly demanded and took guidance of the last portion of the flight. Cadet Scott cleaned up, put on a fresh uniform, reflecting how, on the American continent, or Terra, as it was called since the Great Burn had been inflicted, no hero was ever dirty. Physically, you had to be pretty for the scanners. The ship spiraled down toward the legendary five-sided building, with its grafted-on tower. Scott had his evidence in the official Eagle Emblazoned case. He was ready, but not eager, to be a hero. He had no time to reflect upon this contradiction. From the silent men in the long black car who met him at the lock and whisked him past security to their grim look-alikes, who spun him up into Pentower, he was moved too fast for considered thinking— he even lacked time to call up and assume that cadet arrogance he had prized. None of that mattered. The citizen leaders didn't want cadets thinking. It was borne in too harshly upon Cadet Scott when he saw how they ignored him after being assured of his success. They talked among themselves, these soft men lounging easily in their opulent room, these men who brag they have given youth a goal, an ideal, in the cadet corps. Scott had time to study them, these ordainers of his rigid life and stunted mind, while they congratulated each other on their newly proven weapon, the Cadet Corps, how their petty scheme would use it against the weary citizens they claimed to lead. Looking at their weak bodies, coddled by cushioned surroundings, with the Cadet's disciplined eye, Scott realized bitterly they were sure he couldn't think. Finally, Citizen Leader One button-pressed for the police tech to run routine check of mission-accomplished evidence. Then he swung to face Scott, and the others followed, giving the young cadet their complete attention. They complimented him freely, too freely, for now he was looking for the undercurrent of patronism. But their fat praise was only a minor bitterness, as Cabot Number One summed up. You are our proof. He said it with all the old pride someone had told Scott was forfeit. There was such a boastful note you could already see yourself a pretty paper hero on posters for the underground to tear down and trample. The police tech entered, quiet and neutral. He sidled along the wall toward Scott, who hoped he wouldn't notice the dampness of the case he had been holding too long. What color were her eyes? It seared through his mind like an electric shock. He would never know. He watched the Poltec leave with them for his retinal pattern check. And Cabot said, Gentlemen, of course, this is our first cadet leader, but also a medal, I think. He smiled thinly, especially in view of the service done for our colleague. I believe, considering that and the underground, our own citizens, yes, the medal, the congressional itself. All the men smiled 
a cynical, knowing in-group. Cabot actually patted Scott's arm. Big, dumb cadet leader. And he had to agree with Cabot. Why hadn't he stayed on Loris? It had never occurred to him. Grief and anger collided. A nova flamed. There was light, fox-colored light. There was value in clear, youthful eyes. Scott smiled boyishly at Cabot, thanked him, stumbling in a pleasing, humble way. He thought of cadet leadership and ultra-prestige with the Corps. He thought of being a paper hero, his face well known to the underground. There would be only the contacts to make, to start the careful forging of a spear tipped by the hard-disciplined Corps. Two and two make ten, enough to pay. There would never be much poetry in Scott, so he would never know the color of the eyes he brought so dutifully from Loris. But later, much later, Scott's legend and the ballads would tell how they were the color of freedom. Introduction to Troll Road Joan Bernat is an attorney, married to an attorney, and a resident of Washington. Originally from Michigan, she began her professional freelance work as a photographer, has worked as a research assistant, and is an inspired maker of film strips. She has not yet written a novel, but her short fiction has appeared in such places as Quark and Dangerous Visions. Troll Road by Joan Bernat There is a road in eastern Pennsylvania that, winding through steep, quiet mountains, bends in and around, almost touching itself at points. It moves gracefully across the range with diamond-shaped signs announcing two-mile-long hills and black arrows indicating sharp curves. Sometimes the road, striped with two center yellow lines, goes hidden into the woods or bursts out over valleys into which it then slowly sinks. Mostly it runs beside the Susquehanna Creek one of those wide, flat, almost eternal rivers, and accompanies a rusted railroad track through the National Forest Preserve and finally over into New Jersey. At one point, the road bends inward and down, abruptly northward, so that a passer-by can see a broad graveyard of rust-red automobiles stretched out below him. In the center of the yard is a mud-water pond, colored by the dust of oxidized metal, and crowded with floating bits of leather and upholstery stuffing, the persistent wind has dislodged from car seats. Beyond the yard along the road are the remains of an old mill and coal town. Almost no one lives there any more. There are a few members of a defunct German ghetto, older persons, the patriarchs and matriarchs of a community that immigrated to early industrial America. One of these is a woman named Ludmilla, who lives on the outskirts of town with her grandniece, Irana. A Jewish man and his small family run a gas station and grocery confectionery, and several farming families live in the surrounding district. From one of these families comes Miles, who seems quite old and wise for his reticence, but is only nineteen. The townspeople and even Miles' own father have called him the ugliest boy in the world. The name of the town, Freedom, is printed in gray letters on a green sign that stands near the automobile yard. Just before the sign, a gravel road branches southward, leading first to Miles' wood frame house, then to a complex of farmhouses where the four travelers have lived for nine years. The travelers are strangers to the earth and have offered Miles the gift of beauty. Some young men have dark hair and a fair complexion, marred slightly with adolescent blemishes that serve only to remind the observer that a few years will make them more handsome still. For the most part, they grow up in towns larger than freedom. They have pretty, suntan girlfriends who walk barefoot along the river holding their young man's hand. Sometimes these boys bring their girlfriends for afternoons at the park, and they eat blueberries and cream out of waxed cream containers with the wooden spoons that come with Dixie Cup Sundays. But Miles is not one of these, and he has known since childhood, when his classmates ridiculed him and called the gravel road he lived on Troll Road, that he is ugly. His face is short, 
his eyes pale and widely spaced, his nose broad and too prominent, his lips thin and forever tensely set against some vague dilemma. His brown hair is thin and fine like a newborn's, and never grew in properly. He seems to be going bald along his sloping forehead and above his cupped ears. The skin stretches across his small, gaunt skeleton, leaving shadowy hollows above the collarbone and below his shoulder blades. There exists no redeeming portion of his anatomy, not beautiful hands or well-shaped feet, and his toes are undefined and slightly webbed, as though his mother had expelled him from her womb before he was complete. Miles has never won or lost a girlfriend, and he has lived alone on his father's hundred acres since his parents died when he was sixteen. He is neither bright nor dull. He speaks rarely, only of necessity or in impassive exchanges with Peter at the grocery. When he visits there, his head is slightly bowed and his eyes averted, as if to spare himself the sight of Peter seeing him. Peter says, well, hello, Miles. Things going okay? And the boy nods, sometimes mentioning the health of his few animals or the forty acres of wheat and alfalfa he raises. Miles pays for his purchases with his father's social security checks. The country doesn't know that his parents have died, and the checks will probably continue indefinitely. It isn't very important. If the money stopped coming, Peter would give Miles some work to do, or would send him to find a job as a fruit picker or miner in Medville. Peter feels that Miles is a harmless, somewhat moronic individual who belongs to freedom and would have no existence outside it. The travelers are beautiful people and very different, the way one might expect true foreigners to be. It isn't a distinctive attitude or manner of speaking and acting that sets them apart, but for one thing, their eyes, navy blue and flecked remarkably with gold, possess a rare depth. There are two men and two women, tall, strong people with constant tans and healthy blonde hair. Miles met them soon after they came to the town to live on an abandoned estate. Everyone assumed they'd bought the place from the government or the estate manager's office. It was an impersonal transaction, at any rate. It happened that Miles' parents were neighbors, by about a mile, to the traveler's farm. Often Miles would spend whole afternoons at their place— he enjoyed their company with disciplined discretion. Mondays he would have lunch with them, as the quiet guest. The four, Margot, Wendell, Jean, and Garth, favored Miles, perhaps because his company was so undemanding and effortless. Miles would sit at the kitchen table, helping Margot prepare the meal, just peeling potatoes and responding with periodic hmms and nods at the pauses in her elaborate conversation. She raved over the loveliness of the countryside with great poetic outbursts of imagery and metaphor that amused Miles. But the four never mentioned their home or their future. Miles assumed, quite romantically, that they'd come from another planet and were visiting the Earth just to rest, maybe to study. He expected they would soon lose interest and finally decide not to announce their curious arrival at all, and quietly depart. At the time of Miles' parents' deaths, the four came for the first time to his house in order to express their sympathy and offer any assistance he might need. But Miles wanted nothing except his legacy of the family land and house and old Chevrolet. It was a thoroughly uncontested legacy, valuable only to him. So he thanked them, and with discreet promptness sent them away so that he could be alone with his possessions. Miles suspected that they all, somehow, had had a hand in the deaths of his mother and father, though both had been ill for some time. His suspicion, hardly articulated, was mutely acknowledged and admitted to by Garth as the four left, when Garth returned Miles' gaze of understanding, timely gratitude. Miles labored heavily and warmly over the stalled tractor, fiddling with various motor parts until the starter's squeak erupted into the satisfying rumble of a running engine. Most of the alfalfa had been cut and baled and was standing in a shadowy heap near the animal shed. There was little left to do once the motor was repaired, but neglecting the task for even one day meant risking another rainfall, and yet another delay. Before noon he'd passed four hours in the field and was checking the binder twine on the last few bales and flinging them heavily to the top of the heap. 
Then he stretched a thin tarpaulin over the stack, anchored it at the corners with discarded tires carried from the automobile yard, and wandered back to the house, weaving perceptibly in the heat, great rivulets of moisture gliding down from his forehead and hanging from his upper lip. Inside was coolness. He rested for a while at the table, fingering the wooden salt shaker his father had carved for his mother on some remote Christmas Eve. Then he washed and looked up into the rusted, broken mirror, his arms resting on the sides of the sink. His eyes wandered over his grotesque reflection. The face in the mirror seemed removed and irrelevant to him. But he was alone, and no one could stare at him, making him cower mentally and producing an involuntary shrug of his shoulders. He and his reflection exchanged hard stares, honest, impassive, almost incredulous. A body is like a box. It has no relation to its content, except that the content sometimes relinquishes its independence and grows into conforming shape. Inside, Miles was not ugly or beautiful. He possessed a subsistence level of emotion, and brutalized and killed whatever loneliness he felt. Miles dried himself with a dingy towel, pushing his hair forward to conceal a measure of bareness at his temples. It was Monday. He would have lunch with the travelers. Margot was standing outside on the porch, tossing grain to the few emaciated chickens they kept for eggs— Wendell stood beside the fence gate, hammer in hand, examining the hinge. He looked up and noticed Miles, waved enthusiastically. Miles felt they overdid their expressions of welcome. For a long while on his periodic visits, Miles would sit mutely through whole conversations which the four conducted energetically. He never felt compelled to speak, and the four carried the upbeat mood of their meals without his help. But then Garth finally commented on Miles' reticence, and gently but insistently urged him to join in the talk. Miles explained that he was usually silent because he had nothing to contribute. But in deference to Garth's concern, he did for a time begin to speak more freely. But his forced comments were invariably uninteresting, and his rambling sentences, often running together a myriad of formless thoughts, were more and more frequently cut short by interruptions from the others. Miles' ideas were boring, even to himself. So soon after the period of experimental articulation, he relapsed into the familiar, silent pattern, and was more comfortable for it. Garth never again prompted him to converse. The experiment, in point of fact, had proved somewhat embarrassing to all. So it happened that the greeting this particular afternoon, though warm and genuine, was quite one-sided. Miles simply acknowledged their welcome with a smile and nod, then sat on the edge of the dusty porch to watch Wendell work and wait for Margot to call them to dinner. Almost two hours later, they all idled contentedly on the porch, eating great slices of cantaloupe. Jean's long fingers strayed gracefully over the antiquated auto-harp as she played and sang a Scottish folk ballad. Garth rolled cigarettes and lit a tall incense candle. They all smoked and relaxed in the porch shade, a few flies floating in the thick afternoon air. Garth had driven into Medville the previous afternoon and was displaying the set of paperback volumes he'd ordered through a bookstore there. Most were histories of the 17th and 18th centuries. He and Margot were the students of the group. They read voraciously on many diverse topics. And there was a volume of folk songs for Jean and books of Michelangelo sculpture and painting. Garth opened the latter to reproductions of The Last Judgment and Sistine Chapel panels. It was because of the pictures that Margot and Garth, to Miles' discomfort, began to talk about human beauty. Margot's words poured out of her smiling lips like soap bubbles, pretty, empty remarks. She raved over the artist's rendition of the souls condemned to hell. Look, their faces so drawn! yet still remorseless, and the faces of the saved ones are so lovely. The story of salvation is a beautifully complete and satisfying tale. Michelangelo was clearly a genius. Jean, the more gentle speaker, looked up from her harp and glanced at the pictures. She drew the book out of Garth's hand and rested it in her lap, staring intensely at the prince. Garth interrupted Margot's procession of words— not a genius, Margot, a brilliant craftsman. He could see well. 
He simply studied the real appearance of men, then set about reproducing it in prescribed compositional form. Oh, no, Garth, Jean smiled across to him. The artist is not a copier at all. He found beauty even in the faces of the damned, and possessed a vision besides technical perception. Look! She held the book toward him, her finger on one face to the right side of the god figure. Then she swept over several pages and pointed to the triangular composition of a woman seated, one elbow on her knee, her chin in hand. This is an inner beauty which persists, even within a pathetic and evil exterior. Beauty can be damned, but it remains beautiful, at least in the superficial sense, and always benefits the possessor, even if it goes no deeper than the surface. Wendell leapt from his chair, gathering together the cantaloupe rinds which had begun to decay and attract flies. Ah, you all waste too much time intellectualizing. Talk of beauty is irrelevant. You discuss universals and don't even notice that flies are swarming over the garbage you've discarded and forgotten. Beauty is not to be talked or watched, but lived. We are all beautiful. He wrapped the rinds hastily and efficiently in newspaper and headed across the yard to bury it in a refuse area about two hundred yards distant. He had almost reached it when Miles finally spoke. I am not beautiful, he said, wrenching from himself a fact almost too incredible and unjust to be articulated. They all waited, expecting him to repeat the statement, but he was silent, just sitting there on the step and staring over to Wendell. Jean began to strum her harp again, saying, That is true, Miles. You are an ugly boy. Her tone was matter-of-fact. She kept on playing green sleeves in the afternoon mugginess, and Miles forced himself to turn and face her. Then she continued over the melody. Would you like to be beautiful? As beautiful as us? Her eyebrows lifted into a slight, challenging arch. Miles noticed that Garth's head jerked toward Jean, a reprimand in his eyes. Miles said, it doesn't matter any more about that. Garth thought he was referring to beauty, but then the boy continued, I know you can do many wonderful things. I've seen you from the hilltop over there. He nodded toward the path he walked homeward. I know all about you. Garth doubted that Miles knew everything, but he withheld his criticism of Jean. They all had been careless with the boy all along. It felt good to relax with someone— and he seemed too remote from life to really take notice of even remarkable things. Margot was talking. Yes, of course. Wendell once said he thought you would like to be more handsome, and it isn't difficult. We can make you look much like one of us. Although, and here her voice faded into a tone of polite speciousness, I never considered you so unattractive, Miles, really. Miles rose abruptly and backed away from them, an expression of intolerable tension on his face. Wendell had returned, and the girl, Irena, was with him, apologizing for her tardiness. Irena's appearance sickened Miles all the more. You all are stupid, he muttered, pushing Wendell and Irena aside and rushing away. You understand nothing. How can they say these things? How can they know? How dare they see me? He'd always told himself that because the four were strangers, they didn't realize he was ugly. He thought they were unaware or blind. But all along, they saw him and knew. Miles didn't return to their farm for the next three weeks. Then he chanced to meet Wendell along the path between their homes one evening, and they talked a long while. The following Monday, he came to share lunch with them once again. And that afternoon, they somehow made his feet begin to grow normally. And his hair. The lines and planes of his face softened gradually, and every time he looked into the mirror over the sink, he did not look often, there was a noticeable change in his reflection, some random alteration. His eyes darkened to blue, and his frame began to fill out. He grew several inches in less than two weeks. At night, as he lay in bed, his hands would timidly glide over his strengthening features— at one point before much change had occurred, he became frightened and asked them to please stop. They did for many weeks. Then, after that time, they began again to change him, more slowly this time, perhaps more reverently as well. The transformation continued over several months. 
and then it was complete. Peter considered the change in Miles to be a delayed coming of age, as if the adolescent tension in him had finally been loosened, and the boy had reached his rightful manhood. Peter mentioned it to Ludmilla, too, that he had always suspected Miles was more clever than he appeared to be. He even said the boy had a bright future. Ludmilla simply shook her head stiffly, disbelieving. As the autumn ripened, Miles tried to make himself comfortable in his new body. He enjoyed the flow of breezes over his more pronounced cheekbones, and the slightly greater ease with which he handled the alfalfa bales. He still walked only rarely into town, but now as stray cars passed and the tourists inside stared at him with ill-disguised intensity, turning their heads clumsily as their cars rounded the northward curve into freedom, Miles was confident they found him attractive, and he felt more warmly toward them. The afternoons at the Traveler's Farm continued in their usual weekly pattern, except that Irena began to join them for lunch more frequently. Miles could depend on finding her there each Monday, her light brown hair brushed and hanging in waves to her shoulders, sometimes tied with a ribbon. Irena had confided in Margot that she liked Miles, and Margot, quite pleased with herself, had hinted as much to him. Miles made a conscious effort to avoid Irena, and even decided not to go to the farm one week. The following Monday, however, the luncheon was particularly elaborate, and Miles and Irena stayed well into the evening. Garth suggested they build a bonfire, and he collected the necessary firewood, while Jean filled a paper bag with chestnuts from the old tree in the backyard. The path they followed to the fire site was the same narrow one Miles took home, so they went single file, Miles at the end and Irena hurrying to maintain a position beside rather than behind him. Barefoot, she tried to step carefully through the untrammeled brush alongside the path. Miles felt embarrassed and gave her an irritated glance now and again when she'd brush against a thistle and whimper in a plea for sympathy and attention. It was a clear Indian summer night, and the fire burned quickly and crisply at the dried branches, casting orange shadows on the woman's long hair. The six of them seemed members of one family sitting there in a circle, and the scene was ceremonious enough that Garth decided to announce to Miles and Arena that the four travellers would be leaving freedom within the next year. Arena became excited and tried to persuade Margot and Jean to change their minds— but Garth, in a paternalistic tone, explained to her that they just didn't want to live there any longer. They remained around the fire for a long time, eating the chestnuts and listening to Jean's music. Finally, Garth, Margot, Wendell, and Jean gathered their things and said goodbye. It was left to Miles and Irena to self-consciously put out the fire and walk home along the path together. Irena was very sentimental and talked incessantly about the travellers. She started to cry a little, insisting, I wish they wouldn't go. They're our best friends here. We'll miss them so much, won't we? Miles thought her behaviour childish, and felt that everything she said was designed to make him talk to her and like her. He hardly responded to her at all, except to call her foolish, and she then became angry. She was walking ahead of him on the path and stopped suddenly, turning around to stare at him with wide, impatient eyes. In a tone of voice that slid quickly from a demand to a plea, she said, "'Miles, why do you dislike me so?' He couldn't speak. She seemed too womanly and strong, even lovely in the evening light, her beauty all her own. He felt he owed her some kind of respect and responsiveness he was unable to offer. She went on. You could be so much kinder to me. You act as if everything I do insults you, and I can't bear it. I I want you to like me. Her white arm was raised and poised mid-air before her face, her fingertips almost touching her lips. Shyly, she extended her hand toward Miles' face. He stared back at her with amazement and contempt. I am a man, and you treat me like a doll to win and keep. You never talked to me before the travellers changed me. I was an animal to you then, to be looked at and laughed at. No, she insisted, startled, and her voice rising above the field's cricket song. That's a lie. You know it isn't true. She bit her lower lip to stop its quivering and watched him, this perfect, beautiful man, as he averted his eyes and rushed past her, heading along the path. 
she shouted after him. And you're not an animal to me. You're nothing. You're empty. Miles said nothing to her all the remaining distance. When they parted at his house, Irena didn't say good night, but Miles didn't care about her at all. The winter passed, mild and uneventful. Miles finally took the old mirror off the wall over the sink basin. He was a strikingly handsome man, and certainly beauty was a more pleasant experience for him than ugliness. But he felt he belonged properly to neither extreme, and he grew bored with the perennial uneasiness caused by his reflection in the mirror. In February, a man came to Freedom to recruit miners to work a new mine a hundred miles from the town. He was impressed by Miles and offered him a good job, but Miles wasn't interested in that either. The following summer, after a ten-year stay, the travelers left for home. Miles didn't miss them very much. He still considered them blind in certain ways, because for all their knowledge and wonderful powers, they didn't understand very much about people. He had never grown close to them. It was all but impossible to be intimate with or dependent upon a group of such deceptively garrulous people. The four shared an almost raucous style, except for Jean, who had little personality at all, save for her gentleness, which got tiresome after a while. All of them had, after all, considered him ugly before, just like all the others. As Peter suspected, it turned out that Miles never left freedom. His roots were deeply implanted there. Even on his road his ugliness had become such a part of him that, faced with the possibility of starting anew in a strange place where no one knew him, he couldn't bring himself to leave. Perhaps it was for fear that, without constant reminders of who he used to be, his new body would be without any identity at all. As years passed, he began to neglect himself, the way lonely people often do. He ate too much, slept too much, and let his pale hair mat with grime. By the time he was thirty-five, he was no longer an attractive man. But this ugliness was alien to him, and was, in the final analysis, a lie. His real identity, his soul, remained lost inside the alien and inappropriate country of his body, and finally he died. Introduction to There Was a Garden Zena Henderson was born and raised in Arizona, where she now lives, working as a teacher. She has been a teacher for all of her adult years except one, teaching in such unusual places as a school in France for the children of Air Force personnel, the Japanese Relocation Center in Sacaton, Arizona, and a children's TB hospital in Connecticut. Whether she is talking of people or people with a capital P, the hallmark of her work is a warmth for her fellow man. There was a garden by Zena Henderson. Mountain peered around the shoulder of hill at the still figure sprawled face down on dust. Is he dead yet? Shh, 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 said Grass, bending close. No, not yet. Grass stirred to breathe. You are as impatient as foothills, said River, curving closer to foot. It has been so long, sighed Mountain, rippling forest as he straightened up a curving ridge, so long when last we danced for joy. Or could clap our hands, said Pine, and sing with stars. Now we will have world back for our own. No further need to keep the pattern exact for him. Be patient a little longer, said Wind, moving softly around face. Be respectful of last. I have plans, said Continent to River. I'm weary of your parting me down the middle as though I were a head of hair. Instead of gathering waters larger and larger for you to take to ocean, let each streamlet weave down to water. Then I would not be, said River, and it would ruin beach. Ruin? asked Continent. Our functions are never ruin. Man made the word to explain broken patterns, his idea of patterns, and became his own supplier of occasions to use the word. We would only be making a different beach. Why not? River rippled uncomfortably. Man looked on beach with pleasure. Mountain quivered hillside impatiently. Not dead yet. No, said Wind gently, drying the skim of cold sweat on man's face. Not yet. All the small streams, Continent went on, each with its own area. They would not be navigable, 
said River shortly. Navigable? By whom? scoffed Continent. River was silent. Small thinking, muttered Continent. Old swimming hole mentality. It has been so long, offered Mountain. We will have trouble realizing that we are free and unobserved. It will take getting used to. And, Continent, I'm not at all sure I would like the feel of many small streams scoring me. One large one you can get used to, but all the niggling, nagging abrasions of a thousand. I am aching to be healed of this infection, cried Continent. This creature that has festered since first he breathed. He never learned. Nothing can live on its own wastes. The lakes are shining again, said River. He has been gone from them long enough. He would never have come back to be a witness. So we started. Salmon are leaping up the falls, said Continent. The obstructions are gone. Each surge of the salmon is more and more. Birds, sighed Pine. Not so much to me, but swinging branches low. But so many can never return. And there he lies. Hill spat a small boulder across field toward last, keeping us from all we want to start doing. Freed of him. Freed of him. Field curled furrow and stopped boulder short of last. I will mourn him, said Field, trembling so furrows crinkled, and wire drooped sadly from fence along one side. He taught me, murmured Field, he taught me to feed him and clothe him. He returned to me to die. He cherished me. He enslaved you, cried Mountain. He alienated you from plain and continent, then poisoned us all, and himself, and came back to pollute you even more. Now you will be free. Free, said Field. For what? To be hill again, or plain, or continent. Hill is tall, said Field. Continent is vast, from sea to sea. Field is special. Not all of hill or plain or continent is fit to be field. Nor wants to be, shouted Mountain, becoming canyon, then plain with a rippling crash that broke wire and buried most of fence. Wind hummed in the silence, then whispered, Shh, shh, shh. All leaned to look. Even sky seemed to lower to see. Wind moved across face. Grass bent to touch lips, then straightened and turned, plume drooping, away. Breath comes no more, whispered grass. Nothing throbs, murmured dust. He is dead, sighed wind. The last is dead. And wind wept around the finished face. Silence grew larger. River rippled up to touch foot, then curved sadly away. Field tightened furrows until they were coldly rigid. The field said into the huge silence, No one is dancing, no one is clapping hands, no one is singing with stars. Pine nestled against hill. Hill fitted tighter into mountain, mountain clung to continent, and darkness filled all the hollows of the land, overflowing the treetops, drowning the peaks until it lifted to reach sky. Sky held the lighted stars, and looking down said softly, And darkness was on the face of the deep. In the faintness before the light, River crept up to field and murmured, What shall we do with what is left? He is last. He should not have to wait for sun and rain to take him apart, or for hungry things to scatter him. I would take him as I used to take in some places, but that may not have been his ritual. We cared for him, said Field. He was committed to fields for finished ones, or just to earth, all earth shared, receiving again what had come from it. But I cannot hollow myself, and rain takes so long. I will make the hollow, said River. Dust, will you permit my passing? I trembled dust, stirring in the early light. I permit? Small clouds puffed. You are asking dust? I have never been asked. And dust lay, silently yielding, waiting for river. River parted banks, and flowed, and rippled, and turned. River retreated through banks, lapping the last edge of hollow to smooth it. I cannot move him, mourned Field. Could your waters— 
River murmured a moment, then waters rose to look about. Swiftly, silently, River swept over the finished one and washed him into hollow. Swiftly, silently, River spread dust over, then smoothed field until dust and soil no longer showed any of hollow. Carefully, field remade furrows over the smoothness. There, said River with a final ripple over the edge of banks, he is home to the dust and the water. Day was. Wind hurried across field, across hill, happily busy being wind among the pines, to the edge of field. Wind found a bit of wire drooping from post. Wind found that he could whistle by moving swiftly past wire. So wind whistled there many days and many nights. But the sound was never joyful, so when at last wire fell free of post and dropped to silence on ground, wind felt released. Days were only because of the turning of earth, not because of counting, and seasons merged one into another, not knowing, not capable of knowing, where was beginning and where was ending. Quaking sent waves of water to scour clotted shores, and waves of land to turn freshness up over the weariness of filth. Upsurging soil filled air, and sun made a scarlet glory along the racing edge of darkness. Oh, see, cried Sunset, how fair I am! Look up, behold! Dust and sun, said Continent shortly. Light refraction, its function. Sunset murmured voicelessly, Man drank my colors with his eyes. He taught me that I was fair. Silence ran in exultation from peak to peak, from depth to height, and none heard itself in a thousand places on earth that silence had long forgotten existed. But silence folded on itself and whimpered without sound. If there was no sound because there was no one to hear it, there was no silence because there was no one to non hear it. Warmth faded from continent and snow fell. Fascinated flake upon unblemished flake. Look! cried Snow. Look how I have lined each twig and bent each branch and crowned each hill and glorified mountain. Oh, look! Oh, look! You are Snow, said Mountain heavily. Your function is to fall. You have fallen on things beneath you. You have fallen. Snow was silent. Then quietly patterning the words, Man found me lovely. Man saw me glorifying and fulfilling. Snow mourned. Man fed his soul on me. Snow peeled away from boulder and dusted angrily down hillside. So hill released more snow and more until avalanche crashed down, stripping bush and tree and grass down to hills, bare bedrock. Man! cried Snow, plummeting downward. You will crush him. You will destroy him. Remember man! Man is gone, Hill gritted boulders together harshly. He will no longer look on me in judgment, on any function of mine, calling terrible avalanche or fire or landslide or... Hill stripped a vast flank bare, then peeled it off in megatons and cast it down on snow. Snow-melting flakes wept to a torrent and churned soil to muck. Sky leaned closer and murmured, without form and void. Upspringing came unhappily. Confusions were everywhere, and everywhere the only clearly speaking was endlessly defensive. Within my function, allowable function, but I have always wanted, I have always planned that, freed, I would... Every aspect of earth battered the borders of its function, undeterred by man's expectation, unfettered by man's evaluation untempered to man's petitioned need, unmodified by man's function, continent ripped river to shreds, river gouged continent to swamps, mountain flung forest from its sides like scraping moss from a stone, forest channeled rain to rip mountain, field lay silently accomplishing the disillusion of last, river contrived at times to creep back to field and dust to murmur with them, in the vast, unhappy, unfocusing of creation. Field lifted flowers along its faint furrows. Wind counted them gleefully and tilted them to show sky the golden faces. Man counted petals to love, 
said Field, remembering. And Storm shrieked and twisted the flowers until petals sewed themselves sterilely through forest, and rain beat them into mud. Man delighted, sighed Field. No one counts to love now. All the small, hidden, quiet things were patient in their waiting darkness. Then at last continent lay quiescent for long and long. Smoke settled from mountain flanks. Dust distilled from air. Silence lifted up like a long glowing banner against sky. River gathered the weeping, ragged waters together. Hill shaken with small hiccoughing, aftermaths of quakes and storms and floods, slumped against mountain. Mountain cradled the remains of forest. Snow blossomed briefly in warm darkness to quench fire, gnawing listlessly at pine. Hesitant, frightened, flowers crept to bud and blighted blossom, cringing lest root should suddenly be exposed or stripped in an instant. All the quiet, hidden things became quietly, darkly, busy with their functions, and healing began. Finally, continent spoke. We are not individuals, we are one. We are turning back on ourselves and consuming our own selves. Silence diluted all the rebellion and thinned it to petulance. Then, with a movement like a sob, edge embraced edge, separation groped for separation, and joining began. Hesitantly a pulse fluttered and strengthened, and every function struggled to match the throbbing until a beat began to build. We are not completion, the realizing murmur lifted longingly. We are a setting. Alone we are empty. We cannot fill ourselves. Silence wrapped its healing around. Finally, out of the silence, Field asked, Who will go to him? Who is worthy? wondered Dust. If we must wait for worthiness, sighed Wind, we can never go. Anyway, we have no fit place, said Hill. Look around you. Silence again, long and troubled. Before there was no place, reminded Pine, hope quickening the words. Remember? But we made a beautiful place. There was a garden. We must heal ourselves first, said Continent, and that will be long. We have begun, said Field. We have begun to focus. We are not each. We are one. We are we again, not I. The beat strengthened. Underground, the tangled, matted chaos smoothed to a complicated, intertwining network. Order appeared and spread. There was a garden, with every aspect of it trembling in eager beauty toward perfection. Every aspect toiled to become best, not better than anything, but only self-best. An imperfection lovingly joined imperfection and became near perfection. Then, in the cool of one morning, Field lay holding dust as an offering. River lapped softly and practiced mixing with the edge of dust. Who will go to him? asked Pine shyly. Who will ask for the return? Return, 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 echo carried the sound, round and ringing, up hill, up mountain, and up to urge against sky. The question ceased. All questing was stilled. All answers were. We did not need to go, breathed Field from under the green that hid the old faint furrowings. Furrows smoothed out completely, making Field new again. He is always here. Water rounded upward like a tear, then smoothing, waited. And dust quivered at the edge of water. Introduction to Night Rise Though she has never written science fiction full-time, Kate McLean has always written science fiction. Some of her best-known and most anthologized and televised short stories are Pictures Don't Lie, The Snowball Effect, and And Be Merry, all to be found in her collection The Diploids, originally published in the early 60s and republished in 1973. Her short story, The Kid in the Computer, televised over CBC, was a precursor of her first science fiction novel, The Missing Man, published in 1975. I don't know Ms. McLean, but a mutual friend describes her as a terror in reasoned discourse. 
both logical and oblique in argument. She lives in Maine with her parents and her son. Night Rise by Catherine McLean Now mercy, down certain dark and filthy alleys, in fetid spots between the buildings of the best neighborhoods, by running water and deep black pools, those who bring themselves to the altar joyfully, they will be allowed to enter nothingness. Someone had been speaking. The sound of a voice lingered in my ears. I thought back. The meaning. Something religious and strange. Nothingness. The world came partially into focus. I felt the wood of a bar under my fingers. I know some people who are already nothing, and they think someone in the sky knows what he's doing with them. A voice beside me. It can be reborn as a mindless animal without responsibility or remorse. No need to think ever again. The dark Christ is merciful, will give darkness as love. I closed my hand around a smooth shot glass and looked to see if it was empty. It was half full. I looked into the mirror across the bar, dark amber glass. The people relaxing here did not have to see those dim amber faces. Concealed, those faces watched them. What was my excuse for being here? Only a little vacation, a drink between assignments and hard work. I was almost working, even here, for the bar smelled bad. It was a danger place, an international border, mixing refugees from law and logic, criminals and perverts and blind, bad-tempered tourists looking for glamour in evil. Stories might rise out of this muck. Beside me, in the mirror, clear-cut and almost visible, was the face of an adolescent Hindu boy, dark eyes, full, sculptured lips. He looked familiar. I could almost guess which ambassadorial family he belonged to. They would not want him to be here, in danger. He touched my elbow. I felt the touch, although I did not see it in the mirror. "'Are you all right, sir?' said the soft Indian voice. "'I don't know,' I said, and did not turn to look at him, yet." Everything was becoming too real. The amber mirror still held a little of unreality. I think I'm sobering up. The echo of a voice still lingered. Something had hit me with a great gong of meaning recently. Within ten minutes, somewhere near me was a story. I'd been out on my feet, gone into one of those blackouts where an experienced drinker can be unconscious and still walk and talk and sound alive— the sound of a story had brought me back. The feeling of something important was still bringing me back. I climbed upward from under the sea of warm whiskey. The lights grew brighter and the sounds harsher and more shrill as I approached surface. Someone was repeating the details of a fight. A blurred voice was trying to make a point to a precise voice that questioned insistently and quietly, going after a purpose. Voice one should guard himself against voice two. Half-filled bottles before my eyes lined up against the back mirror. The smell of insect spray and odor killer. Whiskey, fear, sweat. A beefy bartender, accustomed to trouble, stolidly refilled drinks for the drunks and ignored their attempts to converse with him. "'What were you saying?' I asked the Indian boy. "'I think I missed some of it.' I fumbled with my wallet on the bar, checking my cash. Five dollars. I braced for reality and looked straight at the boy." Quality, yes. Education, yes, but primitive, and over-muscled for his age. His face was smooth, sculptured stone, legally too young to drink and enter bars. My duty was to get him out of there, said the imagined voice of his family. I ignored it and listened again. The echo made real. There are two Christs, sir, the boy said, licking his lips and glancing away from my wallet. He turned his dark eyes on me with sincere earnestness, as if even a strange bum with bloodshot eyes at a bar had a right to know. He said, There is dark Christ also. I mean a bad one. He is coming this time. He is a god also, like the other, but on the left hand now. He is in the souls of men, gaining shape, a thought by God slowly forming to become solid. I think strong enough to already be born in the flesh as a man, growing somewhere already. 
Have you not felt him coming all your life? He rises in the land of your soul, like a dark sun, slowly. It hit me somewhere. I shuddered and kept shuddering. I thought I was going to break apart physically. I pulled out of it with my fingers gripping the edge of the bar, hard enough to dent walnut. I have felt that thing before, watching the first thread of smoke trickling upward from a volcano that was going to blow. But this was the first time I had had a sixty-mile-an-hour head-on collision with words. I looked around for something to help me disconnect and forget it. On the other side of the boy, a richly dressed slender man gave me a steady-eyed expressionless stare, then looked the Indian boy up and down as if I had offered him for sale. People had vanished from this neighborhood. "'Does your family know where you are?' I asked the boy. "'I am where I choose to be, sir,' he said. "'I know judo, and I am armed.' The children of diplomats must travel from country to country if they learn to escape protection and explore each place. They may grow up in premature understanding of the ways of the world, even the ways of evil. I remember that the men who go into the border world and are destroyed and do not return are usually deviates looking for companions for their strange tastes, like the man on the other side of the Indian boy. He edged closer, but I did not feel any need to warn my young companion of his intentions. He must have met that sort of attention before. The boy had been telling me of a young criminal gang. I remembered that now. It could have made a good story. Memory keeps slipping. I reached into a pocket, found a notepad. Better to write it down. Do you want me to take notes and write an article? He nodded. Again, the sincere, earnest look. He wanted to help me, or the world, by telling it the truth. I did not want any more theology, only the events. I said, go on, with what you were telling me, the story, I mean. How did it start? About the stealing. The impulse came to me. I did not need the money, my parents are rich. But the impulse came to me, feeling like wisdom. I found poor gang boys for companions. I went into buildings we stole and sold and gave away. I saw that I could go into any place. All doors are unlocked. I saw that the poor boys did not want to steal, did not want to give away what they had stolen, and help each other. They wanted to destroy what they did not have, and they wanted to destroy what they did not understand. They would smash beautiful, obedient machines in offices, smear their offal on the walls, hit each other with what they had stolen. The world lay open to them, but they could take nothing for themselves that would help them. They learned nothing. They were in pain, dry and hungry inside, for they were never loved, and they could not love. Another impulse came to me, as if by wisdom. I was sure. I took them into a dark place, and I returned them to the wheel of karma, to be reborn as animals and birds, and live with humbleness and beauty. He took a white scarf from his pocket, a white scarf, such as the murdering servants of Kali Druga, the destroyer goddess, had used in ritual street murder long ago. It was as if he had taken a knife out of his pocket. The memory of mankind is long. Voices faltered. And in the silence he said, I shed no blood, and afterward I prayed for their souls. If he had mentioned excrement and elimination in the presence of an old lady's tea party, he would have gotten the same polite pretense that he had said nothing, the same immediate resumption of general chatter on other topics. He had mentioned something that was done and accepted, but not openly talked about. Murder. The boy went on talking, but now no one else listened to him. The richly dressed deviate turned his back and began a cordial conversation with the skinny young man who had been crowding him from the other side. The skinny young man had mascarid eyes and looked hungry. Drunken voices rose about us, and a fight began near the door. The bartender lumbered in that direction. The boy went on talking. I have interviewed great scientists and poets, and there is always something in the way they talk. This poor damn kid had some crazy notion of Christ, and he had killed a whole peck of his fellow ragamuffins with his white scarf. But there was power in his voice and in his thinking. When he began to speak again— I heard the essential child savagery in the smooth young voice, but 
I still heard the power. He said, I found this scarf in the place where I first thought of returning them to darkness, and I knew it was a sign. He folded up the white silk scarf and put it quietly back in his pocket. A sign of what? An unsafe question. But one interviews with questions. Kalidruga has returned, I thought, but I was wrong. It is the sign of the other one. The dark Christ asked for those souls. I know him now, for I have met others who know also. They do as I do, and we are sure who it is that we obey. Listening, I felt that shudder of recognition. This was the true group madness, contagious. It could inflame a nation to drown itself in instinct. I'm a reporter and a writer of articles. One does not turn the person one interviews over to the police. Making arrests is a job for the police. I get stories, write them, and get them into print. In the phone booth it was close and sweaty, listening to the fan whir and the operator distantly speak, negotiating a reverse charges call to World Picks. The phone line cleared and the editor answered, What's on your so-called mind, Tom, and where are you? I used to work for him on assignment, but steady work interfered with my drinking time, so I had quit and gone back to freelance. I knew what his magazine needed and liked. Brad, I've just run across a new religious cult of murderers. Would you buy a special? Great, I'll bump a rehash of Nazi horrors for it. We're crying for good material. When can you get it to me? I need it yesterday. The galleys are at the printers already. Maybe tonight I'm attending a meeting. Get at that typewriter. We'll make it a series. Never mind about facts for the first part. Just rehash Callie and Beale and Freud. Finish the first part and get it in tonight. Attend your meeting and get cooked and eaten next week, okay? I laughed and hung up. It was dark. It smelled of dead fish and harbor fog and the oil of ships. The alley pavement was broken, and mud sucked at one foot when I shifted position. The boy, Haran, was a shadow on one side of me, and two taller lads were shadows on the other side. I could hear them breathing, but they said nothing. I had not asked their names. One never asked names when reporting crime. They had assured me that I would see a service to the dark Christ. How many worshippers are there? I asked, wondering where the others were. Twenty here, others in the city across the river. When are they coming here? We only need three for service, sometimes only one. I saw the flash of a white scarf dangling from a hand in the dark. The tallest one had answered. It sounded like a killing. I said uneasily, No rough stuff right in front of me, okay? I just want to see a service to the dark Christ. It is the same Christ, said the tall one. Christ and Krishna died to also show us the way to die. Our service is to him and to all mankind. We serve anyone who wants to come to us for help. It still sounded like a killing was scheduled for that night. I wondered who. How do you pick them? They volunteer. How do they volunteer? Haran's soft voice answered. They come to the altar over there. It looked something like a large block of stone, a lighter square against a black mass of the windowless warehouse wall. They can find their way? Haran murmured. The human soul is wise. It knows when it is weary of being clothed in flesh. It leads a man to us. Far away, a slot of light showed the entrance to the alley. People walked past that slot of light. Auto headlights flashed by it. And in the distance, a neon sign flickered. I saw a man stop at the entrance, hesitating. I hoped he would not come in. We had the weak who are too weak to taste fully of life and continue on without experience, only because they are afraid to die. Christ will open the door at which they stand, too timid to knock. They will be able to live without blame, offending no one, breaking no law against suicide, issued gently into nothing and nothing. They have passed their lives swaddled in safety and comfort for their bodies. They have found comfort without thought. Their cells are washed clean and blank. Their bodies can pass into nothingness without pain and leave not a ripple of soul behind. It was a clear, compelling picture. It made murder sound kind. Haran was a poet, a prophet, a Saint Paul of death. He was starting here in the alleys of this city, but the worship he started could spread to engulf the world. 
The distant man at the entrance to the alley entered and began to walk toward us, his gait uncertain and stumbling. How did you choose this place for worship? I asked. In any city we choose a stone in a dark place, a stone that looks like an altar. When the dark spirit says yes, it becomes his altar. We wait beside the altar and pray for the souls of who comes to us. Always the one who offers himself to the dark Christ comes and stands beside the altar and waits? I heard the others murmur agreement, but I protested. But how do you know? Suppose a man is going somewhere else and just stops. He's not offering himself for... for... The distant stranger still advanced toward us, away from the light. His gait was uncertain. He braced himself by one hand against the wall and groped with his feet for the pavement. This alley leads nowhere else. The victim fumbled along the wall, going step by step into what must have seemed bottomless blackness. He did not know he was clearly outlined against the slot of light behind him. I thought of warning him. My companions on either side were killers. If I yelled, they could overtake their victim even if he started to run. And they would kill me. I would die in the dark with no medals for heroism. I decided not to yell, and hoped that the victim was some miserable bum dying of drink and malnutrition, with vomit on his clothes, for whom killing would be a quick mercy. The young killers were shadows on either side of me, saying nothing and waiting as the man advanced. The silhouetted figure advanced almost to us, and then walked out of the light toward the altar. He coughed, he cleared his throat, he spoke nervously. "'Where are ye, kiddo? I, I saw you come in here. I'm not mad, really. I won't hurt you. You can keep the money you took out of my money belt.' He took two more steps and stopped, with the altar a ghostly square of white stone behind him. "'Peace be with you,' Haran said, and began to chant in a language I did not recognize. The man was a shadow before the altar, his voice a lonely sound in the dark. I know you're here, kiddo. I hear you singing. I won't hurt you. I liked you. You liked me, didn't you? One of my three companions left my side. The silk scarf of Kali was used by the thugs as a killing weapon in the time, two centuries ago, when thuggy was practiced as a religion. It was looped over the head of the victim and given a quick pull that broke the neck. A tugboat whistled on the river. A liner hooted a reply. I heard the dull crack of bone breaking. Far away the slot of light led to the orderly, busy parts of the city. No one else darkened that slot. No one entered. The electric typewriter typed quietly and rapidly, as if recording someone else's thoughts. I wrote, Christ the Preserver has ruled long and long, and he has succeeded. There are many preserved crowds and multitudes of humankind. They are protected and do not need either courage or wisdom. They do not struggle. They neither win nor lose. They feel neither challenge nor triumph. They do neither evil nor good. They seek comfort, which is nothingness, and they fear hunger and live in satiety, which is nothingness. They exist without experience and fear experience. They deserve neither heaven nor hell. Those alive enough to be afraid are in hell, live on the edge of the avalanche, and are afraid to move. The protected have neither friends nor enemies. Strangers protect them, because the preserving Christ commanded it. In all his names, as Krishna, as Buddha, he commanded that the strong protect and preserve strangers. I stopped and read it back. It sounded like Haran's voice and his thinking. I typed, The preserving Christ has accumulated these people on earth. Earth is overlaid. The destroying Christ is God's other hand, and he has come to clear them away and make room. In the name of mercy, down certain lonely alleys, in dark and secret places between buildings, those who do not know how to live and are afraid to die, they can find nothingness. The new Christ is merciful. He will not inflict eternal life on the weary. Nothingness is comfort. Much later, in daylight, I was sleeping. The phone rang in the hotel room. I rolled over and put the pillow on top of my head. The phone stopped ringing and then started again. I picked it up and brought it under the pillow and laid the receiver on the bed beside my ear and went back to sleep. Sometime later, the voice shouting in my ear brought me back. We can't print it like this. What are you trying to do, convert everyone to thuggy? All the Nancy pressure groups hate this kind of stuff. 
It's the way they think, I said, remembering the young men with scarves waiting in the dark. It's the way they think. You wrote it like it was the way you think, you boob. So add quote marks, I said. The pillow held the phone near my ear. The bed was soft against my face. Did you see a service? Yes, they used a white scarf and killed a man, just like I wrote it. Look up, Cali worship. Very same. Who did they kill? Unidentified man. It didn't seem too important. About five feet ten, weighed about a hundred and forty, age about a tired thirty. Well off, good black suit, good shoes, broken neck. He'll be raked out of the river today or tomorrow. Condolences. Not sure he volunteered. Sorry. After a while, the phone was buzzing the notices of an empty line. I reached in under the mattress, almost falling over the edge of the bed, and felt a crumpled wad of oily paper that was money. The bundle of green stuff testified that they had trusted me, and bought by counting the pages without even reading it. They would print my article. It would come out a little neater and more coherent than I had written it, with the statement of the dark Christ religion put neatly into quote marks. Someone else would add the Freudian crap and the sociological crap, explaining the sources of murder within the person as suicide, turned outward, the population pressure as a social source of the impulse to kill, felt within the crowded individual. They would frame the story with a long view of the history of other times killing had appeared as a religious impulse. They could do it as easily as I could. My interview with the young assassins, with what they said and thought, that would be unchanged. "'presented clearly as an interview. "'Interview by Thomas Barlin. "'That was the name they would remember. "'The other photojournalists and pressmen "'knew me too well and made fun of my name, "'but they did not make fun of my interviews. "'Tom of Lower Bar Country had struck again. "'With the bills clutched comfortably in my fingers, "'I fell asleep. "'I woke up at sundown in the expensive hotel room "'with a golden haze of sunset over the city. I was hungry, empty, shaky, and happy, and sober. I showered and shaved and went down to the most expensive restaurant in the hotel, started breakfast with a Café Royal, and then ordered the greatest breakfast that they had on the menu. After the third cup of coffee, the back of my neck began to prickle. The feeling of sitting next to a live volcano, about to blow, returned, and stood my fur up along my arms, Cali worship, death worship. "'a match in a fireworks factory. "'The world was overpopulated, "'and the needs of living quietly together "'had made violent men into mice. "'An explosion of Cali worship would spread. "'It would change to simple murder "'by killers choosing the most helpless "'and easily felled victims "'with mercy and excuse for murder. "'An explosion of this sort "'would solve the population problem, "'but it would kill the mice and leave the wolves.' People who had no taste for violent self-defense would die. Did I want a world of human wolves? It would not be very different. Half the history of man is the history of wolf-man, which is why humanity has dominated all the other animals of the planet, and its history is a history of blood. Should I try to stop Haran and the others from spreading the worship of the Dark Christ? The decision was yes, but it tightened my breathing. It was already evening— the nightclub orchestra came on and began to play. Maybe it was the last time I would hear it. If I decided to turn the Kali cult into the police, they would kill me. I ordered some stiff drinks and tried to see an easy answer. Was it stupid to think that one reporter could stop or spread the disease of death worship? No. The source was Haran. Haran, the Indian boy, was a light of thought, a poet who spread the love of darkness. Lamp of darkness to the others. He was probably wrong. He was not waiting for the Messiah Christ to come. He was the Messiah of the new religion himself, the spokesman for death, who would make death into a god. If Haran died this young, he would be forgotten and the movement would stop. Murder would continue in the world, but not organize murder, and death would not again become a god. I should kill Haran, the boy with beautiful dark eyes and the innocent sculptured mouth, the police would not arrest him. His family would protect him. His family was influential. If I forced an arrest, he would be released on bail. I would die. I listened to the orchestra, ordered a steak and a double shot of good Irish. I needed to fill up with good food to make up for last week's concentration on drinking, and I needed to fill up on whiskey to change my line of thinking. 
Only sober thinking could get me so crazily involved with problems of responsibility in world history. As the drinks arrived, I wondered what the effect of my article would be. What are you trying to do, convert everyone to thuggy? I tossed the drinks down quickly before turning my attention to the steak. Thomas Barlin was a good reporter. The reporter's job was to report. He had no responsibility for the effects of reporting. That was a problem for ministers and social scientists and policemen. Thomas of Lower Bar Country had one job to go into Lower Bar Country and find news and drink. I watched the reporter that was connected with my body try to drown thought in drink and get back to the happy blind reporter. The problem was easily taken care of. Drink. Never so great, never so high before. The world was pretty and more pretty, shapes without meaning, a pattern of colors like clouds at sunset. Outside, into cooler air. Dark outside, street lights, color of lights from neon signs, the shapes not solid. The reporter, I, moved through the world of patterns, trying to remember something he should be finding, something he should do when he found it. The shapes around him, the reporter, not solid, like letters, Egyptian picture language. The world is a message from God, written in Egyptian picture letters, in an unknown tongue a language half-remembered. The shapes whispered meanings, and they seemed to mean more away from the brightest lights. I found a dark corner and stood swaying on the edge of the sidewalk, watching the distant neon signs reflected in a street made shiny by rain. Eventually the sidewalk and walls grew solid again, and the lights were merely reflected advertisements. So I went into the nearest bar and had some more Irish whiskey and some Benedictine to celebrate the meal of the week. No one inside said anything that seemed to be a story. When he, I, came out, the signs did not mean anything, just colors and meaninglessness was best, and he went floating along on legs that did not quite reach down to the sidewalk, away from lights that seemed too bright, toward the cool darkness and the sound of tugboats, where I remembered there was a story. Along the sidewalk, following the sound of tugboats, and the smell of fish, as a faint sometimes smell, whenever the wind shifted, past a dark street entrance that led downhill into darkness. The tugboats hooted from that direction. I turned back and went cheerfully lurching and fumbling down the hill toward the tugboats. Slow up, go right into the river, I said, and laughed at the idea of going swimming and laughing into the darkness around him, braced his hand against a table-sized block of stone and stopped. Behind him he heard a boy's musical voice say something in a strange language, and then in English Haran saying, We thank you, sir, for your offer of yourself. We were praying for you. He imagined he saw young, sympathetic faces around him, sympathetic but mistaken, but it was too black. He could see nothing. Trying to speak, felt the caress of white silk around his neck. Introduction to Mother Beast In terms of numbers, two themes dominated the submissions to this book, childbirth and death. Many of the death stories dealt with the pain of separation. Many of the childbirth stories were set in an overpopulated world where breeding is state-regulated and concerned the conception of an illegal baby. In a sense, Mother Beast is both a childbirth and a death story, but it certainly doesn't follow either of the themes above. I didn't need Kathleen Skye's letter to tell me this story has a special meaning to the author. I quote from her comments on the story because I think they add a dimension to the work. I have used stories in the past to get rid of some of the clutter in my mind and to express emotions that would be impossible to get out any other way. In Mother Beast, I am repaying a debt to Dr. Eric Byrne, author of Games People Play, for teaching me that everyone has small voices at the back of his mind, and that we are all parent, child, and adult at one and the same time. This story is written for my child. Mother Beast by Kathleen Skye The grave was deep, so that the night skulkers could not tear the flesh from her body. Several hours of labor had gone into lining the walls of the pit with smooth stones, dampened by his sweat and tears. 
Miri! Behind the grave, the furrows of the wheat field pointed dusty fingers at the distant mountains, where the sun was impaling itself on a jagged peak. At the base of the hills, scattered farms fireflied in the twilight. Night came quickly on this world. Soon, two of the three moons would rise. Their light would fall on her new home. Miri, Miri, Miri. The man jumbled rocks and earth down onto the homemade coffin. A night beast screamed in the distance as he tamped the dirt into place and piled stones over the barren mound. When they had plighted Tuing in the compound of the Confederation Immigration Center, she had promised never to leave him. For eternity, she had said, looking up at him with her yellow eyes. Where she was from he never knew. Mary had called herself the universe's child. The CIC didn't care about race or background. They had more potential colonists than the department could ever hope to thoroughly process, and they had quickly judged Mary fit. She had come to a raw planet, had worked hard, lived with him, loved him, and died. Three years. Mary. Dragging his shovel behind him, he walked through the field to the pressed plast hut. It was empty now, except for the child, a girl with... Eyes of black marble. His eyes, not Miri's. The baby was restless, pulling its legs up to its chin, then shoving them down to touch the end of the box it had been casually tossed into. It wept, throwing out its arms in a position for crucifixion. A mewing scream tore from its throat, while its body jerked with angry convulsions. The man picked up the child, clumsily trying to soothe it as he checked for dampness. The baby squirmed in his arms, beating at his chest with small hands. It yelled again, shrill with pain. Its face screwed up in agony. The man rocked it, cooing nonsense noises at it as the child trembled with outrage. The cries slowed and became choked gasps. Purple-blue shadows circled the child's mouth as it fought for breath. The baby went limp, sighed, took a deep breath, and opened her bright yellow eyes. Miri. Look, mother, why don't you let me out for a while? You think I'll get lost or something? There is no need for you to get outside. All that is there can safely be viewed through my eyes. I have your best interests at heart, and I know exactly what you should be permitted to do. You have only your own needs in mind. I can tell. Don't try to lie to me. How could I? Little one, admit you are as selfish as I am. You, too, think only of yourself. I learned that from a good teacher, Mother dear. I've had sixteen years of you on top of me. Isn't that enough to give me some idea of real selfishness? You never once let me out. You've made every decision, and you never even ask me how I feel about anything. Why don't you just let me be alone for a change? You don't know what you're asking. You have never been alone. I know that! I've never once moved an arm or a leg by myself. Everything I've seen, heard, or felt has been filtered through your mind first. I want a chance at my own destiny. Is that really so much to ask? But you haven't the vaguest idea of what might be right for you. Or for me, either. I'm only trying to make the best decisions in a situation that is at the least very unusual. In return, I should like some slight degree of understanding from you. Or is that too much to expect from my only child? You. Bloody beast! My, we are petulant, aren't we? Where did you find an expression like that? In the same place I get all my vocabulary, mother dear, in your filthy mind. I may have knowledge of such words, but I never had cause to use them. Twitch, witch, sleem, sucker, brother, jumper, stop that! Or I'll be forced to slodhouse tream, son of Anathoth, or you'll do what? Shut me away in a closet? You've already kept me locked away for sixteen years. What more could you do that you haven't done so far? Do you know how it feels, having you in my mind? No, you wouldn't. Why didn't you die, as you should have? It would have made things so much easier for everyone. Slot! Try to understand my position. I had to have a body, and it is the nature of my species to use the bodies of others to fulfill our needs. I would not have used yours if I might have avoided it, but in this godforsaken colony yours was the only infant body close enough to take over. Parasite! 
I wish you would refrain from emotional outbursts. They make dealing with you so unpleasant, and they are damnably uncomfortable to endure. Must you yell? Scum! Mother, are you quite sure your comfort is of any importance to me? It should be. Remember, I have full control of this body. What will happen to you if I go mad from the strain of your adolescent uproars? Small chance. You're not about to let go that much. I might take over if you did. And we can't let you do that, can we? You filthy beast! There, you're doing it again. You were such a good child when you were younger. It had to be a baby, can't you see that? The personality, the id, if you will, had to be weak, unformed. Child, why couldn't you have been cooperative and died as any other being would have? You are disgustingly abnormal. It's because I'm your daughter. What other reason would I need? The secondary mind shifted position, twisting back on itself. The small corner of Miri's mind allotted to it sometimes itched like the too small skin of a snake about to shed. I'm your daughter, it continued, but you cared so little for me that you could take my body without the slightest concern for what might happen to me. But you were only a baby, not yet even a person. Miri's mind brought into focus an image of a pale, squashy fetus floating in her womb. Parasite! You know I was far more advanced than that. Well, it's all been so long ago. A month or more I was out of your body. I was beginning to feel, to enjoy my surroundings. I wanted very much to live. Some day, Mother, I intend to take everything back, and when I do, I won't care a damn about you. It is not possible for you to do so. You see, I have complete control over everything. You or this body does, and I will manage to keep it that way. Unfortunately, I have to listen to your continual whining, but then I try to be patient with you. It's a mother's duty to— Ah, oh, shove! I sometimes wonder, Mary's part of the mind was wistful, if you're really not there at all. I could be going mad, and you're nothing more than an illusion, a small voice of misguided conscience, as it were. "'Conscience, you blood-sucking vampire! You haven't got one! "'Or if you did, you wouldn't keep doing this to me, Miri! "'Go right on thinking you've got full control of us. "'Then one of these fights you're going to be in for a little surprise.' "'Miri smiled. "'After her bath, Miri stood naked in front of a mirror. "'Turning from side to side, she admired the mounds and valleys that made up the body. "'There was a drop of bath-oiled water in her navel. "'Gently she smoothed it out and onto her silky skin. She raised her arms above her head, stretching her ribcage and pulling upwards the already high-placed breasts. "'Well, even if it is mine, I must admit you do take rather good care of the body.' Miri laughed, deep in her throat. It wasn't the high-pitched giggle of a barely mature girl, but the sound of a sensual woman fully grown and knowing. "'My body, always mine. Remember that, little one.' There was a sigh from the dark corner of Miri's mind. The small one was stirring, preparing itself for another screaming match. Miri enjoyed her conversations with the voice, child, conscience, or whatever it was. She knew, or hoped, she had the upper hand, but there was a slight element of doubt, a chance of some day slipping and losing control to the little one. Then, too, it was amusing, something to pass the time when there was nothing of more importance to do. If the voice became a bother, she could simply stop listening, block it out. The situation of dual personality had never occurred among her people as far back as Miri could recall, and her mind went back through many bodies. Never had one of her race invaded a body inhabited by one of their own kind. To do so was forbidden. But if a new body was not found and taken quickly, the being died with the old body. Miri had not wished to die, and her child's body had been close enough for a transfer of id. But the child had not died. Miri found she relished the fights with the stunted child mind she carried. It gave her a sense of power that was frightening in its intensity. The duels would continue. Miri chuckled, running her hands down over her hips. Beautiful, she murmured, tilting her head to study the curve of chin and throat. Then, cupping her breasts carefully, she stroked them, purring to herself. Lovely, and it's been far too long for either of us. She smiled, 
remembering something from the past, her past. What are you thinking? A worried probe shivered out of the little one's quarters. Mother, I don't understand this emotion. Please explain. Thinking? Why, surely you know, my little voice. Do we not share the same thoughts? I have a loving husband who has been waiting most patiently, a perfectly splendid body, and to be sure the knowledge that goes with them. She laughed, making yellow cat's eyes at herself in the glass. My body? My father? But it will be me that pleasures him, little one. No, you can't do that. It's my body. But his kind have rules. If he believed that you or I were really his child, he wouldn't touch me. And that would be such a waste. Of course he knows I'm his child. You died. Ah, tell me. Does he act as if I'm a child? Don't be silly. I am his wife. I have been and always will be his wife. It's so convenient, the powers of the human mind. He wants me alive, me, Miri. So, Miri, I am to him. I was small, and then large again. To him such things are the natural cycle of my people. You never existed for him, or if he thinks of you at all, you are some poor babe who rests in a grave at the edge of his wheat fields. Why, he can't even remember your name. That is, if you ever had one. Yes! Bless you, I did have a name. He gave it to me. It's... it's... Do go on. I'm listening with great interest. He did give me a name. I know he did. Mary, the child, felt a twinge of vertigo as their minds rocked with the force of the child's outburst. Oh, that's quite possible, but then it really doesn't matter very much now. Mary slipped a green robe loosely around the body, enjoying the feeling of the silky fabric on the breasts as she arranged the neckline so that it would gap open to the waist. He had bought it for her, Mary, out of hard-earned credits. She would make the expense worthwhile. Mary tied the sash around her hips, tugging the fringed edge to one side so that it hung down over one hip, swaying as she moved. If he gave you a name, which I doubt, he doesn't remember it at all. And I'm sure neither do you. Miri hugged the body, pleased with the cleverness of her own retorts. He wouldn't touch you if he knew I was here. The child's voice whispered over and over with the sibilance of a martyr's prayer. If I could get out, if I could tell him. The voice continued as Miri walked down the hall and into her husband, father's bedroom. "'Mother, please, please!' The child had switched tactics in mid-stride. "'Please! By whatever gods you believe in, please, mother, mother! Tell him I'm here, too! Let him know that it's my body! Don't let him do that without knowing I'm here, mother!' Mary wasn't listening. A corner of the room, a bed, a chair, everything in the room was distorted by the dim tunnel vision Mary had left for the small one. It nudged Mary's mind, trying to get her to adjust the focus. No answer from Mary. Her, their father, smiling, kissing, touching, caressing their, her body. Mary, the body, kissing, caressing in return. The small one felt the sensations of the body like some dim dream. They were Mary's feelings, Mary's sensations. There was a twitch of neuron activity a central writhing of Miri's mind into flowing patterns, glowing colors. Erotic vibrations rocked the body and the mind of the parasite. The child felt nothing except what it observed. No joy, no pleasure, nothing. "'It's my body!' the voice stubbornly repeated. No answer. It felt the edges of Miri's mind. No response. It spread itself like a leech over the barriers Miri had put up against it. It became a fog-like jelly, thinner, thinner, spreading, leaking into Miri's mind, pushing. Contact. Color, light, the sealing her father's face, Miri's mind. There was a flow of data from the skin, hair roots and internal structures. More flashes of sensation, more nerves tightening with pleasure. Feelings and a jumble of emotions danced through her, their mind. 
The small one felt sensations rising like a tide in Miri's soul, buffeted by waves flying before the storm, rushing over, under, and through the crannies of the mind. The small one felt fear for its own safety. Debris, old thoughts, disjointed sentences, and fragments of feelings battered at it, bruising and bringing an aching pain that it alone could feel. The flood rose higher, then higher still. The mind streams burst from their old paths, forming new ones. The peak of the storm came howling through the body, devastating in its power. Emotions peaked, joined whirlpools of exultation, and the frail chip that was the small one's id rolled in the foam of the backswell. The waves were up out of control, up, no, down, and back, then up again, up, up. Suddenly it was over. Peace, dry beachheads, and a smooth calm filled Mary's mind. Small one, a bit of flotsam, rested on an emotion-lapped shore. The mind was empty of Miri. The small one found no sign of the parasite's control, even over her, Miri's part of the entity. Small one flexed, feeling, touching the tired nerve endings, smoothed down the ruffled clusters of brain cells, and went looking for Miri. She lay sprawled on the bed, the robe bunched under her sweat-slicked hips, her sash flung carelessly across the end of the bed. Miri cat-stretched, her eyes glazed with deep satisfaction. Mmm, she purred, enjoying the warm happiness sliding over the body. Vampire! The voice was cold, harsh. Miri sat up suddenly, not quite sure of its origin. You filthy witch, blast you, Miri, damn you for the wretched mother that you are! A hard voice rolled like boulders through her head. Miri pulled the wrinkled robe tightly around the body, covering herself. Her eyes were big with alarm and wonder. Mouth slack, spittle dripping from one corner, she tried to block out the hammering hail of the sound of the voice in her mind. I can end you, Miri. I know how to kill you now, and I will, in time. You just go on. Do what you please with our body. But in time, vampire, in time. Miri listened to the voice whispering obscenities until it ceased entirely. As the months passed, Miri listened for the voice, but it never came. She sent thoughts, insults, compliments, and even promises of a chance to take control once in a while, back deep into the part of the mind where she knew that the other personality had been. Her only answer was a faint twitch along her nerve endings, which might have been a hibernating animal turning over in its sleep. Mary's mind was constantly looking inward, watching for the movements of the child within her mind and the one that was now growing in her womb. For the first time, she felt afraid. The pains were coming more frequently now. Miri was on her back, relaxed. The jump of a needle on the panel beside her hospital bed was the only sign of the ordeal her body was going through. Miri knew vaguely that there was pain, but she seemed incapable of feeling or reacting to it. Placid and uncaring, she awaited the birth of her first, second child. Weak, you're weak, Miri. The voice was soft, taunting. Miri, even drugged as she was, could still react to the fact that her mind-child had returned. The empty feeling in her back mind was now gone. With almost hysteric joy, she greeted it. You're back, little one. Oh, how I've missed you. How could you go away like that? I've been so worried about you. Ah, oh, little voice, little voice, she crooned. You're weak, the voice continued inexorably. You have lost, Mary, and you don't have that full control any more. For the first time in its existence, the voice laughed, a nasty, triumphant sound. Did you know that each time you bedded with my father, when you rested, I worked? I played with a ganglion here, took over a motor cluster there, and I tested, oh, most carefully, until I knew what my abilities were. Now you are too feeble from birthing to fight me off. It's my turn now, Miri. But I tried to tell you several times or more if you want to run the body once in a while, I'd let you really, I would. Is this the way it happened before? Did you lose your last body this way, Miri? All because of having me? Was that the way of it? The body died. I didn't know why. It died. Remember that? It died. I won't let this one die. It's mine and I'm going to be the only one running it. Please, you don't know what you're doing. Now it was Miri's turn to plead, as she fought to gather up what strength she could, 
to keep possession of a body which she had up until now never seriously worried about losing. You don't want this body to die, too. You couldn't. Please, wait until afterwards, after I have the baby. We can work something out. Please, wait. There was only you last time in that body, but now it's you and I, two of us, and only one body, my body, Miri, and you're tired. Too weak to keep it now. Give up, Miri. The needle of the indicator panel began to fluctuate wildly. The EEG reading was impossible to follow, and a bell began to clatter, alerting the medical staff that help was needed in a case that should have been routinely simple. Now there were two armadas, two powerful forces that moved through the waters of Mary's mind, destroying as they went, turning it into a graveyard. The child mind grabbed, pulled, twisted. The arms, legs, and head of the body jerked in a hellish, uncontrolled rhythm. The child could activate actions, but could not coordinate them. A baby trying to walk, speak, and swim all at the same time would have been more graceful than the child Miri. Nerves ripped from their channels, snapping free in the winds of destruction that was the body. Blood pressure dropped. The heartbeat fluttered madly. The body was dying, but Miri and the child mind still lived. I'll kill you, Miri. The body is mine, mine. The child raked madly through the remainder of the medulla oblongata, ripping axons from cell bodies, causing convulsions to ripple, down the spine to meet and meld with the turmoil of birthing. No, child, I can escape you. Here, the body is yours. Die with it, you hell-born brat. It's mine already. I don't need you to tell me so. I don't need you, Miri. Mary? Mary was gone, leaving the child mind to run screaming through the dying body. Mary was gone, and the body was dying. The child mind was dying with it, but the body had one owner. Mary was not there any longer. The parasite had no need of a dying body or of a child it had shared it with. The baby, struggling to be born, felt the quake and destruction around it, but was not yet able to comprehend its meaning. The dying convulsions of its mothers sent the child's bloody body spewing into the hands of the waiting doctor, who then held it aloft by its feet like some obscene trophy, slapping its bottom and introducing it to both pain and the outer world. Mucus running from nose and mouth, the baby screamed in protest, twisting in the doctor's grip, sun-fishing violently, trying to escape. The doctor expertly upended the child, cradling it in his arms as it stopped crying, and slowly opened its bright yellow eyes. Introduction to Escape to the Suburbs Rachel Cosgrove Pays is a prolific writer who works in a variety of forms. Her twenty-nine published novels include science fiction, mysteries, gothics, and a sequel to the Oz books of L. Frank Baum. She also does a good deal of short fiction. I think she is the only member of SFWA, Science Fiction Writers of America, who is also the mother of a member. The Pays family is a talented one. Rachel and Rob, mother and son, write. Ruth, daughter, is a very talented artist. And Norman, father, is an excellent photographer. They are also some of the nicest people I know. Escape to the Suburbs by Rachel Cosgrove Pays. We never get away with it, Wong. Come on, Willie. Ain't you and me soul brothers? The youth nodded solemnly, his Maasai braid swinging over a black forehead. He was taller than Wong, heavier muscled, stronger. But his wiry soul brother had the brains. Willie acknowledged Wong's superiority, bowed to his judgment. We can make it, Willie. We can escape. Willie rolled fearful eyes until only the white showed. Man, don't let no one hear you say them words. His voice dropped into a whisper. Escape to the suburbs. How? They were plowing through the fetid masses downtown. It was nearing noon, and there was a surge of humanity, hot and malodorous, toward the feeding stations. Willie tugged at Juan's arm. Man, you're headed wrong. The algae cake station's over that way. Come on, Willie, we got to talk private. Talk private, what a laugh. Where on the whole island fortress of Manhattan was their privacy, except in the towers? 
the teeming millions bred and lived and died in each other's pockets. After the final pull-out, when city government gave up and fled to Jersey, the masses who were left quit taking the pills and produced bumper crops of babies. They talked of increasing their power by increasing their numbers. They'd take over Whitey, make the suburbs their own, live high. But all they did was make the island a hell of population density. Juan maneuvered his way into a doorway, ousting the couple there with a show of his flick knife. Come on, Willie, we got to talk. We're going to get out this island. Man, you can't do it. It's God it all way. Look what happened to Lil and Sammy just last week. Tried to swim it, and those whitey guards on the Jersey Shore spit him like fish. Not going to swim it, Willie. I know the patrol's in blind, and I don't want to be speared nor shredded with a grenade. What's the point of escaping if we get killed? Use your head for something more than a holder for those pigtails, man. And he reached up and gave a tug on one of Willie's braids, making his soul brother yelp in anguish. Ouch, that hurts. Anybody but you, Juan. Beast brother, about our escape. Willie shuddered. Just talking about escape brought goosebumps out on him, even though it was August and the heat and humidity bore down on him like a collapsed wall. Tempers were short, fights common. There were many who didn't make it through a Manhattan August. A lot of flesh around. Rumor had it that not all the bodies got dropped into the river. Some went into soup pots instead of rat meat. An escape was dangerous. The Bronx patrolled. New Jersey killed without challenging. Brooklyn guarded its borders jealously. The tunnels and bridges had been blown when the last city government forces fled secretly in the night, leaving the masses trapped and embittered. It wasn't safe to mention escape to the suburbs. If the word got around that you had a surefire method, every gang on every block tried to torture your secret from you. Willie, we fly out of this hellhole. Man, you flip. What do we do? Sprout wings like pigeons? Soar like the gulls? No. Oh. We use hang gliders. Willie made a deep, disgusted sound, a growl at the back of his throat. Glide! Come on, Juan. They tried it just last week. I seen them, and so did you. Potted them in the air, busted up them gliders with machine guns. They fell like stones into the East River. True, man, true. They was dummies. Do they think they can fly low over the water and not get caught? It had been the Fork Devils who tried it. They'd made gliders, worked on them for weeks, guarding their enclave, a rotting pier, with the ferocity of ancient robber barons. Willie and Juan had spied on them from a vantage point in one of the crumbling towers. Juan even had a little telescope he'd rigged himself. He was clever at making things and scrounging the stuff to make them. The Fork Devils had built their gliders from bamboo struts, electrical conduit they'd pulled from the walls of decaying buildings. Wood they'd pried from door facings, driftwood, sheets of plastic they'd stolen from the tenters, who would wait to find their homes gone from over their heads. Then they made huge wings, deltas mostly, and practiced flying by taking off along the crumbling remains of the East River Drive. When the wind was right, some of them lifted as much as twenty feet. One stayed aloft five minutes, dangling from straps under his armpits. They practiced takeoffs, they soared. They turned and glided and landed, and all the time the spies on the other bank watched and waited. Juan, well, I don't want to fly. Willie, we're soul brothers. I wouldn't be happy living in the suburbs without you. This is all in your head, escape to the suburbs. I never managed there. I'm too black. You, he reached out a big black hand and touched Juan's cheek with the gentleness of a mother. You could pass there. Willie, I'll kick in your fool head. There's plenty of blacks escaped before the tunnels blew. I don't believe it. True. I talk with an old man. Must be nearly sixty. Miracle he's still alive is so ancient. He told me about it. He was alive when the tunnels blew. Nobody's that old one. Willie, I don't lie to my soul, brother. This old man, hair white, can hardly move. His little grandson gets the algae cakes for him at the feeding station. This old man says lots of blacks in the suburbs. Willie shrugged. Still don't make no diff. We can't fly. And you know it, Juan. Can, too. Gotta start out high, that's all. Fly away over their heads, so high they won't even see us. Juan's voice was low and persuasive. 
Willie protested, but all the time he was saying no, he knew in his heart that he'd do whatever Juan wanted. They'd been together all their lives. If Juan escaped, Willie knew he'd have to go, too. He couldn't live without Juan. If Juan were gone, he'd just lie down in the street and die. Okay, Juan, I'll listen, but I ain't promising. Willie saw that smile on Juan's face, a kind of sly twisting of full lips. Anybody else would worry to see Juan smile that way. It'd spell trouble, but not for Willie. Juan loved him like a brother. Together, with Juan's wits and Willie's brawn, they made a team. Nothing could stop them. Juan kept after Willie all the time. Think of number one, Willie. Don't worry about the others. Just about yourself. It was Juan's philosophy. And Willie agreed out loud, but always added inside his head, Think you too, Juan. Before me, I think you. Juan produced two algae cakes he'd acquired somehow, gave one to a hungry Willie, munched the other himself. We live high, Willie, from way up on top of the tower. Again Willie rolled fearful eyes. He didn't like heights. Some lived fairly high in the old towers, but with power cut off, elevators sat useless except as a family home. Most didn't want to climb too many steps. It ate up energy. And with the meager rations, the hellos ferried in each day, dropping them at the station so there'd be no danger of groups overpowering the crews and escaping in the whirlies. You didn't have much energy to waste. Just keeping alive in the city was a full-time job, so most of the tall towers were deserted, falling into disrepair through the years. I don't like high places, Mon. You know that. Takes both of us to lug the supplies, man. You want me to leave you behind alone? There was a hardness in Juan's voice that Willie knew too well. Even with him, the soul brother, Juan could be harsh. You know I go with you, Juan. Willie's voice was resigned. For Juan, he'd scale empire if Juan said climb. First we got a scrounge. Juan was good at that, better than Willie. But Willie went along, the strong back to carry the supplies. I watched the four devils. Know which gliders work best. Gotta keep him light but strong. Make a big delta wing. And I don't fancy hanging high up there in the wind by my arms. Pull him out of the sockets. We'll rig us little seats hanging down from the wing. Sit there and fly over the East River in comfort. Thinking about all that height, dangling beneath a fragile wing of plastic, made Willie feel like vomiting. No other way, Juan? No other way. They spent days assembling materials for two gliders. Toward the end... Juan went scrounging alone, leaving Willie in their hiding place in an odorous sewer to guard what they had already acquired. Guard it with your life, man. This stuff gets stolen. I swear I cut you up. Juan, I'm your soul, brother. Yeah, so guard it with your life. Sometimes even Willie was afraid of Juan. When he used that low, cold tone, it froze Willie's gizzard to a lump of ice inside of him. The day came when Juan brought back only food. Ma'am, we feed good. Where'd you get all them algae cakes? Willie reached a hungry hand, only to feel a sharp thrill of pain. Hey, man, you nick my hand. Keep hands off, Willie. We got to make them cakes last. No more going to the feeding stations. Tonight we climb the tower, and we don't come down except on wings. Almost afraid to speak, Willie said, Which tower? Empire. Winds off the Hudson. Blow us to Long Island. It was too much for Willie. You're crazy, Juan. Empire, it goes to the sky. And what happens if the wind blows us out into the ocean? I heard it goes forever. Water and water and nothing else. Fall in there, we're dead. You call living here a life? I'd rather fall from the top of Empire and squash in the street than live here any longer. You go with me, Willie, or I go alone. Even as he protested, Willie knew he'd go. He'd probably die, but he'd go wherever Juan led. Once he made up his mind, Willie turned practical. Juan had the brain, sure, but sometimes he was a dreamer, thinking up schemes that wouldn't work. Look how we get up, Empire. They live on the stairs. It's too high to climb the sides. And you get sick looking down. Again, that hard tone that Willie hated and feared. We fight our way up, one at a time, Willie. You're crazy. Gotta do it. One stays below to guard the stuff. That's you, man. You're bigger. I work my way above where they live, send down a rope, haul up the stuff. 
and then you come up alone. Man, they don't like strangers as they live. Juan shrugged. So cut him a little. You're big, Willie. Lean on him. If I can make it, so can you. Willie done his share of cutting, but he never liked it. But if Juan said cut, he'd kill a dozen or more. After dark, they moved, keeping to the sewers until they reached a manhole near Empire. Juan, in the lead, eased the cover and looked cautiously about. Come on, Willie, we can make it. Adept at fading into the shadows, they reached the side of the tower, burdened with their glider materials. Juan paced from the corner, said, This is where you wait, and was gone. Willie, back to the wall, one foot on the bundles, knife ready, waited with growing apprehension. It was a mad scheme, doomed to fail. Juan would die on the stairs. There'd be too little air at the top of the tower. He'd heard tales. He fought off one thief, cut a second, and was losing faith when something touched his head. With a gargle of fear, Willie crouched and swung above him, only to find that the attacker was the rope Juan had carried wound about his slender body like a snake. Nerves jittering, Willie fastened the first bundle and gave three tugs to the rope, their signal. Juan had made it. Once he'd hauled up both bundles, Willie would fight his way through to his soul brother. Then they'd ascend the awesome heights of empire to the very top. Willie saw the signs that Juan had passed this way. One dead, at least a dozen bleeding. With his sighs, with knife on the ready, Willie met little resistance. Just going through, don't want to camp on you, he called at each landing. Ten stories, twenty stories, he toiled. The ranks thinned. Finally a landing with no one living on it, and a whisper from the darkness. Willie, is that you? The climb was endless, the bundles were heavy, and even Willie's sturdy legs began to ache. Must be in the clouds. He was glad it was dark outside so that he couldn't see how high they were. Finally, with dawn just blurring the stars, they reached the top. Juan let Willie rest briefly. They ate a cake and drank from the plastic jug of water. Now we build the gliders. Good, we can work indoors. Willie refused to go out on the platform to look at the city. He watched Juan's long hair blow in the wind. Come back, Juan, you blow away. That's what I want to do, man. His eyes gleamed, and he exuded an air of recklessness that worried Willie. Once they set to work on the gliders, though, Juan was all business. He'd even sketched out rough plans, and his skilled fingers assembled the struts of electrical conduit, lashed them together, stretched the plastic taut. How do we get him out the door, Juan? Juan gave him one of those you dummy looks. It folds, Willie. Think I box myself in? It was evening when the gliders were finished. First thing in the morning, before Whitey's awake, we fly. Juan doled out more cakes and water. They ate in silence, both of them awed by being alone. It made Willie uneasy, for though he hated the horrid crowding down below, this silence, this being able to move without bumping into someone, was unnatural. And the flight tomorrow, he couldn't even think about it. That night, Willie's dreams were frightening. An urgent hand shook him awake. Damn man! There's a stiff breeze, the sun is up, we fly! They soon found the breeze to be a hazard. Willie's folded glider, once he'd maneuvered it outside, was caught by a gust, snapped open, and almost got away from him. Only Juan's quick reflexes saved it. Better lash him to one of the posts, Willie. Then, when we're ready in the seats and hanging on, we slash the ropes with our knives and off we go. Willie stayed near the door, afraid to step far out onto the platform. Looking straight ahead, he saw only the tips of one or two other towers. Beneath his feet he felt the tower sway slightly in the wind, and a rush of nausea almost overwhelmed him. "'Come on! Help me with my glider!' Gritting his teeth, Willie angled Juan's folded glider outside, holding it carefully so the wind couldn't fill it too quickly. Juan tethered it, then spread it on the platform and stretched it taut, making the final fastening that kept the frame rigid— made it into a huge delta wing. We have to leave from over there, where the parapet is crumbled, easier than balancing up on that railing. Willie took one look where Juan was pointing, and his gut knotted with terror. A great gap in the wall left them without any protection. If they fell, Juan, I can't. Willie, I'm going to fly now. If you don't come, you stay here alone. 
Juan fitted his arms through the straps and braced himself so that the wind didn't carry him away too soon. Willie followed suit, his knees trembling, swallowing hard to keep down his meager breakfast. Then he followed Juan, shuffling his feet for traction, to the edge of the platform. Willie planned not to look down, knowing it would be disastrous, but some horrid fascination drew his eyes to the panorama stretched out far below him. There lay the city, its towers in ruins, its streets already dotted with the ants he knew had to be people. Vertigo swept over him, and he collapsed to his knees, cowering under the canopy of his hang glider, which filled and tugged in the morning breeze, threatening to sweep him over the edge into that ghastly void. From above him, Willie heard Juan's voice, Come on, man! I'm aloft! I'm cutting the rope now! Forcing his eyes open, Willie looked up, not down. There, dangling from the giant kite, hung Juan, his face jubilant, knife in hand, ready to slash the tether and free himself for his impossible journey. No, don't go, man, you die! In an agony of fear, Willie slipped out of his glider harness and caught at the taut rope linking Juan to the tower. With powerful hands, he hauled in the glider. Let go! Juan's voice was cold with anger, but for once Willie ignored his friend's displeasure. Not gonna let you chance it, Juan. I can't fly, and you can't leave me here alone. We're soul brothers. He reached up one massive arm and caught Juan's foot, tugging at his friend to bring him back, ignoring the drop at his feet, intent only on keeping Juan here with him. Then there was a glint in the morning sun, and pain seared Willie's hand. Snatching it back, he saw blood drip from a long gash across the black flesh. You cut me! His cry was anguished disbelief. Nobody holds me here. Juan's face was contorted, vicious. I'm flying now, Willie. I ain't gonna stay for you, for no one. Gotta look out for number one. Again the knife flashed, and the breeze caught the glider, lifted it, and swept it away to the west. The backlash of the tether caught Willie across the face, almost blinding him. He fell to the platform, one arm dangling into the abyss. When his terror abated, he looked into the sky— Far away the black dot soared, as Juan made his escape to the suburbs. Crying, the tears running down his cheeks unwiped, Willie inched away from the broken parapet to the relative safety of the central platform. The enormity of his solitude crushed him, and he couldn't get to the stairway fast enough. He had to get down from the tower, back into the crush of crowds, back to the security of the masses in the city. Introduction to Alien Sensation. Creative writing teachers are fond of urging students to write from their own experience. Josephine Saxton's autobiography includes a truly wild assortment of experiences in her native England. She writes that she has been an inspector of woolen socks, a fish filleter, a brewer's clerk, a chalk marker, a painter of theatrical scenery, a chambermaid, an artist's model, a bus conductress, an art student, a wife, a mother, a machine embroiderer, and, of course, a writer. She is the author of about a dozen novels, three of which Doubleday published, The Hieros Gamos of Sam and Anne Smith, Vector for Seven, which was originally titled The Weltanschauung of Mrs. Amelia Mortimer and Friends, and Group Feast. She's also written a number of short stories, which have appeared in both magazines and all original anthologies. Alien Sensation by Josephine Saxton There was a sound coming from one of the two floating anchorages in the room, a soft sighing. Zine did not at first acknowledge it from where she lay on the other float. She did not want to hurry. The sound continued growing somewhat in volume and beginning to shake. It got harder at the edges and eventually, as Zine had known it would, became her name. In a little while she would reply but first she must rearrange her body. She took in a breath to gather sufficient strength and began the long haul. Left arm pressing down, lift a little and move the buttocks. Oh, it was so difficult. But it passed time. Not to hurry. She repeated the process once more and lay stupefied by the effort, blood thumping through her ears, sweat pouring out but drying quickly in the continual stream of air that was her floating bed. Several minutes passed, and she again gathered her resources and decided to answer, breath rising and vibrating, 
Sisurus coagulating into his name. Raoul. The silence, ritual silence in which his thoughts waited, expanded, filled time. Then he began. It took him almost twenty minutes. It was masterly the way he used more words than necessary, drew them out, and it was gratifying to her to realize how much effort he put into the actual saying. His technique at passing time was improving over the years. Ten years ago he would have taken only two minutes to say, What are you doing tonight? Having said it, in nineteen, he lay back, resting, and she lay thinking about it. What was she doing tonight? Probably she would decide on an injection for complete unconsciousness, but she had not yet decided. There were millions of things to choose from, all equally boring. In a few months she ought to get her chemistry analyzed again. It could be that her lack of interest in entertainments was due to a slight imbalance somewhere. But it was interesting to notice just how bored she could become with things. She must answer Rao's polite inquiry. Would she take an entertainment tonight? If she made her wishes known to the little microphone near her head, the right pill would tumble into its little hopper ready for her to swallow when she had fastened the headset on, and she would begin to experience her pleasure. It could be anything from a summer festival, where people dance day and night under a blazing sun, or a sex orgy, with herself as the object of the lust of several different kinds of animal, including men. She had spent years experiencing sex in every possible variety. It was probably the most lasting of all the sensations that could be offered. But she was bored with it. Her own consciousness insisted on piercing through the illusion from time to time. Whilst being raped by a Chinese wrestler only last week, her own mind had quite clearly come through, showing her that she was in fact still lying in her own anchorage, eyes closed, thin, pale body at rest, as always. That was no fun at all. An entertainment must seem real, or it did not pass the time. Yes, a chemical analysis soon, or her mind would be breaking through into other scenes— she did not want to know that she had just been injected with her nourishment when she was deep in the illusion of eating real food. The stuff they actually used to eat thousands of years ago, heavenly food like grass-protein veal steak done in petroleum albumen and seafood simulat in algal yeast. Oh, those must have been the days. How utterly strange to think of actually chewing. It must have been just like the pill illusions, only real. Yes, life must have been very strange in those days. She decided to take complete unconsciousness sometime during the evening, but first she must answer Raoul. To pass the time she did not give him a direct answer, but slowly informed him that there is so much choice of pleasure. And that was true. Whatever pleasure could be thought of was available for the requesting. And that was what life was for. All her life had been easy— she had had only one unpleasant experience when she had failed to report a faulty air couch and had begun to develop sores on her back, and yet Raoul was answering. He had almost elected to look at scenery, he said, panoramas with sunsets, stuff like that, big elations. Suddenly the room would cease to be and he would become some other, standing on a hilltop, inhaling fresh air, seeing beautiful ranges and ranked clouds. She had, when she was younger, spent several days at a time doing just that, but now she was a little tired of it. She was getting old. She was almost nineteen. She wanted to experience something entirely new and fantastic before she died. She was, she thought, unhappy. In control, they were discussing the recent problems of the indigenous race, the humans, so many of them were choosing complete unconsciousness so often, in lieu of pleasure or entertainment. And too much complete unconsciousness resulted in early death. It was becoming epidemic. The law, that all indigenous races were to be kept happy and at peace in their natural ways of life, was in danger of being broken. They were surprised and distressed that Earth, of all places, should experience trouble of this kind. It had seemed an ideal place to colonize— the humans had had no objection to being colonized just so long as the ideal existence which they had evolved over millennia was not interfered with. And yet after a hundred years of their life continuing as usual under discreet supervision by the colonists, things were going wrong. 
A sociologist was convinced that he had a novelty that would restore their joy in living. In collaboration with the chemist, he had produced yet another sensation pill. The head of local control thought that the sociologist was mistaken. It would harm human beings to experience such activity, even in facsimile. It would be a completely alien sensation to them. But I have been into their entire history. The vestigial extensions must have been suitable for something. I find traces in their chemical makeup. My colleague here assures me. You realize that we are responsible for these human creatures, that they must be allowed to continue in their chosen way of life, that we must not interfere. I will stake my life that this is what they require to revitalize them. Well, women have not the stamina. Let it be known to one or two of the men first that this experience is available. It is available in many thousand forms, as you know. What shall I call it? Release it only in a very mild form, and call it what you will. They have no name for it at present. Raoul said, it has no name. They call it Experience 8C69000, and it is experimental. Perhaps I would enjoy... AC began with a flat surface that one stood on. Wearing peculiar garments of rough material, he found them very uncomfortable. The flat surface was covered in a strange substance, gray, rough to the touch, sticky in places, and in those places thick enough to obscure other markings on the surface, dim-colored markings. There were two objects, one standing on the surface, one in the right hand. How did one play the game? Were there any other players? Wait a while. It would become clear what to do. The pill had not yet taken full effect. The object in one hand was a rod with a square thing at the lower end, and there was a lever attached. Move the lever. The square of material bent double. To pick up a ball, perhaps, and drop it into the receptacle? He went over to the receptacle and discovered that it was full of foaming liquid with a pale vapor rising off the surface. Utterly new. He began to feel excited. He delicately smelled the gas, and it was very strange and beautiful, clean and pure, yet completely poisonous at the same time. One could never drink such stuff. And then his thin white body was completely engulfed in the experience— the room and the air bed were no longer real. Here and now, this was it. He knew what to do. He took the rod and dipped it into the fuming liquid, lifted it out, and depressed the lever. Bubbles came oozing out, quite delightful. The squarish thing attached was now soft and wet. He pushed it back and forth along the flat surface on which he was standing. The sticky and gritty substance moved about adhered to the square thing, and miraculously disappeared, revealing a pattern on the flat surface beneath it. It was clear and shiny, quite wonderful. Dip into the fuming receptacle again, lift out, depress the lever. This time the bubbles were dark. Rub it back and forth, dip it, depress, rub. His skin began to itch, and Raoul laughed. Sweating was supposed to be a sign of illness, but this was just marvelous. The flat surface was changing, even as he took hold of the handle of the receptacle. The pail, he now knew its name to be, and he lifted it, moved it. Very heavy. Some of the liquid slopped out. There was a pain in the small of his back, but it was not exactly bad. Dip and rub. No dip. Depress. Rub. Dip. The pattern he was revealing as he scrubbed was a representation of roses, exquisite, shining. This was what he had longed for. This entertainment was utterly... The shock of seeing Raoul actually sit up and scramble off his airbed had been more than Zine could calmly endure. She had never seen a human being stand upright before. When he began to move his thin arms backwards and forwards, talking, fast, something about a receptacle, the pail, something about a mop, whatever that was, at the same time it had been too much for her. She begged Control to tell her what he had suffered, but they explained merely that something had gone wrong. They regretted the impossibility of explaining it further. Oh, Raoul had looked horrible standing up, all thin and sagging and a trickle of scarlet running down his nose. Whatever he had done must have been wonderful, but terribly dangerous. He had fallen dead, of course, as soon as he began to tell her, 
that he had just experienced the most wonderful thing ever. Solicitous though they were, they could not get her to take another life companion. Zine sickened without Raoul, and died, too. Introduction to Last One In is a Rotten Egg Granya Davis's first novel, Dr. Grass, was published earlier this year. She has written short stories, two children's books, some articles, and a newspaper column. Married and the mother of two children, she lives in California, but has traveled extensively, most recently spending four months in a Tibetan refugee camp in northern India, doing volunteer work. There is a comment I would like to make regarding Last One In is a Rotten Egg, but in this case I will do it as an afterword. Last One In is a Rotten Egg by Grania Davis The children, clean and well-fed, were lining up now, in the long, dark tunnel that marked the starting point. They had just been awakened from a good long rest, and some of them rubbed their eyes sleepily. Others, quicker to get started in the morning, laughed and joked and jostled each other, but gently and quietly. The occasion was really too serious to permit the sort of extreme rowdiness that might ordinarily take possession of a group of unsupervised children. Michael walked along slowly. A dark-haired, blue-eyed, quietly intelligent child. He was too smart to waste his energy now by fooling around. He was going to need all the strength he could muster if he had any hope of winning. Winning, of course, was the main thing. None of this nonsense about being a good sport. The race would be a hard one, long and dangerous. Often no one made it to the goal. Occasionally there might be a tie, with two or even more kids getting there at the same time. That was nice. But usually there was only one winner. The strongest, the fastest, the smartest are often just the luckiest. To the victor belong the spoils. For the losers, nothing. Hannah skipped along, humming a little tune. No point in taking things too seriously. Her hair, a mass of reddish ringlets, bobbed up and down in time to her inner music. She intended to do the best she could, but she was going to enjoy herself as well. Behind her, hand in hand, walked the twins, Danny and David, both with wavy chestnut hair and hazel eyes. They were planning carefully. They had no intention of being separated. For them it was double or nothing. They were going to run the entire race hand in hand. This might slow them down a little, but on the other hand, they could help each other out of trouble. After all, everyone knows that two heads are better than one. Jostling his way to the head of the crowd was Alex, blonde and muscular, grinning self-confidently. A whole bunch of other kids were reaching the starting point behind him, too many for the casual observer to be able to single out individual names or faces, but each one of these children was also intent on the same thing, winning. Even poor Aaron whom the other kids tried to avoid brushing against in the crowd so that he limped along, surrounded by a circle of empty space, Aaron, the victim of all the worst that the fates had to offer. Club feet, vacant, mindless, drooling stare. Could even his mother love him? I hope he doesn't win, whispered the other children as they passed him by, but like the others they knew he had no choice but to do his best. There were others— of what are euphemistically called exceptional children, Mary, for example, a highly intelligent child, but with a badly deformed spine, and a shoulder that made her walk like a wounded duck. Even she might be the lucky one. Right behind her stalked Jerry. Not very handsome, not very bright. Jerry's main pleasure in life was to taunt Mary, and any other kid who was weaker than he. Quack, quack, he sneered to Mary, who turned pale and tried to clench her flapping fists. Oh, shut up, Jerry, shouted slim, lithe, olive-complexioned Cassia. She had no need to fear the taunts of bullies, but she hated them anyway. Deformed, victimized Mary shot her a shy smile. The last stragglers reached the starting point now, and it was nearly time. They were all silent and tense, feeling the pressure mount. A warning shock, then another— and the exit of the tunnel burst open like a gun. They all raced ahead blindly, a number of them falling and being trampled by the rest. The first part of the race was really scary. No chance to get gradually warmed up. You had to jump off some high, steep rocks and swim quite a ways in a fast-moving, turbulent river, fortunately with the current. This was really hard for the dark-haired, blue-eyed Michael, who was afraid of heights. 
He could hear the screams of other kids who had jumped, but who hadn't quite cleared the lower boulders, which jutted out menacingly. Landing on one of them would mean the end, but staying here, as some of the kids were doing, would also mean the end. So, screwing his eyes shut, Michael took a running leap and jumped. He made it. He had cleared the rocks and was in the water, being whirled about by the current and sinking down, down. Gasping and choking, he managed to swim back to the surface. I can't swim, shrieked Hannah, her sunny tune silence now. No one told me we had to swim. She was floundering around, her red hair partly covering her face, which was contorted with terror, as she tried desperately not to sink. Relax and float on your back, called back Michael. Show me how. I don't know what you mean. Please, she pleaded. Show me how. I haven't got time, he called back, swimming steadily ahead. She cried and called a while longer. Then he didn't hear her any more. Swimming with the stream wasn't terribly difficult, if it had been merely a matter of swimming, but it was not. There were rocks and whirlpools that had to be dodged, and there were other children. Children trying to get ahead of you, children you were trying to overtake. There was no chance of doing a leisurely dog paddle and looking at the scenery. The limbs had to be kept moving as rapidly and as efficiently as possible. Otherwise, you would be left far behind. The competition was rough. Michael could see the muscular Alex and lithe Cassia several lengths ahead of him. The twins, Danny and David, were just about equal with him, and so was the bully, Jerry. Deformed Mary and a rather obese girl named Rachel were a little way behind. Their handicaps didn't slow them down in the water. A number of kids with less stamina were having to pause for rests along the shore and were being left far back. The unfortunate imbecile, Aaron, quickly forgot the point of the whole thing and sat on the shore staring at the mountains beyond and picking his nose. No one cared to urge him on. The bully, Jerry, didn't even bother to yell his usual taunt, brainless, footless wonder, as he passed him by. The swim lasted a long time, and many were unable to finish it. Those who did found the river growing narrower and shallower, until at last they were crawling in the dank mud of a wide, formless marsh. Michael's breath came painfully and hard, and his teeth were chattering despite the warm, oppressive humidity. He wanted oh so badly to rest, to eat, to sleep, but he knew that if he did, he was finished. He had to go on. But it wasn't even as simple as that. He had to decide now in which direction to go. There were no landmarks. There was no map. He had been given no instructions or hints before the race. Neither had any of the others. This part was pure luck. He looked to see what the others were doing. Some were heading in the same direction as the river had gone. Some were branching to the right, others to the left. For no good reason, he decided to follow the left-hand path, perhaps because fewer children had chosen this route, and he had always hated crowds. It was rough going. The mud was soft and oozy. Michael sank in nearly to his knees at every step. Pull, ooze, sink, ooze, slurp, ooze, pull, ooze, sink, ooze, slurp. Ooze. His legs were trembling with exhaustion after a very short time, and there was no end in sight. He had passed the poor, deformed Mary quite a way behind, sitting, huddled, quiet and miserable. There was no chance of her making it through this muck. "'Lord love a duck,' snickered Jerry, when he saw her giving up, but she was too exhausted to take any notice. Michael wanted to punch him in the gut, but knew he shouldn't waste his strength. There were so few left now compared to the enormous number who had started, just a handful, wishing that they could huddle together and cheer one another up, but knowing that this was ultimately impossible. Still keeping the lead position was strong, self-confident Alex. Behind him was the graceful Cassia, her dark hair now matted and muddy. Then came the twins, Danny and David, then Michael, then Jerry, then several other boys and girls whose names Michael did not know. The ground was starting to get firmer and drier now, and the rocky hills were appearing up ahead. Hey, wow, I think we chose the right direction, hooted Danny to David. The other brother nodded silently. His face looked gray and tired. He was just barely keeping up. They felt relieved and cheered to reach the firm ground of the foothills, but as they climbed higher and higher, the ground grew rockier, and the rocks grew sharper and steeper until finally they were inching their way along narrow ledges, feeling carefully for the few hand and footholds. Michael knew that if he dared to look down even once, 
he would be overcome with vertigo. So he fixed his eyes straight ahead. He did not even look around when just behind him he heard a crunch, a gasp, and a long wailing cry. One of the girls had not made it past that last slippery spot. Nor did he look at David sitting on a narrow rock shelf above him, pleading with his brother to stop and rest. I'm too tired. I just have to rest. But you know how important it is to keep going. I don't care. Just for a second. You go on without me and I'll catch up. You know I can't do that. Let me try to carry you. To hell with you, said his brother, starting to cry in hysterical exhaustion. You always want to be the big shot, the boss. Well, I don't care. I'm going to stay here and rest. Okay, Davy, it's all right, said Danny, stroking his brother's head. We'll rest if you have to. And large tears streaked down his dirty face. At last they seemed to be reaching the top, a narrow plateau with a gaping crater in the center. So they had been climbing a volcano. The fearless Alex was already heading down into the crater when suddenly the ground shook and hissed and a mass of hot liquid and semi-solid chunks of matter came spurting up from the seismic center. Alex had time to utter one deep gurgling cry and then the race was over for him. Hey, yelled one of the other boys, I'm not going in there. I'm going to look for another entrance. And he headed off down the other side of the mountain, with several other children following behind. But Michael sensed that there was no other way to go. He knew that their eventual goal was deep underground, and that this was probably the only opening for miles around. There were only three of them left now. Loutish, ill-humored Jerry. Kasha, nimble, quick and strong. Michael dirty, exhausted, grimly trying to keep up. And so into the crater, praying that there wouldn't be another eruption, sliding down long, slimy streamers of heat-loving mosses and lichens, past bubbling fumaroles and boiling mud pots, until at last, sweating and afraid, they saw a great cool cave branching off into the depths of the earth. This must be it, thought Michael, feverishly, as he and the others raced inside. Indeed, this was it just as it had always been described to them. In the middle of the cave was a large, still lake. In the middle of the lake was an island, and on the island, white, round, luminous, and inviting, was the giant pearl, the goal. They raced to the edge of the lake and dove in, then gasped with amazement. The water was stinging, burning, and painful, not pure water at all, but nasty, brackish, full of poisonous compounds and chemicals. I can't stand it, screamed Jerry. My eyes, it burns my eyes. I can't see. Oh, my eyes and my skin. It feels like it's coming off. How can you stand it? He cried, rushing back to the shore, whimpering and rolling in the sand. Come back, you guys. This must be the wrong way. This'll kill all of us, he shrieked hysterically. If you won't come back, I'll make you, he cried, heaving stones at them from the shore. But they fell far short. And now there were only two left, Kasha and Michael, and Kasha was faster. Kasha, called Michael, let's make a deal. Let's get there together and call it a tie, okay? But she wouldn't answer. He was nearly to the island, but she was already climbing on dry land. Suddenly his feet felt bottom. He gave a mighty leap and caught her. Let's make it a tie, damn you! But she only struggled and tried to kick him. He was stronger than she was. He forced her onto the ground and grabbed a big rock and started to pound it on her head until she was quiet. He retched, gagged, and dropped the rock. I offered. I did, he sobbed. Now he was the only one left. There was no more hurry. There was the pearl, enormous and glowing, a moon infinitely valuable. He walked around it, feeling its satiny surface, and then, right in the center, he saw the niche, small and comfortable, just the right size for him to curl up and rest in. A long, deep rest. He sank down in an exhausted stupor, feeling all the strength ebb from his body. His last thought, just before falling asleep, was, Well, I guess I've won. I wonder what my prize will be. A few weeks later, in a small frame house, the woman was talking excitedly on the phone. Hi, I just got the results of the pregnancy test, and you're going to be a father. Hey, wow, burbled her husband. The little innocent darling crooned his wife. I wonder what he or she will be like. I don't know, laughed her husband. But you take it easy this afternoon, nothing strenuous. We'll eat out tonight to celebrate. 
I want my kid to be strong and healthy. You know, a real winner. Afterward, for last one in is a rotten egg. Apart from Kathleen Skye's Mother Beast, this is the only childbirth story in Cassandra Rising. I was pregnant when last one in is a rotten egg arrived in the mail. I bought it anyway. Introduction to the Way Back Raylan Moore is a journalism major, Ohio State, who has actually worked for newspapers, including the Dayton Journal Herald, the Deseret News in Salt Lake City, and the Carmel Pinecone. Her short stories have appeared in such disparate publications as Esquire, Woman's Day, and Fantasy and Science Fiction, to which she contributes regularly. Her contemporary novel, Mock Orange, was published in 1968. She is the mother of four children and teaches magazine writing at Monterey Peninsula College. The Way Back by Raylin Moore During the long, empty days and nights in the hospital, Lorena, thoroughly explored by pain, circumnavigated by fear, dreamed of going home to Wiltonville. When at last her illness was over and the fever had drained away, leaving her skin as chill and smooth as a nectarine just removed from a refrigerator, she could remember nothing that would keep her from making the trip. It was simply a matter of setting out, she supposed. For miles the highway followed the river. It seemed that she and Sonny and the children had camped along this stream in some far-off summer though now the activity of strangers along the sandy shore was as remote and inaccessible to her as if it were happening in another world. Through a silken chartreuse-colored screen of birches and aspens, she caught glimpses of rowers of boats and swimmers, their unclad limbs and the bright awning cloth of their tents flashing signals at her in the thickening light of late afternoon. At dusk she came to where the road turned off and began to watch for the covered bridge. It wasn't there. A flat concrete span lay across the water, and Lorena recognized the replacement as a working out of the inevitable. The ramshackle covered bridge had been one of the last of its kind in the state, perhaps one of the last anywhere, and vulnerable in the terrible way that last things always are. She wondered if, during her time away, there had been a Save the Bridge committee in the neighborhood, as earlier there had been Save the Woods and Save Crescent Lake committees. All the meetings, petitions, posters, and speeches coming to nothing in the end. The farmhouse, which had been for three generations in Sonny's family, was seven miles farther on, up a winding narrow road. But she had no need for caution. Lorena knew every loop and fall, every twist and rise along the way. She had lived nearly ten years in the house, and had expected to go on living there as many as forty more— having foolishly forgotten how expectations seldom encompass the occasional oblique slashings across the grain of things. Lorena's first visit to the house had been shortly after she met Sonny. On that occasion they had driven the long ascent in daylight through an art show of turning fall leaves. Perhaps, as she often accused herself later, she had first loved the house, then the man, but no matter— by the end of that weekend, she was committed to both. The building had been done all in stone. She recalled having once heard some architecturally knowledgeable person declare that it is impossible to build badly in stone. With rounded window tops and curved glass in the fat circular tower jutting from the north front corner of the structure, but the two aspects which most captivated her were the delicate fanlight over the front door and the view into the valley from the musty, unoccupied top floor of the tower. Sonny's mother, a widow and a generous woman, had taken an apartment in Wiltonville so that Sonny and Lorena could have the house in the country when they were married the following spring. Now the last rise, and finally the last curve, brought her to the wide, flattened-off top of the hill, where lights streamed from all the downstairs windows, and a dozen or so cars were parked around the circular driveway. Sonny was having company. Lorena recognized the huge vintage jaguar, which for years had been the great pride of the Burrises, their neighbors down the road. But most of the other cars were strange to her. At the back gate, Rodeo, the Irish setter, began an excited clamor, cut off in mid-breath when he recognized her, and replaced by an ecstasy of wriggling and devout fawning as he escorted her as far as the kitchen door. The guests, she knew, would be grouped, 
in the front of the house and because of the summer weather out on the brick terrace overlooking the side yard. So she would have exactly what she needed, the chance to slip into the house unnoticed and go straight to the children's rooms. Even though the rear stairway and second story appeared to be steeped in flat darkness, Lorena turned on no lights. She needed no illumination in the lovingly familiar territory of the old upstairs hall, with its burnished floor of wide oak boards, centered by the heavy, wear-forever strip of woolen rag rug made by Sonny's grandmother. It was when she began groping for the equally familiar shape of the crib in her daughter Althea's room that Lorena for the first time became slightly disoriented. Her hand touched nothing. And then farther along, her knee nudged something soft, identifiable after a minute as a mattress under a layer of quilted taffeta. The crib had been replaced by a single bed. But this was only proper, for Althea was no longer a baby, of course, but now old enough, evidently, to be allowed up late. Lorena was forced to conclude a moment later, after running her fingers over the tumbled surface of the bed, and finding there no small warm body curled in upon itself in sleep like some hibernating wild creature. The same disappointing emptiness prevailed in her son Tom's room next door, where a nightlight, gleaming yellow as a lynx's eye, showed a vast jumble of clothing, bits of machinery, disorderly stacks of books and magazines, and the balance of inefficiently consumed apples and sandwiches strewn across floor and furniture— the tide stopping at the bed, which was unmade, but also unoccupied. The only movement and sound in the room came from the old-fashioned starched white curtains, which whispered, as they were intermittently sucked against the screen of the open window, by the whimsical movements of air outside. She was disappointed out of all proportion at not finding the children in their beds, at the same time, she realized how absurd were the sudden rush of tears and the caved-in sense of loss. Her failure meant only that she would have to go back downstairs to find them, but she would be going down anyway to seek out Sonny, whom she longed to see almost as keenly as she had yearned to touch the sleeping bodies of the children. And a pleasure delayed is twice as enjoyable, she told herself, within limits. One should not put off things too long. At the head of the magnificent sweep of the front staircase, she paused, a little shocked at the sheer intensity of the composite sound rising from below, the babbling, chittering, nattering of the guests. It was a case of having to force herself to wade into the wash of rising noise, but by the time she was halfway down the steps, she was rewarded by being able to observe the handsome, animated bodies garbed in party dress. Many of the faces were at least vaguely familiar— but Lorena at first could fix her full attention on only one. The face of a stranger, a very young stranger, wearing blue. For one electric moment the girl lifted her eyes, the precise blue of her dress, and for that moment seemed to hold Lorena's own gaze as the latter finished descending the stairs. It was Althea. Only afterward did Lorena realize that the girl in blue had been standing hand in hand with a blonde boy, tall, and slope-shouldered, but with his face too soon lost to view as the couple moved on past the foot of the staircase toward the brick terrace, the glass doors to which stood open in the warm night. Lorena did not try to follow them, but attempted to make herself small and unremarkable among the crowd that remained in the house. Almost at once she saw Sonny. He looked older. It had something to do with the depth of the etchings around his eyes as he stood at the front door greeting some newcomer, and with the encroaching grey which had crept from his temples to cover his thick hair like an overnight frost. Lorena felt herself almost overwhelmed by the memory of him, of his physical presence, his way of speaking, his rare but towering anger, of the fact that he had been a poet caught up in teaching jobs and family responsibilities, not figuratively a poet, a real one, published, if sparingly, encouraged by other poets, mildly celebrated rather than rage against the constrictive life, he had used the paraphernalia of his existence as his working material, sawing off so many bored feet of chalk dust and morning coffee, cranky plumbing and laden diaper pails. Theirs had been certainly a good alliance. Her only disquiet had stemmed from the unfortunate truth that most of their major projects, 
an exchange teaching job in New Zealand, a sabbatical in Europe, a rewarding and enjoyable job for herself in her own field. She was a design draftsman, as soon as the children were old enough, had somehow been pushed so far into the future that they remained even now unrealized. And yet she had had the house. She would not allow herself to forget that. Moreover, it was all here waiting, as she had known it would be. Lorena moved slowly through the press of bodies, savoring each thing, the square rosewood piano which had belonged to her mother-in-law, the collection of jade, a gobelin tapestry, and a pair of oriental screens which were the harvest of someone's long-ago world tour. The high ceiling rooms were the repository for the accumulations of the several generations, as happens in all old houses occupied in continuity by a single family, and she'd been too awestruck and uncritically approving to change the arrangement of any furnishings when she came into possession, though possession wasn't really the right word she could understand now. She wandered on, directionless. At some point, and without consciously listening to any of the conversations going on around her, Lorena became aware of the real purpose of the party, and after she knew, she wondered at not having apprehended this fact sooner. The number of young people scattered among the guests might have told her, even without the rapt look Althea had worn. She hoped the blonde youth was someone worthy, honorable, not cruel. She hoped that if the new alliance for some reason failed, the pair would know better than to cling to it for its own sake. There was so much, undoubtedly too much, that she might have told Althea, and no time left now. When Lorena saw that she had come to the French doors, finally, still being washed along by the others with no real destination, she stepped across the threshold. Through the trees, a bulge of orange light foretold where the summer moon would presently rise, and on the terrace a fire burned prettily, on the outdoor hearth Sunny had spent one vacation constructing. There were nearly as many people here as inside, all talking as determinedly, but the voices, unconfined, did not fall back upon one another and shatter into pure noise. She had not much difficulty in identifying the dark-eyed youth who emerged from the shadows of the side-yard with a fresh load of firewood. But before Lorena could react, her long-time friend Carolyn Metzger appeared on the brickwork. Carolyn wore an insubstantial apron over a beige hostess outfit, which Lorena hadn't seen before. Tom, Carolyn said, bring one more load, won't you please? It may turn chilly in another half hour. Carolyn, Lorena said impulsively. Oh, Carolyn, I want... And Carolyn Metzger tilted her head alertly, for an instant, as if she'd heard something that puzzled her, before turning and re-entering the house. For a long time, Lorena looked at Tom, marveling at his height his loose-jointed but not ungraceful adolescent body, as he moved among the others, returning with the second bundle of wood, pausing for an unintelligible but intense conversation with three girls perched on the round lip of the fireplace. Somewhere food was being prepared in a rush of melting odors. All along what they had always called the glass side of the house, where the tall doors opened onto the terrace, hung the draperies she herself had made and carefully lined. She knew, without walking inside to examine them closely, that the lining hems, which she had basted but never gotten round to completing before that night she had left the house, more or less unexpectedly, were still as they had been, not quite finished. The party had polarized, most of the younger ones drifting toward the outside while their elders remained indoors, holding cocktail glasses, still talking indefatigably. Lorena again found Sonny, this time in the living room, standing with one arm around the waist of Carolyn, who had removed her impractical apron, and another around Althea. A balding man in a handsome shepherd's plaid jacket, one of the many people whom Lorena did not know, was taking a picture of the three, with a very complicated-looking small camera, top-heavy with attachments. The blonde youth Althea had chosen hovered near. It was then that Lorena heard herself mentioned. Out of the cluster of guests, a female voice, perhaps a slightly tipsy voice, poised perilously on the verge of the sentimental, called out to Althea, How lovely you look, dear, if only, Lorena! The great embarrassed surge of babbling, chittering, nattering descended over all, then, 
mercifully snuffing out the awkward sentence midway, covering over the awful breach with a fill of nervously reuttered commonplaces. Such a beautiful girl. They make fine looking. Here's to the— Only Lorena, standing among them, was pleased and gratified. She knew that now, with nothing and no one to stop her, she could go back down the mountain if she chose, or, perhaps better, up into the tower, where from the musty, unused room the whole valley would be visible, layered with moonlight. Introduction to Schlossi At the time I was living it, 1973 did not seem like a year I would ever remember except with anguish. I spent the first half of it watching my 26-year-old sister die of cancer and waiting for the results of gynecological tests. Joni died in May, and in June my doctor told me I would never have a child. Yet 1973 was as much a beginning as an end. In July I began working on Cassandra Rising, and in August I got pregnant. Oh yes, it was that kind of a year, too. It may seem odd to rank an anthology with the conception of a long-desired child, yet Cassandra Rising has been a significant part of my life for four years, during which I've met a group of wonderful women, the contributors to this book. They have been encouraging, patient, kind, and helpful. I am endlessly grateful to them all, and to two others, Virginia Heinlein, who made many kind and thoughtful gestures, and Virginia Kidd, agent extraordinaire. To list Virginia Kidd's contributions to this book would require another book. Schlossi was written in 1973. It is autobiographical, but it obviously came directly out of my own experience. I began writing it in my mind on the way home from my sister's funeral. Schlossie, by Alice Lawrence. Squeezed in between her husband and the chauffeur on the front seat of the limousine, Esther Camber had an unobstructed view of the hearse preceding them with slow dignity to the cemetery. She tried to make herself look to the sides, but inevitably her eyes returned to the sight of that massive black vehicle, and she mentally repeated the words which had become a kind of listening. It just can't be Schlossie. Judy. Automatically, she corrected herself, dropping the nickname Judy had hated. In the back of the car, her mother was crying, and her brother, Ira, was trying his best to comfort her. She couldn't go on that way, Mama, suffering like that. It's best this way. God's will, Rose, her father said. Rose Blumenthal continued to cry. God's will, Esther thought. Does Papa think saying that helps? How? It doesn't answer anything, just makes it nasty to ask the questions. But the questions are still there. Nobody wanted Judy to go on suffering, but that wasn't the point. Why should God will Judy to get cancer, and to have to die at twenty-seven? Did God hate her? Why? What had poor little Schlossie ever done? She tried to think about Judy, and again, like last night, the two images came fast on each other. Judy laughing, and Judy desperately unhappy. Judy laughing because she'd had the hardest, most contagious laugh Esther had ever heard. She could never tell a joke. Someplace in the middle of it, the punchline would hit her, and she'd start to laugh and be unable to continue. It didn't matter. Everyone around her had always laughed, just as if she delivered the funniest story ever told, but somehow Judy never made it to the punchline. Yet Judy had never been happy. Despite the laughter, Judy'd been a desperately unhappy girl, and Esther didn't know why. It seemed that Judy had everything possible going for her. Beauty. Judy was the beauty of the family, no question about it. Brains. In a brainy family, Judy stood out. Personality. It seemed to shine in that mobile face and those huge eyes. The Blumenthal family was a happy one, close, loving, generous. And Judy was their darling. There was never a question of her wanting anything, except life should have been a snap for Judy. She should have breezed through school, gotten a sensational job, met a fantastic man, married him, produced beautiful children, and been ecstatically happy. She'd done none of that. School had been a torture for her. Esther could not remember her ever getting less than an A, and she could not remember a time when Judy hadn't been convinced she was doomed to failure. She reported failure on every test until the grade was in. Each A was an astonishment to her, and seemed to augment her pain as if she'd obtained it under false pretenses. Judy in the first grade had been like Judy working for a Ph.D., tense, doubtful, frightened. 
But why? Why, why, why? And why, if it had been such a pain to her, why had she continued in school? Nobody had said she had to get a Ph.D. Not that she had, but why finish all your courses, research the entire thesis, and then drop it? And in the name of anything holy, why should a girl from a Jewish family pick Adolf Hitler as the subject of her research? Every fact encountered seemed to hurt her. Yet she persisted to the moment of writing the dissertation, and then dropped it. And for what? Esther remembered the family arguments at the time, arguments that made no impression at all on Judy. She had her master's. She was well qualified in history, something of an authority on the Third Reich, fluent in German. There were endless possibilities for sound employment. You could teach German or history. You could be a translator, Papa had said. But nothing would move her. She took a job as an assistant buyer with a chain of cheap stores. I hate German, she said to Esther one day. I don't ever want to hear that language again. Esther had been shocked at the violence in her tone. Yet at the end, when she was in a partial coma, it had been German she'd spoken. None of them spoke German, and it had been necessary to get a German-speaking nurse to tend her and translate her words. Not that she'd said anything significant. She'd asked for water for a painkiller. She'd wanted to know what time it was and who had sent the roses on the window sill. There had been something about Hitler, but the nurse hadn't been able to catch the words, just the name. Why should Judy have been obsessed with Hitler? He died before she was born. None of their family had been in Germany. No relatives had suffered his persecutions. He was someone Jewish people would, could, never forget. But it had gone far beyond that with Judy. And it had taken another form. Esther suddenly remembered watching a film on television with Judy, a film that showed Hitler at the Olympics, in which Jesse Owens had taken every prize in sight. Look at him, Judy had said, gesturing to the screen filled with Hitler's face. It had seemed to Esther to be the most hate-filled face she'd ever seen. That man is suffering, Judy had said. Have you ever seen such pain? Esther had thought she was crazy. Maybe it was best she'd never written that dissertation. Judy was in the field of psychohistory, and her plan had been to try to see the events of Nazi Germany from Hitler's point of view. Not exactly to justify it, she'd said, talking about it to Esther. You can't really do that, can you? But I want to try to get inside him to see why he did those things, what they meant to him. If people could understand that it seemed different to him, sometimes I feel like I'm the only person in the world who really understands Adolf Hitler, she'd added. The remark had senselessly frightened Esther, as if understanding Hitler was some sort of a crime. Yet why not, she thought now. Sick, evil, whatever he was, wouldn't it be a good thing to understand what made him that way? Yet Judy had stopped short. She'd abandoned the research and become a buyer of 995 dresses. Even Hitler deserves some privacy, she'd said. Besides, it's pointless. 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 From whose vantage point? That had been three years ago. Judy had been in perfect health. Why was getting a Ph.D. pointless? Sometimes I wonder if she knew, Ira had said last night. It had seemed as if Judy was only marking time those last few years. She'd seemed to be on the point of marrying Phil Golden, then dropped him. She'd switched jobs twice, each time with high enthusiasm that had quickly waned. She talked about finishing up her degree, but she'd done nothing about it. But how could she have known she was going to die of cancer at twenty-seven? Unless she'd chosen to die that way. How would you die if you could, S? Judy had said once. Esther couldn't remember her own answer, but she could remember Judy saying, I wouldn't live to be too old. Sometimes I think you pick out your way of dying, only you don't know it. And you pick it out with every step you take. Or maybe even before you take a step. You're in the wrong religion, Esther had said. That's predestination or something. You should be a Calvinist. Oh, no, Judy had said quickly. I had to be Jewish. And then had looked confused at her own words. She changed the subject quickly. The hearse turned off the road, passing through the gates of the cemetery, followed by the line of headlighted cars. The cars parked, and there was a pause while the pine box was removed from the hearse and the final preparations made. In a year, Esther thought, we'll come back for the unveiling. Judith Blumenthal, 1946-1973.
1946, a year after Hitler had died. Suppose there was such a thing as reincarnation, Esther thought. Judith Blumenthal, formerly Adolf Hitler. The thought suddenly excited her. My God, that would explain so much, reincarnation. Hitler came back as a Jewish girl, trying to understand him, and chose to die in a horrible way as atonement. They climbed out of the car and gathered about the raw grave. Esther tried to listen to the Hebrew words, but a long buried memory had suddenly surfaced. Schlossi. She remembered the day Judy'd gotten the nickname. They'd been at the beach, and Ira, full of ten-year-old self-importance, had built a sandcastle. It had been a wondrous structure, with turrets and battlements, a moat, and a drawbridge improvised from a tar-covered slat. Judy, she must have been about three, had been playing with the pail, when she suddenly noticed the castle. Ein Schloss! Ein Schloss! she'd screamed, jumping up and down with joy. Then she'd lost her footing and fallen sprawling across the castle, flattening it, and her joy gave way to desolation and howls of anguish. Ira had taken charge, picking her up. Come on, Schlossi, we'll get some ice cream. It was a common German word, common enough for one of their parents, Esther couldn't remember which, to recognize and translate, laughing. But where, exactly, had three-year-old Judy learned it? No one in the family knew German, or if they did know it, used it. Esther couldn't remember any German-speaking neighbors, and even if there had been a German family nearby, how often would they, living in the Bronx, discuss castles? And just how had Judy known the correct article to use? She stood, stunned by the memory, trying to be sure it was something that had happened and not just a dream. It seemed suddenly vivid, and she wondered how she could have forgotten it before. She didn't notice the others move away and return slowly to the cars. She continued to stand by the grave, and in horror she whispered, not meaning to speak aloud, My God, we've buried Adolf Hitler in the Jewish cemetery. From the other side of her new grave, soundlessly and sadly, the former Ava Brown laughed. Introduction to Lady in Waiting In this unusual Anne McCaffrey story, no ships sing and no dragons quest. Instead, a widow makes jelly and tries to come to terms with grief while her children play dress-up, in clothes that aren't there. Anne McCaffrey was the first woman to win both the Nebula and Hugo Awards. She is also a woman who will take the time to be kind to a stranger. I doubt if she remembers, but years ago she dropped everything to help me retrieve a manuscript, which seemed forever lost in a magazine editor's office. Lady in Waiting by Anne McCaffrey Mummy, Sally wants to play dress-up, said Frances, her pointed little face contorted with the obligation to accommodate her first guest in the new house. I do, too, said six-year-old Marjorie, pouting her rosy, plump cheeks in anticipation of refusal. Sally Marion just stood in the loose semicircle about Amy Landon's kitchen table, her dubious but polite expression challenging her hostess. Dressing up seems a very good idea for such a drizzling day, Amy replied calmly, to give herself a moment to think what she could possibly find for them to play in. She finished pouring the steaming bramble jelly into the jar. Fran caught her breath as a gobbet on the lip of the saucepan splashed and instantly dissolved, coloring pink the hot water in which the jars were steeped. What did you plan to dress up as? Ladies in waiting said Sally, recovering from the initial surprise of agreement, but still determined to put her hostesses to the blush. There was such an appeal in Fran's soft eyes that Amy was rather certain that the notion of this particular costume was all Sally's. Wait is in waiting, Marjorie said, frowning and pouting as if to force her mother to accept. We'd be very careful, said Fran in her solemn way. I know you would, pet, Amy replied, smiling, gentle reassurance. Not for the first time, Amy wondered how long it would take the sensitive Frances to recover from the shock of her father's death. His brutal murder, Amy amended in the deepest part of her mind. Peter had been a victim of a bomb thrown without warning into a London pub. She disciplined her thoughts sternly back to the tasks at hand, pouring the bramble jelly and figuring out how to comply with her daughter's needs. Very careful, 
Marjorie said, bobbing her head up and down while Sally Marion waited to be surprised. Of course you would, love, Amy assured the child, knowing that Fran could be depended upon to make certain that her younger sister was careful. Frances is a real goat, Amy's mother often said with pride, since the child resembled her in feature and colouring, and more help than the twins, I'm sure, despite their being older. The poor wee fatherless lambkins, she'd recently taken to adding, in a tone that stiffened Amy's resolve to make the move that had indirectly caused Peter's death. During the first days of her bereavement, the hideous irony of his dying had given her a passionate dislike for Tower Cottage. The only reason Peter had been in that pub at that critical moment was to phone her the good news that he'd signed the mortgage contract for a house that would take them away from the increasingly dangerous city streets. A house in the grey stone hills of Dorset, with its own orchard and gardens and a paddock for a pony. The kind of rural, self-sufficient life that Amy and he had known as children. Her parents and his had urged her to repudiate that contract, to stay close to them so that they could give her the comfort, protection, and aid which a young widow with four growing children would undeniably need. Stubbornly, and contrary to her prejudice towards Tower Cottage, Amy Landon had honoured that agreement, citing to her parents that the life assurance policy required by the mortgage company now gave her the house free and clear. You could say that Peter died to secure Tower Cottage. Amy had told the parental conclave. It is far away from London, and I want to get far away from London. I want to abide by the plans my Peter and I made. I'm well able for the life. It isn't as if I weren't country-bred. Just because you wanted to retire to the city. But all alone, so far from a village and neighbours, her father and Peters had argued. I'm hardly alone with four children. Young Peter's as tall as I am, and much stronger. We're scarcely far from a village when there are shops, a post office, and a pub half a mile down the lane. As for neighbours, I'll have too much to do to worry about neighbours. And the fewer the better, she demanded to herself. She'd abhorred the pity, even the compassion accorded her for her loss. She was weary of publicity, of people staring blurry-eyed at herself and her children. They'd all be spoiled if this social sympathy continued much longer, spoiled into thinking that the world owed them something because politics, or was it madness, had deprived them of their father. "'My mother keeps a special box,' Sally Marion was saying, to draw Amy's thoughts back to the present, to the low-beamed kitchen, redolent of bubbling brambleberries, sealing wax, and the casserole baking in the old aga cooker. "'It's got clothes my grandma and great-grand wore.' Amy wondered if she'd ever use those maxi skirts again. I have some things in the blanket chest. She hesitated. She couldn't leave the jelly half poured, and she resisted the notion once again that there was something about the box room that made her loathe to enter it. Don't worry, mother. I wouldn't touch anything good, said Fran, patently relieved that her mother had risen to the need. And you daren't leave the jelly. Wait is in waiting. "'asked Marjorie in a quavering voice. "'Yes, yes, love. Go along, then, girls. "'I really must finish the jelly. "'Fran, you can use those long skirts of mine, "'and there are old sheets in the blanket chest. "'Why on earth be afraid of a blanket chest?' "'But a frisson caught her between her shoulders. "'They make lovely flowing trains.' "'From the scornful expression on Sally's face, "'Amy wondered what on earth the child was permitted to use in her own home. "'Cheeky child!' She concentrated on the jelly, finishing the first pan of jars and getting the next ready, before her maternal instinct flared. Back in the kitchen, separated from the main section of the cottage by the pantry and thick walls, she could hear nothing. She'd better check. She pushed open the pantry door and the high, happy voices of the girls, affecting adult accents, carried quite audibly down the stairwell. They were obviously playing there on the landing in front of the box room. Satisfied, Amy returned to her jelly. She found unexpected satisfaction, she mused, in these homely preparations against the winter. Atavistic, Peter would have called her. The summer had not been kind to the land, and its bounty was reduced, or so the villagers said. But Amy Landon had no fault to find. The apple and pear trees of Tower Cottage were well laden when you considered that there'd been no one to prune, spray, or fertilize them. And how there came to be beetroot, potatoes, cabbages, carrots, and swedes in the kitchen garden, Amy didn't know. The villagers had rolled their eyes, and each suggested someone else as the Good Samaritan. 
Her circumstances were known in the village, so she concluded that some kind-hearted soul did not wish her to feel under obligation. Nonetheless, the abundance of the garden meant that she could manage better on the Spartan budget she allowed herself. She would make no unnecessary inroads on savings that were earmarked to see the children through college, and she refused to think in terms of compensation money. With the cost of all commodities rising, she must grow or raise as much as possible on her property. Mr. Suttle, who ran the tiny shop at the crossroads, had told her that old Mrs. Mallett had kept chickens, she that had owned Tower Cottage before the Allardyces bought it. The Allardyces now, they hadn't lived there very long, come into money, sudden-like, and bought a grand house nearer London, only they didn't get to live in their grand new house because they died of a motor accident before ever they reached it. While well, Mr. Suttle hadn't heard of chickens living wild like that for two years or more, then returning to their old run, there was no other explanation for the flock that now pecked contentedly around the barn behind Tower Cottage, and obediently laid their eggs for Patricia to find. To her father's amusement and young Peter's delight, Amy had purchased a Guernsey cow, for what was the sense of having a four-acre meadow and a barn unexpectedly full of hay if one didn't use them? Mr. Suttle had knowledgeably inspected the same stable and hay, pronounced the one fit to house cattle and the other well enough saved to be eaten by the cow, and applauded little Mrs. Landon's sense. Old Mrs. Mallett, who'd been spry to the day of her peaceful death, had kept chickens, a cow and pigs, Mr. Suttle thought he might be able to find Mrs. Landon a piglet to fatten for Christmas, and lived quite well off her land, and kept warm and comfortable in Tower Cottage. Amy assured Mr. Suttle that this was her intention, and she thanked him for his advice, but she rather felt the piglet could wait until she was accustomed to managing cow, chickens, and children. Actually, it was young Peter who managed the cow after instructions from the farmer who'd sold them the beast, and Patricia, Peter's twin, who cared for the chickens. The two vied with each other to prove their charges in that curiously intense competition reserved to twins. Amy sealed the bramble jelly and began to stick on the labels which Fran had laboriously printed for her. All of them had picked the berries the day before, a warm, sunny Sunday, and made a game of the work, arriving home in the early September dusk, berry full and berry stained, with buckets of the rich, dark fruit. The only deterrent to complete happiness for Amy was the absence of her husband. This was what he had wanted for his family, and he wasn't alive to share it. In poignant moments like this, her longing for him became a physical illness. She must continue to force such negative thoughts from her mind. The children had had enough gloom, enough insecurity. She must find contentment in the fact that they were indeed living as Peter had so earnestly desired. Young Peter came in with the milk pail, the contents frothy and warm. Patricia was just behind him with eggs from her hens. "'I think Molly likes me.' Peter announced, as he usually did when the Guernsey had let down her milk for him with no fuss. "'Another dozen eggs, Mummy," said Patricia, taking her basket into the larder and carefully arranging the freshest in the front of the moulded cardboard. Peter heaved the bucket up to the counter, got out the big kettle, whereupon he began to measure the milk before heating it. He was keeping a record of Molly's output, as against her intake, so that they would have accurate figures on how much their milk and butter was costing them. He was all for trying to make soft cheese, too, since there were herbs along the garden path for seasoning. High on the wall by the pantry door, the old bell tinkled in its desultory fashion, announcing a caller at the front door. Wondering who that could be, since the few people with whom she was acquainted would know that she'd be in the kitchen this time of day, Amy half ran to the front hall, wiping her hands as she went and pulling fussily at her jumper, aware that it was jelly-sticky. She gave the door the hefty yank it required, and discovered Sally's mother, about to use a huge, clumsy knocker. "'Good heavens, Mrs. Landon! I'm terribly sorry to keep you standing on the stoop, Mrs. Marion. But I can't thank you enough for keeping Sally. No bother. Such a nasty day, the girls have been playing dress-up.' In mutual accord, the women crossed the square front hall to the stairs. Above them some charade was in progress. They could hear Sally proclaiming dire news in a loud and affected voice. "'Sally, dear, it's Mummy come to collect you.' "'Oh, Mummy, did you have to come just now?' Amy and Mrs. Marion exchanged amused glances at the distressed wail of protest. As they looked up, Sally was leaning over the upper balustrade, her face framed by a gauzy blue, 
the folds of heavy blue sleeves falling to cover her hands on the railing. I'm just denouncing the traitor in our midst, who has de... de... What did you say he was doing to us, Fran? Sally turned her head and nearly lost the heavy headdress. Sally, love, Mrs. Marion's voice was patient and level. I've got to pick up the meat for tea and your father's at the station. There's only just time to get to Mr. Suttles before... Oh, mummy! Sally's tone was piteous and undoubtedly tears were being repressed. Amy heard Fran's soothing voice to which she added her own assurance that Sally could return very soon and continue the game. It just won't be the same, Sally's voice ended on a petulant high. The women saw a swish of royal blue skirts which told them that Sally was submitting to the inevitable. Fran, love, would you put the things away for Sally since she has to leave now? Yes, Mummy. Come on now, Marjorie, you can help. Marjorie blubbered a protest, evoking her privilege as the youngest in the family. If you're big enough to be a lady in waiting, you're big enough to help, Fran said in such an imitation of an adult that Amy and Mrs. Marion grinned at each other. Sally's stiff-legged descent of the stairs reminded them of that young lady's disgruntlement well before they could see her scowling face. Amy gathered up Sally's school mac and book bag, quickly deciding that the dirtier of the two school scars was not Fran's, and prepared to speed the departing guest. Sally allowed herself to be helped into her coat, but her seething resentment dissipated as she babbled to her mother that Mrs. Landon had smashing things to play dress up in, Mummy, and when could she come back again, please, and thank you, Mrs. Landon, for the tea, and Mummy, didn't you have to go to the dentist again very soon? Mrs. Marion, amused by her daughter's effusiveness, smiled and said all the properly courteous things as she hurried Sally across the square hall and out the door. As Amy waited politely on the steps while the Marion's green mini was bucking down the pebble drive, she began to wonder at Sally's unexpected enthusiasm. What on earth had the girls managed to find in the smashing category in that blanket chest? Certainly her maxi skirts and those old sheets couldn't qualify. What else was in the chest? Suits of Peter's that she'd put by for his son, the odd blanket or two, a few drapes, some outgrown things of Patricia's, party dresses of hers that she would be unlikely to wear in Dorset, several lengths of fabric, nothing royal blue in the lot. And she never had any occasion to use gauze, nor headdresses. As far as she could remember, there'd been nothing left behind in the box room by the previous owners, the unfortunate Allardyces. Mom, the milk! Peter shouted through the pantry door. Do put everything back, Fran, won't you? Amy paused long enough in the stairwell to hear her daughter's assurance before she returned to the kitchen and an urgent affair with pasteurization. At supper that night, when Marjorie was safely in bed, Amy remembered the royal blue puzzle. Fran, pet, how did you get on as ladies in waiting? Oh, Mummy! And Fran's face glowed unexpectedly. We had a super time. Marjorie was in a red wool, though we had to pull the skirt up over the belt so she wouldn't trip. She was the junior lady in waiting and carried Sally's train. Sally was queen because she was guest, so she had the blue because blue is the royal colour, isn't it? Peter had guffawed, so Fran turned wide, serious eyes on her brother. Sally said it was. To be sure it is, Fran pet, Amy reassured her glaring at Peter. So that left the green for me, but I think the green was for a man because it only came to my knees. Marjorie's and Sally's dragged on the floor. Red? Green? What green? Amy was mystified. Green, sort of velvet stuff, I think, and it went from here to here. Fran measured the length of her small body, and there was fur along the collar and no buttons, so I used another belt. I don't recall putting away any belts. The fancy dress ones, Mummy, with the big buckles and sparkly stones. Fran's pleasure was fading fast in the face of possible maternal disapproval, and her voice wavered as her eyes sought her mother's. Oh, those, said Amy, as if her memory had been at fault. Those old things, I've forgotten about them. I don't remember you and father going to costume do's, Peter said, gathering his brows just the way his father had. You could scarcely remember everything your father and I did, Peter, said Amy placidly. Peter tended to act the expert. There's more Ovaltine, 
and she reached for Fran's glass, smiling to clear the anxiety from her daughter's face. Molly's making more milk, so we have to keep up with her production. Peter, time for you to check her while we girls do the supper dishes. Then all of you off to bed. She made the school lunches and checked the doors before she could no longer defer the mystery of the fancy clothes. Resolutely, she climbed the stairs, looking down into the square hall as she came to the first landing. The oldest part of the house, the estate agent had said, an old Norman keep, probably, though the stonework was in astonishingly good condition for a structure so old. Doubtless that was why the fifteenth-century architects had incorporated the keep when the house was begun. Certainly thought Amy the house was a continuous production, all periods rather than one, now combined into a hodgepodgery which had appealed to Peter's sense of the ridiculous. The heterogeneity had also fascinated the engineer who had examined the house for Peter and Amy prior to signing the contract. On the way down, he'd been frankly suspicious at the asking price, and warned Peter and Amy to be forearmed for disappointment. Surprisingly, the engineer had discovered very few problems, most of which could be put right with a judicious slap of mortar, plaster, or paint, and the odd dab of putty or sealer. The cellar was dry, the thick sound walls oozed no damp, the floors were remarkably level, all nine chimneys drew, the drains were recent and in good order, the slate roof undamaged by the storms of the previous winter, and not a sign of woodworm. The engineer reluctantly concluded that the tower cottage was reasonably priced, because, as advertised, it was genuinely to be sold quickly to settle the Allardyce estate. Still, there was a palpable aura in the square hall which Peter had chalked off to antiquity, and something almost expectant in the atmosphere of the box-room immediately above the hall, those two rooms comprising what was left of the old Norman keep. Amy was not a fanciful person, certainly not superstitious, or she would never have moved into Tower Cottage at all after Peter's death. Yet she avoided the box-room, sending the children either to retrieve objects stored there or consign others to its capacious shelving or the huge heavy wooden chest that dominated the front hall under the two slit windows. Flemish work, the engineer had called the chest, with the modern addition of a thin veneer of cedar wood on the inside to make its purpose clear. He had wondered if the chest had been built in situ, for he could not see how it would otherwise have got through the doorway. Peter had sat on the chest that day, Amy recalled. He'd thumped the wood, laughing at the hollow echo of the empty chest, remarking that it would be a good place to hide the body, several bodies, by the size of it. Amy had felt the frisson then, running up her spine to seize her head and jerk it on the neck with an involuntary force that astonished her. The engineer had noticed and solicitously remarked that unlived-in houses always chilled him. Since they'd moved in, she'd made one concession to the distressing atmosphere of the box room. She'd put the brightest possible bulb on the landing, and had young Peter put an equally strong one in the box room's single socket. Oddly enough, the children loved playing in the box room. Tonight she turned on both lights and stood for a moment on the threshold, staring at the dark bulk of the carved wooden chest. It did not move. The carvings did not writhe or gesture. A faint odor of lavender and cinnamon was detectable, mingling with old leather, wool, and camphor, homey smells, compatible with the room's use. Not a shadow stirred. With swift steps Amy crossed the room and tugged up the lid of the chest. Just as she thought, the two torn sheets, rough-dried, were neatly folded on top, her maxi skirts just below. But one was check and the other black. Where was royal blue, or red, or green with the fur-trimmed collar? She sat on the edge of the chest and lifted out a stack of garments, Patricia's outgrown jumpers and skirts, Peter's shirts and underclothes, socks. She turned in the other direction and sorted through business suits, vests, more jumpers, her crepe and wool party dresses. At the bottom were two pairs of old drapes and some glass curtains, white. Nothing gauzy blue. No ornate headdresses, no costume belts. She delved to the wood of the chest's floor and found only the mundane things she expected. Fran was a literal child. If she'd said she dressed in green with no buttons and a fur collar, she had. Puzzled, Amy ran her eyes over the contents of the shelves. Nothing there, surely, but Christmas ornaments, boxed games, lampshades, empty jars, young Peter's tent and backpack 
frame, oddments of china set aside for a jumble sale. On the other side of the door, the tea chests, containing Peter's business papers, books, the family's suitcases as neatly stacked as they'd been since the day after removal from London. Yet Sally Marion had been dressed in royal blue, the soi disant queen's color, and gauzes. A flash of color caught her eye, and she turned towards the chest, blinking. She could have sworn that the topmost sheet had been, however fleetingly, a brilliant blue. To reassure herself, she smoothed the sheet. But her fingers told her it wasn't velvet, just worn linen. She stood up, closed the lid of the chest, almost dropping it the final few inches as the full weight of the wood tore the lid from her fingers' inadequate grasp. She'd asked Fran in the morning where she'd found those dress-up clothes. Possibly she'd misunderstood. The frison caught her by the back of the neck before she'd reached the safety of the door. It was like a hand on the scruff of her neck, pulling her back to the scene of some childhood crime, an injunction against a cowardly retreat. In spite of herself, Amy turned back into the room and stared around her. The scent of lavender and cinnamon was cut by a sharper smell, vinegarish, then a sweetish odor. Familiar but unnameable assailed her, an odor as sharp as the previous covert command to stay. Stiffly, Amy walked back to the chest, set her hand on the lid, imagining, as Sally might have, wondrous costumes in which to be medieval ladies in waiting, and a queen. No torn sheets, no dull woolen jumpers now lay exposed, but royal blue velvet, deep red wool dress, green circuit, fur-trimmed, and belts encrusted with rough-cut bright stones set in the dull gleam of gold links. She slammed the lid down, and the compressed air smelled of sweat, human and hoarse, of stale food and spilled soured wine, heavy musk perfume mixed with camphor. Weakly, Amy sank to the cold stone floor, impervious to that chill. The older dices came into money, Mr. Suttle's words echoed in her mind. Had some altered-ice child or adult dreamed of hidden treasure in the old keep and found it in the chest? Amy shook her head, fighting to think rationally. Did the chest grant wishes, then? Pray God it was only one wish, and Fran had had the chest's quota for them all. And that was the end of the matter. She thought of gold and jewels, rich fabrics, oriental silks and gauzes of ornate Arabian slippers, impossible things to stock an old wooden chest in Dorsetshire, and opened the chest. Her heart pounded as she dropped the lid on those same imagined riches. Mrs. Millett, she'd lived in Tower Cottage for years, spry till the day of her death. Hadn't Mr. Suttle said so, wanting for nothing, the house and ground supplying her requirements? Amy laughed, a single sound, hard and strained, like her credulity. What had the widowed Mrs. Millet lifted the lid to find a body? As Peter had whimsically suggested, the sweetish odor, elusively familiar, pervaded the box room. Amy screamed a soft, tortured cry, her hands stifling it to a whisper, lest Peter or Patricia hear her. That same sweetish odor had filled her nostrils as she'd knelt before Peter's coffin in the church. How could the house have killed her Peter in that bombed-out pub? It couldn't have. Illusions. Her longing for him. No. The single negative was as low as it was firm. She spread her hands, her fingers flat on the lid of the chest, denying what could be if she so desired. No. She spread her arms across the chest in repression, in supplication, in prayer. This was just a chest with old clothes in it. Two torn sheets and some dresses waiting for parties for children to grow up to fill. This was just an ancient tower, used as part of an old house, a house where children could grow up in healthy country air on fresh vegetables and milk, and where they could pick apples and pears in an orchard and brambleberries from hedges, just an old house that had served many families in the same way. The nauseating sweetness dispersed. Lavender and cinnamon returned and the smell of night and rain. Slowly Amy pulled her arms together, rose to her knees before the chest. She placed the heels of her hands under the lid, and swallowing against the dryness of her throat, pushed upwards. Her body blocked some of the light from the overbright bulb, 
but she saw the comforting white of old cotton sheeting, caught a whiff of her favorite cologne, impregnated in the dresses she'd stored in the chest, a hint of the cedar wood. It was as she'd wished. She let the lid down gently and leaned her forehead weakly against the edge. It took her a few moments to gather enough strength to rise. Really, she told herself, as she walked towards the door, she ought not to attempt to do so much in one day, though they had enough bramble jelly to last years, even with the amount young Peter slathered on his toast. She switched off the light and closed the box-room door behind her. Her fingers hovered briefly over the key. No, she could not lock out what had apparently happened, or lock in, whatever it was. That would be superstitious, as well as downright useless. Nonetheless, when she flicked off the hall light, she said good night, just as if there was someone waiting to hear. Introduction to Impact In a collection of science fiction and fantasy written by women, a story by a writer named Steve requires some explanation. Despite the masculine given name, the feminine pronoun is correct. Steve Barnes uses that name not to pass herself off as a male, but as a way of preserving her family name, Stevenson, lost in marriage. Steve's first science fiction sale was in 1972, shortly after she joined the Denver-area SF Writers' Workshop, headed by Ed Bryant. And she says she began writing science fiction as a result of watching the Star Trek TV series. She has also published a number of articles in dog breeding journals and devotes a good part of her life to breeding and showing purebred beagles. Impact by Steve Barnes A kaleidoscope of color, swirling, merging, hurrying east, the rush of steel-belted radials on hot summer freeway, the nose-prickling, almost nauseating smell of gas fumes and hot engines, Denver in August. The eastbound Mustang leaped ahead with the leaders of a stream of impatient motorists who had been bottlenecked at the overpass. It pulled away just behind the first two cars, tires eating concrete greedily, engine wrapping up as it accelerated. I'm going to be too late, Karen thought. He'll be gone before I get there. A mental image of Jean rose in her mind. Sandy hair that was too long to be completely tidy, but had an engaging way of curling around his ears— the short, blunt nose, the wide, always smiling mouth. I didn't mean all those things I said, she thought. He's got to understand that. I didn't mean them. I hope he knows, but I have to make sure it was my fault, and I'm sorry I have to let him know. There was a sharp report up ahead. The car directly in front of her went into a long, sickening skid. Karen swerved, her eyes watching in horror as the other car lurched sideways and rocked wildly. She had a glimpse of the driver's face, white and stricken, as he fought to slow down. Somehow she managed to squeeze by just as the flat ripped off the rim and folded under the wheel. The car, now completely out of control, rammed into the guardrail and bounced back across the lanes of traffic. Another car sideswiped it turned over, and began a ponderous, terrifying roll down the center lane. Another eastbound car slammed into the first car as it stalled where it had rebounded from the railing, and there was a brief, muffled roar as an orange umbrella blossomed above the rear of the first car. A fourth motorist, following too closely, piled into the wild tangle of cars, and a fifth. Karen slowed immediately, feeling the cold clutch of fear. Her hands shook as she started to break, and she had difficulty in reaching the side of the highway. But now the traffic had completely stopped, blocked effectively by twisted metal in the inferno of hungry flames. Karen looked back in her rearview mirror and saw people already out of their cars and running to the wreck. Slowly she eased back onto the freeway, her body still numb from the suddenness of the accident. There was nothing she could do to help. She would just be in the way. It would be better if she proceeded rather than block more traffic. But her real reason for leaving was Jean. He might still be waiting, and she had to reach him. Cautiously, she pulled out into the fast lane, and her foot pressed the accelerator hard. Ahead of her stretched an empty freeway. She would make good time. Impact plus two-fifths. The bumper folded like crumpled tissue. One end of it impaled a tire. The engine tore loose from its mounts and hurtled backward, spewing hot oil and fuel. Water geysered into the bright Colorado sun. The hood flew upward and bent into a horseshoe shape. 
The windshield buckled and then broke inward, creating a prismatic rainbow. Inside, the driver matched flesh and bone against plastic, steel, and iron-hard webbing. The shoulder strap of the seat belts slapped against a fragile collarbone, broke it like a matchstick, jolted into breastbone and ribs. Flesh parted over fragmenting bone. A shattered rib bent inward, tearing into chest cavity and lung, causing an almost clinical pneumothorax. Blood surged into the driver's throat and began to spurt from the nostrils. Karen took the wrong turn-off and found herself wandering the street of a neighborhood totally unknown to her. The street led down through a suburban area with lawns, green under gyrating sprinklers, and cottonwoods that whispered in the August breeze. Overhead, a cicada sizzled in the skillet of hot treetops. Karen drove for blocks past identical houses, white and prim and square. She looked for a street sign, anything to tell her which way she should turn. But the new curbs and gutters were bereft of markers. The entire section was peaceful and quiet, asleep in the hot afternoon. She drove on slowly until she passed out of the residential area into a region of abandoned warehouses and a vacant lot filled with broken bottles and bits of blowing paper. The paving of the streets had been ripped up and the dirt left to lie like the obscene droppings of a giant earthworm. The buildings were sad-looking and neglected, their surfaces scarred by the wrecking crews, their windows broken so that they looked blindly down at her. Unexpectedly she shivered in the warm air. The one incongruous note of the landscape was a lean-to made of new pine planks. It was sitting to one side, and as she pulled to a stop beside it, an old man came out. She hesitated, uncertain about asking directions from a stranger, but he approached the car as if accustomed to welcoming wayfarers to his home. "'Lost?' he asked, leaning a dirty forearm on the car door. "'Yes.' She took a deep breath to steady her nerves. It was getting late, and Jean would leave soon. She must hurry.' The thought was with her as regular as a heartbeat. I guess I am. I meant to turn on to Brighton Boulevard, but I must have missed it. He sure did. He grinned, and the expression caused the planes of his face to crack, the way erosion fractures the soil. His eyes were red-rimmed and his nostrils filled with kinky gray hair. Karen looked away, quickly aware that she had been staring. He eyed her a moment longer, amusement teasing the corners of his mouth. Then he straightened and waved an arm. "'That's where the people stay,' he told her. "'You should go back there.' "'But I want to get back to the freeway, I-70.' "'It's about two miles, but the streets angle and curve. Every one of these newfangled housing developments has twisted streets. You'll never find it.' Karen felt a surge of impatience. The old fool was rambling. He probably had a bottle in that shack and had been sleeping it off. I have to hurry, she thought. Gee, mustn't go off like this. We can't write an end to it this way. In all our years together, we've never parted this way, angry and silent. It's important. I've got to get home. She broke into her train of thoughts and started the car. Thanks, anyway. I I'm sure I can find it. Well, you can try, lady, but I'm telling you, you can't get there from here. She glanced at herself in the car mirror and saw how tousled and upset she looked. Her eyes were overly bright, the pupils stretching black and deep, almost the width of the iris. Her short, glossy brown hair was clinging damply to her forehead. Her usually soft mouth was tight with nervousness. She spun the steering wheel and made a sweeping turn around the shack. She looked up once into the rearview mirror to see the old man, surrounded by the dust of her leave-taking, watching her, the grin still on his face. She accelerated, speeding out of desolation, back to the highway, back to Jean. Impact plus four-fifths. The fragments of windshield rained over the driver's face, inflicting miniature knife wounds, nicking at brows and protectively closed lids. The steering column started a thrust toward the vital organs. The dashboard smashed into the delicate knobs of the patellus, shattering them and driving the femurs hard against the hips. The upper portions of the ball and socket joints cracked audibly. The tibias splintered until they resembled the crazed pattern of dropped china. The driver's head flew forward to strike the steering wheel. The bridge of the nose was crushed flat, cartilage grinding into sinus cavities. The upper teeth cut through the lips, and then were ripped from the gums in ragged chunks. The mouth turned into a red-black smear. It had been so good between us for so many years. I love him, Karen thought. He's the kindest man I've ever known. 
When my father died, he was all that kept me going. He's gone home, Karen, he told me that night, and I knew he was right. Cancer can only make a person welcome death. It would seem like going home, I guess. She remembered their last visit to City Park. It had been warm, but it was still early summer, and not as hot as now. Sweat worked out on the forehead in agreeable little drops that evaporated instantly in the cool breeze. Jean was lying bare to the waist beside her, and she rolled over to study the golden freckles that punctuated the reddening skin of his back. "'You're getting sunburned,' she teased him. "'I always do. Where's the oil?' She removed the bottle from her purse and began to apply the liquid to his back. The feel of his skin under her hand was good, warm and solid, with the elasticity of firm muscle tone. She became earnestly engrossed in her work, taking a sensuous pleasure in feeling the slip of his flesh between her fingers. Later at home, they lay facing each other in the dark, pressing warmth to warmth, his need to hers. Her lips offered no resistance as his tongue slipped between them. She was having trouble getting into the proper position and placed her feet against his insteps to thrust herself upward. The skin of his arches was incredibly soft and tender. The feel of him between her legs was both satin-smooth and bone-hard, tissue stretched, yielded, surrounded, welcomed. Karen was lost, she had to admit it finally. She had turned one street short of the access road, or possibly two, and was now in another unfamiliar part of town. This neighborhood was not so prosperous. The lawns were untidy, as if the owners had more important things to worry about. A child's wagon was deserted on the sidewalk, one wheel missing. A dog was barking somewhere, steadily and angrily. From the doorways of the houses a few dark faces peered at her. A group of children, for want of a better place, were playing kick the can in the street. They folded around the fenders of her car, their fingers touching and stroking the bright metal. A little boy of about six leaped up on the level with the open window as she halted. "'You lost, lady?' He vanished from sight as he dropped back to ground level. "'Yes.' Her voice sounded hushed, shaken to her ears. She felt tears of frustration smart her eyes. "'Yes, please help me. Which way is the freeway?' The children, carved from walnut and capped with the gloss of raven's wings, had all gathered by her window. Their eyes haunted her with their yearning. A little girl removed a dirty finger from her mouth and pointed up the street. As if this was a signal, each one began to point and shout, That way! That way, senora! No, that way, lady! This way, Blanca! They began to caper and giggle, their shouts rising shrilly in the heat. Karen rested her head on the steering wheel and thought of home. Jean, please don't leave. Not yet. I'm coming. A woman, in her twenties and heavily pregnant, came out of a house and approached the car. There was a ponderous majesty in the way she placed her feet, balancing her weight with each step. Her dress was clean, but faded from many washings. Her hair hung dull and black around her face, and her eyes were hooded under swollen lids. Cala la boca, niños. She waved the crowd of children off. She planted her feet far apart and raised an arm slowly to gesture down the street the way Karen had come. "'Go to the corner and turn. You will see the highway from there. But the construction will be between you and it, always the construction. They promise us new sewers, new paving. Always the streets are torn up. The children play in the ditches that the crews dig. They fall in and drown when it rains. No one cares. But the highway? I can get to the highway?' I do not know, senor, but I do not think you can get there from here. Someone else may be able to tell you the way I cannot. I've got to try, Karen thought. She thanked the woman and turned the Mustang around in a driveway. It was a relief to leave the sad-eyed woman behind. Impact plus one. The steering column battered the sternum, sending bone into spleen and liver. The stomach and intestines whipped against their fragile container. The lacerated spleen began to saturate with blood. The brain concussed against the frontal plate of the skull, and thin black lines of hemorrhages began on its convoluted surface. Vision blurred, and then was lost in a sea of red. The taste of blood filled the mouth, and bits of teeth were sucked into the one good lung as the torn mouth opened in a scream of pain and terror. Karen couldn't believe it. Ahead was the house, her house. The familiar row of lilacs framed the dark Mediterranean door, and its windows glistened cheerfully under the August sun. 
She jumped out of the car before it stopped rolling and ran inside. It was dark and cool and empty. Jean had gone. She opened the bedroom and saw all his clothes had been taken from the closets. His suitcases were gone from the shelf. Unexpectedly, a sob caught in her throat, and she sat down on the bed, her knees weak. She hadn't thought of what the future would be like without him. She had only been obsessed with making it right between them. Now the day stretched ahead of her, bleak and uninviting. She dug her fingers into her brows and wondered again how she could have been so stupid, so selfish. They belonged to each other, had been inseparable. Their one joy in life had been the sharing and tasting of each day together. I've been a damn fool, she told herself. It was all my fault, and now I'll never be able to tell him. The sound of the front door closing barely aroused her attention. Then she heard the well-known steps in the hall. Karen? His voice sounded loud in the quiet. Karen, are you all right? Jean, I'm here. She ran to the doorway. They met in the hall and stopped to look at each other uncertainly. He looked frightened, his face pale and tense. Thank God. His voice was ragged. I was at Stapleton when I saw the news on Channel 4. There was a big smash-up on I-70, out by your mother's place. I saw a blue Mustang in the middle of it. It looked like yours. I know I passed it. It happened just as I was going by. She paused, trying to rehearse the words. Jean, I'm sorry. Can you forgive what I said? I never should have spoken that way, and then rushed off without another word. Please. She looked up and searched his face. I love you, really, more than anything on this earth. He came to her and put his arms around her. I love you too, honey, he said against her hair. I've been miserable over how we left each other this morning. Don't ever leave me without saying goodbye. She knew then that it was all right. She had made it back in time. Impact plus two and four-fifths. The screech of tires, the dull crump of impacting cars had died. The sound of breaking glass had stilled. The flames fanned out, making a hissing roar in the summer air. Karen rolled her head weakly on the torn headrest. Crazy, distorted images danced and yelled outside in the watercolor wash of fire. She couldn't hear what the figures were saying. It didn't matter. I'm dying she said, mumbling through the swollen tissue that had been her mouth. Yes, said a voice in her head. You are. It doesn't hurt. Not now, not any more. What's it like? Death. Will I know? Time will just stop. Will be as if a switch were clicked off somewhere. That's good, she muttered numbly. Her thoughts returned to Jean. She no longer felt the urgency she had. That portion of her life seemed neatly packaged and put away, completed. She was at peace over the way they had parted. They said I couldn't make it, but I did. Thank God I got back in time. Click. Introduction to the Slow and Gentle Progress of Trainee Bell Ringers this is the only time travel story in Cassandra Rising, and it presents a fresh slant on that traditional science fiction theme. Barbara Paul, who describes herself as the movie critic for Pittsburgher magazine, who also moonlights 40 hours a week as a technical writer for Fisher Scientific Company, is, as the title of this story suggests, a fan of English puzzles. Speaking of the title, I wish there were a nebula category for best title. The Slow and Gentle Progress of Trainee Bell Ringers by Barbara Paul. Stand over there, please, the mechanical voice said. Angie stood over there. Click, whir, hum, click, and the automated multiphasic medical exam had begun. The process took an hour, and Angie, like everyone else, found it a nuisance. But every experience day began with a thorough physical checkup. The first time Angie had undergone the exam, she had been upset by it, all those machines, grasping, strapping, poking her, and doing a few more impolite things as well. It was a little hard for a ten-year-old to understand, but now she was used to it. Everyone in time experience training was. The first time experience, when she was ten, had been very brief, designed mostly to help her get used to the idea of traveling back in time and inhabiting someone else's body. 
One of the things she had been taught was that men used to dream of traveling back in time in their own bodies. How silly that was! Angie had sniffed. Everyone knew that past time was unalterable. The only way one could go into the past was as a guest in the body of someone who had actually lived at that time. And then all one could do ever was observe. The present might control the future, but never the past. Temperature, electronically recorded, drink the glucose, stand here for the X-ray, now height and weight. Angie's education had begun in earnest when she was eleven. She had visited many places, in many times, like every other student. She had been a carrier for that insufferable John Speak when he discovered Lake Victoria in 1858. She had stitched skins together to make a sort of clothing for the inhabitants of the Danish kitchen midden in 5000 B.C., in 230 B.C. she had been one of the agents that Soka had sent from India to carry the doctrines of Buddha to Ceylon. As part of her training in how to handle disappointment and frustration, she had been postjected into the body of a campaign worker for Thomas E. Dewey. She had even learned about sex by visiting a young bride of two hundred years ago on her wedding night. Blood pressure, okay. Vision, okay. Urine, okay. Angie had worked like the devil to be admitted to graduate school. Graduate students were postjected into the bodies of the great figures of the past, the shapers of history. They could observe firsthand how those influential minds worked. As a graduate student, Angie could be John Speak instead of just one of his carriers. She could get inside him and find out what made him tick. Or she could be Lord Nelson, or Eleanor of Aquitaine, or even Buddha himself. Spirometry test concluded. Lung capacity unchanged. Now into the tonometry room, please. I know, I know. The day following the monthly experience day was always put aside for R&R, &R, recover and report. Angie would talk about her experience while her psychiatrist probed gently to find if there were any hidden side effects. The psychiatrist kept careful watch for any signs of a strong longing to live in the dead days of the past. Electrocardiography, and then we're finished. There was no stigma attached to wanting to stay in the past. For one thing, the number of students who ever indicated a wish to do so was proportionately small. Educators had learned early that most time-experienced students had no desire to stay in the various pasts into which they were postjected. Technology, medical care, and, yes, just plain creature comforts had made students unable to adjust easily to the rougher living conditions into which they were thrust. One would come back horrified by the black, rotting teeth he had seen in the mouth of Elizabeth I. Another would return retching from a week spent in the court of Louis the Fourteenth, where the combination of oversweet perfume and the stench of unwashed bodies had proved overpowering. Not only dentistry and modern plumbing had gained new respect as a result of the students' time experiences, but also life itself once again came to be regarded as sacred— especially after a student had been postjected into Anglo-Saxon times, where a man could hope to live a total of just thirty years, if he were lucky. But there were always a few, a very few, but still a few, who returned from their time experiences crying out to be sent back. These the educators and psychiatrists kept an eye on until they could determine into which of two groups the reluctant returnees fell— because they all did divide into two types. The first was the romantic escapist, the dreamer, the kind of wide-eyed innocent that tended to idealize everything that wasn't directly under his nose. This type of student the educators merely passed over, allowing him to mature at his own rate of speed. The other type, however, was a different matter altogether. Once, in a very rare while, a student would want to return for entirely different reasons. Once, in a very rare while— there would be a student who saw something in that past life that captured his curiosity, fired his imagination, puzzled him, something that needed to be understood more fully. For that something, this type of student, would dare the risks of disease, primitive warfare, and other dangers the host bodies were not equipped to handle. This type of student was watched very carefully by the educators, for here was the stuff of courage, of intellectual curiosity, of inspiration. It was from this group that the world's decision-makers came. Some bell would ring, and the world would know a little more about itself. Examination finally concluded. Angie hurried to the chronoporter room. The technician was studying her assignment chart and gave a low whistle of surprise. 
He looked a question at Angie, but she took her place in the chronoporter without speaking. The technician attached the leads to her head and adjusted the dials. Have a good trip, he said wryly. Angie smiled. The last thing she saw before she closed her eyes was the calendar clock in the wall. Eleven o'clock, May 17th. Angie glared angrily through the eyes of Elizabeth I and William Cecil who had just insisted upon a decision in an awkward question. Can't the man see we're not feeling well? Regal we, also Elizabeth and Angie. Very well, Cecil, the Queen said. We will support the Huguenots against the Duke of Guise. Order the troops to Havre, and I myself will undertake the writing of an explanation to Mary Stuart. Our loving cousin may indeed wonder at the presence of English forces on French soil. Cecil came as close to breathing a sigh of relief, as he ever did, and bowed his way out of the room. Angie felt a sharp pain shoot through Elizabeth's head at the same time, an unqueenly oath escaped her lips. How this woman hated war! It always, always cost too much, both in lives and money. Elizabeth Angie lifted a pale, thin hand to her forehead, still feverish. Perhaps a cool bath will help. No, poor lady, thought Angie, it won't help. Angie knew, as her host did not, that within a few days Queen Elizabeth would come down with smallpox. Angie had visited the Tudor monarch many times before, as had hundreds of others before her. Elizabeth I was one of the most often visited figures of the past, along with Johann Sebastian Bach, Albert Einstein, and Jesus Christ. There was very little left unknown about these people— but Angie had repeatedly been granted permission to visit Elizabeth. Her fascination with the period, coupled with her powers of observation, had produced new insights into that period of human life, so that Angie, in her last year of graduate work, had been granted the advanced status of repeat times experienced traveler. Angie had discovered one period of Elizabeth's life that had never been visited, the last three months of 1562. In spite of the fact that it was recorded history that the Queen had recovered and gone on to rule an additional forty years, no one had yet been willing to suffer smallpox with her. Angie had left at the chance. It would mean a great deal of physical discomfort, but no real danger, either to herself or to Elizabeth. And when she returned, Angie would submit the only first-person report ever to be made on this crisis in England's history. Elizabeth finally admitted she was ill and took to her bed. After her own physicians had fussed over her for several days, bleeding her and weakening her, in a fit of fevered temper Elizabeth dismissed them all and called for her waiting woman. That German physician, the one who cured Lord Hunston, get him. So Dr. Burkhart was summoned, a gruff, no-nonsense man, who was a brilliant diagnostician in a time when medicine was just emerging from medieval darkness. He strolled into the Queen's bedchamber, took one look at Elizabeth, and announced— "'My liege, thou shalt have this pox.' And she could feel the shock that ran through Elizabeth's feverish body. "'What a man is a charlatan! "'There are no spots anywhere on her body!' The Queen summoned her waning strength to shout, "'Have the knave away and out of my sight!' "'Oh, dear,' thought Angie, "'she really did say that.' The next five days were the most miserable Angie had ever experienced. Her illness-free life had provided no preparation for the excruciating suffering that this long-since vanquished disease could cause. Elizabeth and Angie floated in and out of consciousness. During their lucid moments, Angie was aware that the council was holding worried meetings, trying to decide which claimant to the throne to support. For it was clear the Queen was going to die without having named a successor. In one stupor-ridden moment, Elizabeth Angie asked Cecil and the other members of the council to appoint Robert Dudley protector of the realm after her death. They agreed. Anxious to soothe their dying monarch, they would have promised her anything. Angie knew at that moment Dr. Burkhart was being brought back to Elizabeth's sick room forcibly. The irascible doctor had been highly incensed at being called knave and had flatly refused to come. But a quick-thinking servant had persuaded him to come, by threatening to kill him if he didn't. "'Oh, hurry!' Angie pleaded mentally. "'Please, hurry!' She probed around for Elizabeth's thought, but couldn't find any. "'She must be unconscious,' thought Angie. "'No, that couldn't be. If Elizabeth the host were unconscious, then Angie the guest would be unconscious, too. And Angie was conscious. 
Something was wrong. Angie cautiously probed again for signs of awareness, and then more desperately. She found nothing. Keep calm, she told herself. There's some kind of explanation. Don't panic. She allowed herself a moment to calm down, and then once again she searched for Elizabeth. Elizabeth wasn't there. One thing that had been discovered in the early days of time travel was that the guest had absolutely no control over the host body. No matter how exhausted the host body might be, for example, the guest could not rest until the host did. The guest had no power to influence thought, behavior, or even simple body movement. Angie looked at the thin hand lying on the coverlet. I will raise her hand, she thought. Slowly, because the body was weak, Elizabeth's hand raised itself. Angie stared at the trembling hand and then allowed it to drop back. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. After a long moment, Angie licked her, Elizabeth's lips, and whispered, Cat Ashley. Immediately her serving woman was at her side. Angie looked at the grief-stricken woman, and taking a deep breath, used Elizabeth's voice to ask, Who am I, Cat? Cat Ashley burst into tears and fell to her knees at the side of the bed. Angie concentrated on fighting off a wave of dizziness. There was no way to avoid admitting the obvious. Elizabeth Tudor had died. Dr. Burcott came bursting into the room, furious and raging, but one look at his patient and his entire manner changed. His anger vanished, and he began issuing orders quickly and efficiently. Angie Elizabeth felt herself being lifted from her bed, wrapped in red flannel, and placed on a mattress in front of the fire. Dr. Burcott held a bottle to her mouth and urged her to drink as much as she could. Angie didn't know how many hours had passed before she saw she had pulled one hand free from her flannel wrapping. She didn't know how long she had been staring at the hand before she realized it was covered with red spots. She cried out at the sight. I don't want to be marked. I don't want to be scarred for the rest of my life. God's pestilence, exploded Dr. Burcott. Which is better, to have the pox in the hands, in the face, or in the heart, and kill the whole body? He's right, thought Angie, just as she lost consciousness. In less than two weeks, Angie Elizabeth was out of bed. The marks on her face weren't completely healed yet, but Angie knew it was only a matter of time. Dr. Burkhart springing out of the skin eruptions had saved her life. Her life. Dr. Burkhart must be rewarded, and generously so. A grant of land, of course, good land, which will yield him a rich return. But I should like to offer a personal token, too, thought Angie, something more than just payment for services rendered. I'd give him one of the pairs of golden spurs that belonged to my father. Good Lord, she was beginning to think like Elizabeth. Angie was frightened, terribly frightened, for she was completely alone in Elizabeth's resurrected body. That brilliant mind that had ruled the English people during its most glorious period was gone. Elizabeth was dead, and in her body was one very frightened graduate student, who was very much out of her time. The time was 8.30. Well, said the technician as he began disconnected from the chronoporter leaves, what's it like to have smallpox? Angie didn't answer right away. "'You wouldn't believe me if I told you,' she finally said. The technician saw she was disturbed and didn't ask any more questions. For that she was grateful. All she wanted now was to get home, take a tranquilizer, and fall asleep, with the hope, perchance, not to dream. Dr. Giannoni, Angie's psychiatrist, had been staring intently at a spot over her head for two minutes. "'You don't believe a word I've said,' she complained. Dr. Giannoni came out of his brown study and focused on his patient. On the contrary, he said, I believe every word of it. You do? Angie made no attempt to hide her surprise. Yes, said the psychiatrist. I believe you because this has happened before. Angie was stunned. Three times before, in fact, Dr. Giannoni went on. Visitors to Daniel Defoe, Abraham Lincoln, and Julius Caesar have reported the death of their hosts long before history says they died. In all three cases, the visitors claimed that they continued to occupy the bodies after death. They did more than occupy them, they controlled them, just as you controlled Elizabeth. Angie finally found her tongue. Look, this doesn't make sense. If Elizabeth really died in 1562, why do we have tons of primary sources that document her career until her death in 1603? Surely there couldn't have been a conspiracy to fake evidence to make the world think she was still alive after she died? 
There were too many people who saw her every day, ambassadors, spies, enemies, as well as friends. No, I don't think that's what happened, Dr. Genoni said slowly. Well, then what? Angie, what did you do when you realized Elizabeth was dead? I panicked. After that. Well, I, I didn't really do anything. Angie stood up and began to move restlessly about the room. I was feeling pretty rotten, you know, and kept to my rooms most of the time. No one bothered me about state matters, fortunately. Elizabeth did confine herself to her rooms until her skin was clear again. At least that's what history has told us she did. And that's exactly what you did, said Dr. Genoni. You kept her alive, and you acted out the next two weeks of her life for her. Aside from being frightened, which is natural enough... How did you feel? In complete control? Yes. Well, perhaps not in complete control. Angie stopped her pacing. Dr. Genoni, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I was beginning to think like Elizabeth. I had this terrible fear that if I wasn't brought back to the present soon, I'd lose my own personality. That the Elizabeth personality would reassert itself even though the Elizabeth body had died. And that's impossible. Perhaps not, said the psychiatrist. We really know very little about this yet. We? The directors of the Time Experience Program and the Psychiatric Advisory Panel, of which I am a member. We studied the other three experiences quite carefully, as you can imagine. They came upon us rather suddenly. All three occurred within the last six months. Why is that? Is there something wrong with the program? A malfunction in the chronoporters? No, no, nothing like that. Everything is functioning normally. What's happened is that the time experience program has been in operation long enough that all the safe times in the past have been thoroughly covered. So thoroughly covered, in fact, that visitors are now looking for new areas to explore, as you did. Former time travelers saw no reason to visit Elizabeth while she had smallpox, when there were more glorious moments of her life available. Yes, I can see that. But I kept Elizabeth alive only two weeks. She lived another forty years. How could she keep going for that long, when I stayed only two weeks? There would have to be people visiting her constantly for forty years if— Angie's voice trailed off. She stared at Dr. Genoni. Is that what happened? That it was visitors from the future who kept Elizabeth alive and reigning for forty years? After she actually died? Oh, I can't believe that. That's incredible. It is hard to believe, agreed Dr. Genoni, but I think that's exactly what has happened. Angie was thinking. No, wait a minute. I'm the first one to visit Elizabeth when she had smallpox. How could all of her later life have taken place before I kept her alive? Perhaps you're only the first one to visit her so far, suggested Dr. Genoni. What do you mean? Well, what about visitors from our future, people who haven't even been born yet, in our sense of time? Couldn't Elizabeth's life already have been preserved? by someone traveling back from a thousand years in our future? Angie took a moment to absorb this. Does this mean what I think it means? That all our past has been arranged, or at least controlled, by the people living in the future? That everything has happened the way it has happened because future time travelers have decided it should happen that way? If that's the way it works, yes. And not only the past, but our present time as well, Angie, said Dr. Genoni gently. Couldn't someone from the future be visiting you right now? It was getting to be too much for Angie. She walked over to a mirror, looked at her reflection, and said, Go home, you snoop. I don't want you here. Dr. Genoni laughed dryly. I guess we're all snoops in a way, and I rather imagine we have some more snooping to do. Take Van Gogh, for instance. His eyes traveled to the reproduction starry night on his wall. It was nothing short of miraculous that Van Gogh didn't bleed to death when he cut off his earlobe. He was suffering from malnutrition at the time. Lately I've been wondering if he didn't really die then. Angie stared at the swirls in Van Gogh's sky and murmured, But why, Dr. Genoni? Why does it happen like this? Well, there's kind of logic behind it. Elizabeth had to be kept alive to lead the most civilized nation in Europe into becoming the most powerful nation in Europe. Defoe was needed to invent the novel. Only a Lincoln could have freed the slaves, and Julius Caesar hadn't even heard of the Rubicon when he died. But what about Mozart and Keats? Why were they allowed to die young? I don't know, unless no one has ever been willing to experience their particular deaths. 
Angie walked over and settled herself determinedly in the chair, facing Dr. Genoni. Something must be done. The psychiatrist looked amused. I had a feeling we were coming to this. Surely it must have occurred to you and the rest of the advisory panel that someone right now might be able to go back and keep Mozart alive. It has occurred to us. Yet no one has tried? No one has tried. Why not? A certain paucity of volunteers, you might say. I'm volunteering. Well, no need to shout, Angie. I got the message some time ago. Let me visit Mozart's death. You can arrange it. Do you fully understand what you're suggesting? Even the vicarious experience of death. I've done it before. It didn't kill me. Please. Angie, I can't make a decision like this on my own. I'd have to consult with the other members of the advisory panel. Consult, she pleaded. He looked at her for a moment and then made up his mind. How's your German? he asked as he reached toward the telecommunicator. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart dipped his quill into the ink pot and then hesitated. The sound of footsteps on the stairs had reached his ears. An image of a tall, thin, grave-looking man, dressed entirely in grey, flashed through his mind. Then came the remembered three slow knocks on the door. Herein, said the composer uneasily. The door opened and the grey man walked in. Bowing slightly from the waist, he said, I have been sent to inquire as to the progress of the requiem. Mozart stood up uncertainly. The quill he gripped tightly betrayed the trembling of his hand. I... I am working on it now. But when may I see it will be finished? Mozart fought off the beginnings of one of the fainting spells that had appeared to plague him lately. I... it will take me slightly longer than I had originally anticipated. The grey man frowned. May I remind you, Herr Kappelmeister, that you accepted the commission for the requiem, and the fee, a month ago. My employer was willing to trust that you would finish the work within a reasonable length of time. And I shall make every effort to do so, Mozart noticed a quaver in his voice and cleared his throat. My opera, the Zauberflöte, is being produced at the Theater auf der Wieden, and I have been asked to conduct the opening performance. After that I will be free to give my entire attention to the Requiem. The gray man mused silently a moment. I believe my employer will find that satisfactory. He turned to leave, but in the doorway stopped, and I must caution you again concerning the other condition of our agreement. You are to make no attempt to determine the identity of the gentleman who has commissioned this work. Mozart nodded assent, and the grey man left. I already know who he is, Mozart said quietly to the closed door. He is death, and you are the messenger of death. He is not, shouted Angie silently, futilely. Mozart stood motionless a moment, and then vomited violently and fell insensible to the floor. Weeks later the composer lay in his sickbed, chatting with a group of musicians who gathered daily to comfort the shrunken figure of their friend. Years of overwork and undernourishment were taking their toll. The bones in his face protruded against the waxy skin, and the feverish excitement of his talk was partly an attempt to keep submerged the picture of the grey man that was now with him day and night. Sometimes Mozart would attempt to lay the ghost by singing. De Vogelfanger bin ich ja, he would gasp. After a slow start, die Zauberflutter had begun to catch on. The fickle Viennese audience was taken with the novelty of the work, but the sick man was unable to enjoy his success. He was driven by one idea. He must finish the requiem, his requiem. In a quiet moment, Mozart communicated his fears to his wife. Constanza already knew about the mysterious stranger who had appeared silently out of nowhere to commission a mass for the dead. But she was in no way prepared for the interpretation her husband had put on this. She watched him staring intently at nothing, and asked what he was thinking. I am thinking of death, he answered. Now I am always thinking of death. So I must finish my requiem, you see. I am writing it for myself. Constanza was horrified. Please don't say such dreadful things. They are not dreadful things, my dear. They are beautiful. Death itself is very beautiful. Is it not the true goal of life? Angie ached for the man. Terrible as his physical pain was, it was less than the mental anguish he was enduring. Angie was alarmed to discover there was an infectious quality about Mozart's obsession with the grey man. 
Even though she knew who he really was, she had to fight hard against being engulfed by the morbid dimension the stranger had assumed in the composer's mind. In reality, the grey man was no more than a flunky. His name was Leitgeb, and he was the estate steward for Count Franz von Vorsig, an amateur cellist who wanted to be known as a composer. Von Vorsig had a rather nasty habit of keeping his eye on impoverished composers and anonymously commissioning works by them. These works would then be performed as having been written by von Volzig himself. Mozart's Requiem, in fact, was to have its first public performance as von Volzig's composition, a fact that Mozart, perhaps fortunately, was never to know. For it was becoming increasingly clear to the composer that he would not live to finish the work. His hands and feet were swollen, his head was pounding, and his kidneys caused him constant pain. Angie screamed and screamed and screamed, and in between her unheard screams, she marveled at the dying man's uncomplaining acceptance of what was happening to him. The bed was covered with sheet music. Mozart's pupil, Franz Xaver Sussmeyer, sat listening to his master's instructions as to how the requiem was to be finished. Mozart had completed the first two parts and had sketched out most of the rest. Much technical work still needed to be done. Use the fugue from the first movement as recapitulation and climax and ending, Mozart whispered. Then he rolled over to face the wall. This was it. Angie probed for signs of awareness, for any sign of life. As she expected, she found none. She was in total darkness. Unlike Elizabeth, Mozart had died with his eyes closed, so the first thing to do was open them. She concentrated intensely on the simple act of lifting two eyelids. Nothing. Again, she tried. Nothing. And again, nothing. And then she became aware of the total absence of pain. No fever, no burning in the kidneys, not even a headache. In fact, no feeling of any kind. She counted to a hundred and then tried to move. An arm, a leg, a shoulder. Still nothing. Still no feeling. Surely Sussmar and Constanza were aware by now that Mozart had died. Surely by now they had straightened the body on the bed, perhaps crossed the hands on the chest. But Angie had felt no pressure of hands, no movement. She felt nothing but the leaden weight of darkness and confinement. This emaciated body she occupied was beyond reclamation. Without tear ducts and without eyes, Angie began to cry. The technician glanced nervously at the multiple chronometer panel controlling the chronoporter. It's a quarter past one their time, he said to Dr. Genoni. He's been dead twenty minutes. Dr. Genoni said nothing. The technician looked at Angie's body in stasis on the chronoporter. He didn't like this. There was something unnatural about experiencing another person's death. Perhaps we should bring her back now, he suggested. No, said Dr. Genoni. I promised her she could have an hour to try to revive him. We'll wait. So they waited. At last the chronometer indicated five minutes until two. The preset chronoporter controls did their job, and the girl's chest began to move in the effort of respiration. Angie? said Dr. Genoni. No answer. He lifted her eyelid. Get the oxygen tank, he said quickly as he prepared an injection of adrenaline. She's in shock. Do you feel up to talking now? Certainly. Angie smiled. Fit as a fiddle. Whatever that means. Dr. Genoni pressed a button on the control panel, and the head of Angie's hospital bed raised her to a sitting position. It didn't work, she said simply. It was entirely different from the last time. Once he had died, I had no control over his body whatsoever. I couldn't move, I couldn't see, I couldn't feel. I simply lay there, trapped, until I was brought back. And I think I know why. She hesitated. Well, for heaven's sake, Angie, I know, I know, I'm just trying to think how to put it. So you won't dismiss my reason as romantic foolishness. Dr. Genoni waited. Mozart wanted to die, she said finally. Whether the fever had made him irrational, or this obsession with Leitgeb as a death figure weakened his resistance, I don't know, but the will to death was there, all the time, every waking moment, and in his night dreams as well, which might indicate the death wish had penetrated his unconscious, or sprang from it, more likely. Perhaps. I rather think not. His music is too life-affirming. It was an acquired obsession. The grey man turned out to be a convenient symbol to a man so exhausted that death had become a form of beauty to him. And Elizabeth? Elizabeth was fighting every inch of the way. To her, death was ugly and unthinkable. She wasn't ready to die. Mozart was. There was a long silence. 
Finally, Dr. Genoni spoke. Angie, do you realize what you're saying? That the reason some figures can be, have been, kept alive is that they possess some will to life. Why, that's the stuff of poetry, Angie suggested. I know. I told you it would sound like romantic foolishness. Dr. Genoni pulled a chair up to the side of her bed. It's been known for centuries, of course, he said, that a strong will to live often means a difference between success and failure in the medical treatment of critical cases. But I wonder if a medical analogy is really valid. Time visiting isn't treatment. But it obviously can be life-sustaining. Elizabeth, Defoe, Lincoln, Caesar. The fact that it failed for Mozart doesn't erase the success of the other cases. Granted. And Elizabeth did die, Doctor. I know. I have died twice. Have you thought what that must be like? Yes, he answered shortly. Angie felt a quick stab of guilt. Of course he had thought about it. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that it was worth it, she said with a cheerfulness that wasn't entirely forced. It seems to me the next step is a systematic investigation of all those close calls we know about. Van Gogh would probably be a good place to start. Dr. Genoni laughed, and I wonder who thinks she's going to volunteer for that. No, he said quickly as Angie started to protest. Habitual dying could become a rather morbid habit, don't you think? All sorts of impulses destructive to the psyche could develop that we just don't know about yet. We have to tread carefully now. No more death visits for you, Angie. Not for a while, at least. Hmm, said Angie. On the other hand, he mused, this might turn out to be a good way to prepare us for our own deaths. It's a possibility. Anyway, he said briskly as he stood up, somebody else will have to visit Van Gogh. He paused for a moment. I might even go myself. You wouldn't, Angie exclaimed. Oh, wouldn't I? He winked and left. Angie grinned. Of course he would. Introduction to Nightfire Sidney Joyce Van Skyhock began writing and not selling fiction in the late fifties, and continued not selling until she began writing science fiction. Her first published story appeared in Galaxy in 1962, and was followed by other stories and four novels, including Star Mother, 1976, and Cloud Cry, 1977. She lives in Hayward, California, with her husband, son, and daughter. Seventy-two houseplants and animals too numerous to mention. Nightfire by Sidney J. Van Skyock When Cornel Rothler had walked the pod-checking duty units and wreck areas, it was 8.20 p.m. By mid-morning tomorrow the transport would arrive to fly her to neutral for the fleet commander conference. And Zim's medic shuttle was five days overdue. She frowned. A tall woman with silvering hair and light eyes. Fleet Central's comm staff could only tell her that the medic shuttle would reach Pod Nestor when it could, and that Pod Commander Rother could speak directly with Fleet Commander Hazlitt if she wished. Pod Commander Rother did not wish. There was no medical emergency aboard Pod Nestor, and Corneal had never in the past demonstrated undue concern about minor med schedule deviation. But if the shuttle did not arrive before midnight, only two courses lay open. Fabricate an emergency— or abandon her plan. Cornel stepped into the forward observatory to consider her alternatives. Her son, Heron, stood at the view window. Fourteen, Heron hovered on the verge of the growth spurt that would soon bring manhood to features and frame. In November, his fifteenth birthday would bestow legal manhood. The last three feet of floor were transparent in extension of the ovoid window. Cornel stepped across the darkness of night to stand beside her son. Tonight cloud cover was scattered. Night fire, the flash of weaponry, the glow of death, was visible sixty thousand feet below. On clear nights, the siege of Pittsburgh, in its nineteenth month, provided a show of strange beauty for the occupants of Podnester. It was a show few of them bothered to attend. Frowning, Cornel raised her head and scanned the starfield until she caught the glint of earth hold. Originally an orbiting observatory and research station, the big satellite plodded wearily across the sky, now bearing the displaced, the demoralized, and the maimed from the War of the Americas. But the gleam of its shell was still silver bright. Shunted aboard a hastily constructed hover pod in the early years of the war, Cornel had often stood at this window as a child, 
as an adolescent, and yearned for the higher existence aboard one of the five satellites. Now she accepted her lower station, not because of the crushing population load the orbiting vessels carried. Conditions were almost as crowded aboard Pod Nestor. Not because of the violent disorders that exploded in high orbit. Pod Nestor, too, was periodically convulsed, though on a lesser scale. Her reconciliation stemmed instead from an appreciation of the strategic advantage of operating from a bare sixty thousand feet. It was an advantage that would be lost if Zims didn't arrive soon. Troubled, she became aware of her son's gaze. My father is down there. Startled, she glanced down. He is? He nodded. I queried war authority. He's field commander of the 4th Unipatrist Regiment now. It joined the siege force seven months ago. So Tanner Helm, Unipatrist Infantry, participated in the light show below. Corneille had never met him, although she had studied his lineage carefully before acceding to his selection as father of her child. I have his picture now. I requested it from War Authority last week. I see, she said slowly. Evidently the age of silent disinterest was past. Well, do you find much resemblance? The boy's eyes flickered away. Between us? How can I tell? It's just a picture. Then his gaze was back, challenging. We made a pact last week, all of us. When we reach age, we're going to go down together and join my father's regiment. She looked at him sharply. Your friends haven't been talking partisan in public sections. It was a private discussion in Taggart's bunk room. And you can't object to me in enlisting. You served two years with the Ninth Division when you were young. You fought in I know where I fought. I recommend infantry service to anyone who likes to see other humans die. That's what's happening down there. I know what's happening, he said angrily, and it's going to go on happening until someone wins. Well, now the Patrists have the edge in the Appalachians and the Rockies. Now the Nationalists hold both sea coasts and large blocks of the South. But the Patrists have the Midwest, most of it. The Patrists, she shook her head, no one is going to win the war, Heron. The balance of power shifts, but never far enough. I've had most of my lifetime to observe that. Neither force has ever held clear-cut dominance. And no one will ever unless people fight. If everyone who has Patra's sympathies went down there at the same time, even the Abs and the Sykes, everyone, if there was a giant airdrop from the pods, her eyes froze him. You're speaking in a public section, Heron. His mouth snapped shut, his eyes darkened. It would work. I think you'd better report to your bunk. His eyes flared. And that's another reason we're all going down. There's no freedom aboard this vessel. There isn't, she agreed evenly. Not when it comes to expressing political sympathies. That's why there are no longer major disturbances aboard this vessel, either. It had never proven feasible to segregate lofties according to political sympathies. Their daily intermingling, however, necessitated certain limitations upon the basic freedoms. His eyes locked hers. Then he was gone. Before she turned back to the window, the podcom spoke. Commander Rothler, a disturbance in Film 3. I'm on it. Film Lounge 3 was stale with massed bodies. Halfway down Section C, a pair of amputees were squared off, bellowing like crippled bulls. Cornille pushed through the clogged aisle. Tomas, finit! Heads swung. Tomas was a heavy torso mounted on the Nationalist Army issue wheeled platform. A single, half useless arm hung from his right shoulder. Finnet was a Unipatrist veteran. He retained a single intact leg as well as most of an arm. Report to Bunks immediately. Tomas did not accept the curt dismissal. That paddy report. Cornille found a reliable face in the audience. Marlene, give Tom a push to quarters. We're both confined for twenty-four hours. Food allowance halved for that period. All film privileges revoked for two weeks. Revolt burned bright in two sets of eyes. Cornille met it. Marlene, she repeated. Muttering, Tomas was wheeled away. Finnet hobbled after, anger strangled in his throat. Film three became still. Cornille studied the audience that lounged in the ruined seats. The faces of her people were dull tonight, their eyes shadowed. 
On the screen, a pre-1980 drama crept to its dubious climax. In the corridor, her brief depression was banished. Commander, the medic shuttle is entering pattern. She hurried to the embarkation lock. But when the silver shuttle had docked, it was not stocky Hal Zimmerman who stepped through the locked door. It was a youth, face gray, eyes nervous, anticipating challenge. Dr. Costell reporting. Challenge he got. Where is Dr. Zimmerman? He... he won't be around any more, Commander. Corneille's face froze. Panic touched her. But there was no way Fleet Command could have guessed Zims was slated to aid Corneille in a very special way this trip. Zims himself had not known. What happened? I guess you could call it apoplexy. It happened on Pod Aeolus. Last Friday. He's been listed? The youth's eyes fell. Not yet, but I think we'll have to. He's... gone. Goodbye, another old friend, she said silently. Now she would have to extract by artifice from this youth what Zims would have given her on trust. What are your own medical qualifications, Costel? Well, I've been apprenticing under Dr. Mendez. I... Dr. Mendez was licensed under the apprentice system himself. How many years' apprenticeship have you served? Almost one. One full year. She frowned. It was my understanding that an apprentice could not be released for solo rounds with less than two years' service, Costel. Costel pushed a hank of tired hair from his forehead. His hand quivered. Well, that's what I thought, too, but, well, you, you probably heard about the new medical guidelines by now. I've heard nothing. You haven't? The hand quivered more noticeably. Well, uh, they just came out. I haven't seen them in print, but, uh, I suppose we'll be briefed at the Fleet Command Conference. Cornel interrupted, not graciously. He nodded. Yes, they probably plan to, uh, to, well, anyway. Here I am. She smiled bleakly. So you are. And I have people who have been waiting four weeks for attention. I'll call a clinic immediately. While we're waiting, you may examine the bed patients. While the youth made bed rounds, Cornille formulated her new plan. She knew he would find no list prospects on the ward tonight, but she had a handful of defective children to draw from. Bring me the file on Tilla Franks, Cornille instructed the duty nurse. She had the file lying before her when Costell returned to the desk. Any new problems? No, everyone seems pretty well stabilized. Good. However, I do have a child I want listed this trip. His expression was startled. A defective, she amplified. Chronological age, four years, three months. Mental age, about two-thirds that. Dr. Zimmerman was acquainted with the case. She touched the Frank's file, but did not offer it. There's a physical problem, too? Costell wondered uncertainly. No, the child is quite robust physically, but there are behavior problems, tantrums, outbursts. The mother is one of my most valuable food techs. I can't have her productivity eroded any further by the off-duty situation. But all these pods have special care sections. Filled to capacity. Costell fidgeted, shoved at his hair. But a child! Occasionally it's necessary, doctor. His hand shook, then clenched into a fist. Have you... I haven't had an opportunity to prepare the mother yet. I doubt that I will be able to get to it until next week. The youth relaxed slightly. Oh, then it will have to wait until my next call. We have to counsel with the mother before we do anything. Of course. However, I thought it might be acceptable to sign the youth kit over to me now for safekeeping. I'll talk with the mother when I return from Fleet Command and then have someone here administer the injection. "'if you feel you can delegate that responsibility. "'Have you performed euthanasia yet, doctor?' "'I... never on a child. "'I'm sure it's not a task you relish. "'Since I've taken the initiative in the situation, "'I'll be glad to see that the task is carried out "'by a reliable member of the Pod Nestor med staff. "'Such an arrangement was strictly prescribed "'for a number of reasons.' Nevertheless, a quarter hour later, all applicable forms had been completed and filed, the death certificate signed, and Cornille had the youth kit in her desk. She was committed. She worked until after midnight at her desk, then she stopped by the bridge. The night nav sprawled lax in his seat, the chore of holding position, an altitude delegated to auto-equip. Cornille's eyes flickered over the infra-monitor screens. Her forehead creased. What's happening below? Oyama jerked upright, startled. Huh? 
Has the war been called? Oh, uh, no, uh, Pod Galatea, low over the Cleveland area. Pressure trouble. They're holding fire in pit, just in case. Cornel smiled grimly, studying the screens. Touching. Huh? A pod lowers to deal with an emergency, and both armies call fire to a radius of hundreds of miles. Any man who shoots so much as a heat dart will be summarily executed. Then the emergency is dealt with, and it's back to sixty thousand for the non-combatants. No one can take a chance on injuring non-combatants, Oyama said indignantly. She shook her head. You don't call it injurious to confine growing children to a hover pod? To let their fathers and brothers and sisters go below to kill each other at will? Oyama wasn't prepared for debate. "'No one wants to hurt non-combatants,' he reiterated. He turned to his panel, earnestly checking screens and dials. "'Holding,' he announced, hopefully. "'Holding,' Cornel murmured, leaving him. "'Holding. Forty-one years holding over the confluence of the Allegheny and the Monongahela. Forty-one years of stale air and pressing bodies. Forty-one years of deadly communal ennui, punctuated by brief flares of violence.' Forty-one years, most of Cornel's lifetime. She found herself in the observatory at the big ovoid window. The most civilized war in the history of mankind, they call the War of the Americas. When the continent exploded, Europe, Asia, and Africa were called upon immediately to absorb millions of refugees. When their own turbulent internal climates, or their simple unwillingness, precluded the further admittance of non-combatants, the satellite stations were requisitioned and converted for use. Millions went aloft to orbit. Then the satellites were filled to capacity. With the country, indeed the entire hemisphere by that time, at war, it was not feasible to construct more satellites in orbit. That undertaking required the fully cooperative coordination of men and resources. Hover pods represented a hasty solution, a temporary solution. Both sides agreed to that. The war could not last long. A, because the Unipatrists would push to early victory and see the United States, Mexico, Canada, and the South and Central American republics merge their separate national identities into the projected all-sovereign pan-world union. B, because the nationalists would thrust to swift victory and see the United States, Mexico, Canada, and the South and Central American republics remain independent nations, separate and unequal. Over a period of five years, a fleet of seventy-six hoverpods was lofted over North America. Each vessel was equipped to accommodate 150,000 non-combatants. All remaining North American non-combatants were exiled to the states of Maine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, which combined were designated Neutral America. By agreement, neither army had ever brought nuclear weapons into use, and after 41 years, gains continued to balance losses. In the United States, the Nationalists held the steel centers of Pittsburgh and Birmingham, but the Unipatrists controlled Chicago, Gary, and Detroit. The Unipatrists held much of the broad area between the Rockies and the Appalachians, but the Nationalists held the coastal plains and most of the South. The pods and satellites, to a greater extent than neutral America, furnished both armies with a continuing source of fresh man and woman power. War seen from altitude provided a cause, a mystique, ultimately an escape. The battlefield became the only place for youth to test and prove itself, for the passions and powers of young adulthood to express themselves, even for vigorous young male to join healthy young female in casual alliance. After the confinement and regimentation pod board, the relative freedom of the battleground was compelling. Even multiple amputees schemed to get a ground again. War had become the American way of life. So had protection of the non-combatants. Although in the upper atmosphere and in orbit they breathed air that stank, ate scum, and drank their own recycled sewage, they were reverenced. While there was neither medicine nor food nor clothing to be lavished upon them, there was obeisance. The military would grant anything to the cherished family above, anything it possessed except peace. Cornel moved slowly down the corridors to her bunk room, Heron slept, rebellion smoothed from his features for a few hours. She stood at his side. Did he ever sense, she wondered, that he was more than a son? That he was a device for bringing her goal into ever sharper focus, for keeping the sense of urgency alive in herself? Fourteen and a half. Fifteen. A man, in November. She went to bed. It was her last night aboard Pod. 
she hoped. The transport arrived next morning at 9.50. She passed her luggage into the hold, her conference case she hand-carried. The passenger bay was dim. Cornille glanced briefly over the shadowed faces of his occupants. Half a dozen of them rose hastily to salute. She returned the formality with reserve. "'Are you ready, Commander Rothler?' the ship's calm inquired politely when she had strapped down. Cornille smiled wryly. Last year she had been one of the herd. This year, with the death of Fleet Commander Knudsen, with the suicide of Blancard of Pod Hector, and the assassination of Natchez aboard Pod Danae, Cornille found herself second in the chain of command of the quasi-military pod service. I assume you have already picked up all other officers scheduled for this flight? As you requested, Commander, all aboard. The first transport is already inbound, with the other complement of pod commanders. Good. Proceed. She was aware of the assessing gaze of her co-passengers. You've made the trip to neutral a number of times in the last six months, Commander. Chen, of Pod Diomedes, commented cautiously. I've been back and forth like a shuttlecock since Hazlitt took fleet command. I suppose you're versed on the new clothing cutbacks, then. I drew them up myself. Ah! The issue was tactfully dropped. Respect for rank ran high in Pod service. Larch, of Pod Typhon, was bolder than Chen. Did you have a hand in the medical cutbacks, too? No. I believe Hazlitt drew those himself with the help of neutral authority. I first heard about them last night. A safe subject broached, they buzzed their way toward neutral America. Cornille turned to watch the green mountains of eastern Pennsylvania, New York, unroll below. The earth bore her scars well. Many of them were healing. Many more were being inflicted every day. Their passage at low altitude granted large areas of Pennsylvania, New York, and all of Vermont and New Hampshire respite for the morning. But afternoon would come. Maine. Their transport swung low over miles of crumbling gray refugee warrens. A brief runway received them, and they stepped out into moist air that should have smelled of salt ocean. Instead, it smelled of human sewage. Fleet Commander Hazlitt met them, a nervous man, who had failed at soldiering. He still apologized for it with every motion. He came down the line, pumping hands, bobbing his head desperately. Then they drove into the morning mist in large green buses that rattled. Scheduled event, conference luncheon, menu, green salad, baked potato, boiled beets, fresh-caught ocean mackerel, vanilla ice cream, desert wafers, wine, price, indigestion for stomachs, long condition to standard fare of algae and recycled water. Scheduled event, annual status report, presented by Fleet Commander August Hazlitt, Pod Commander Corneal Rothler, Orbital Representative Cordova, Officers of Neutral Authority. Content, depressing. Major personnel losses. Three pod commanders, natural causes. Two pod commanders, suicide. One pod commander, assassination. One pod commander, accident. Two pod commanders, resignation. One pre-war surgeon, natural causes. Two pre-war physicians, natural causes. One pre-war physician, suicide. One pre-war psychologist, mental collapse, etc. Minor personnel losses, numerous. Breakdown, 32% natural causes, 22% resigned to join fighting forces, 15% mental collapse, 12% accident, 11% suicide, 7% violence, 1% undeterminable. Areas of major cutbacks, issue clothing, three major classes of drugs, issue vitamin supplements, sanitary chemicals and supplies, new categories of patients to be listed for youth dispatch, discussion postponed for session concerning new medical guidelines, Scheduled event, open workshop on pod board violence, prevention and control. Unscheduled event, informal after-hours gathering, featuring several large containers of informal liquor. Object, forgetfulness. On the second day of the conference, Abzig, of Pod Dictis, was found in a lane in the refugee warrens. He had been clubbed. On the third day, Cornille presented a peace initiative she wished endorsed by the conference and forwarded to the commanding officers of both armies. The initiative was discussed at length, then rejected. The assembled pod commanders did not believe it would be productive to present demands, or requests, or even pointed suggestions. Pod Commander Rothler accepted the rejection without comment, as she had in previous years. The final day of the conference arrived, the final night. 
Neutral authority officers and personnel joined the pod commanders in a social event that featured large crocks of raw alcohol and stomach-wrenching pre-war delicacies. Cornel walked the railed exterior corridors of Fleet Command Central alone. The stars were veiled in damp clouds, and the ocean lay beyond the dank curtain of darkness. But tonight, standing with her hands on the rail, making herself totally still, she caught the scent of salt. It was midnight when she returned to the party, and approached Fleet Commander Hazlitt. "'There is one matter we still need to discuss. I'll have to stop by your quarters before I leave tomorrow.' Fleet Commander Hazlitt was glazed with fatigue and alcohol. Tomorrow? Yes, before eight. Hazlitt nodded dimly. Quarters, he affirmed. The next morning Cornel spoke to the transport section early. If I'm delayed for the flight, hold both transports until I arrive. As I explained some days ago, I will be the first passenger delivered by the first transport. Understood, Commander. Transport was accustomed to imperious rancors. Hazlitt's quarters were adjacent to Fleet Central. He opened his door, half asleep. Rother, blearily. Yes, a problem we must discuss before my transport leaves. I spoke to you last night. Ah, Hazlitt groped, licked his lips, admitted her. Yes, of course. Briskly, Cornel set her conference case on a small table and opened it. Hazlitt was too groggy to recognize the youth kit until it was already in use. Then it was too late. Cornel reached the hangar with minutes to spare. The transport had already taxied when she went forward to the pilot's cabin. Officer, there are papers I intended to leave with Fleet Commander. I find they're still in my case. I want them delivered directly to him immediately. An aide was dispatched to the runway. He accepted the papers and sped away. The transport became airborne. Ten minutes later, the comset spoke. Commander Rother, report forward to pilot's cabin, please. Cornel frowned, looking up from the papers in her lap. "'The air is rather turbulent at this point, officer. "'I'm taking her up. Fleet Central wants you on emergency.' A brief interval later, Fleet Commander Cornel Rother emerged from the cabin. Gravely she waited until three dozen shadowy faces rose to meet hers. "'Gentlemen, I have a tragic announcement. "'August Hazlitt died in quarters this morning of apparent heart failure.' Her three dozen juniors stared at her in stunned silence. As acting fleet commander, it is necessary for me to return to Fleet Central immediately. First, however, I must proceed to Pod Nestor to pick up several items I will need. After I have disembarked at Fleet Command, this transport will deliver the rest of you to your respective ships. I am sorry to inconvenience you, but it is essential. When she had reclaimed her seat and strapped herself, Chen wondered tactfully, there was a history of heart disease? In the male line of the family, I believe there was, Cornel said untruthfully. Even so, August was very young to be stricken. All around her other men, equally young, shriveled in silent vulnerability, their faces putty grey with more than hangover now. Soon the transport pulled smoothly into the hold at Pod Nestor and grappled. I'll return within a quarter of an hour, Cornel assured her co-passengers. "'unstrapping, gripping her conference case, disembarking. "'Her own second-in-command met her on the other side of the lock, "'his face stark. "'Commander, I talked with Fleet Command in flight. "'I assume the news has gone to all pods. "'It has. "'We've already talked with Aeolus, Atalanta, Phaedra. "'Good. "'Edwards, I want the exterior door of the landing hold closed now and secured, "'also the lock door.' "'Edwards stared at the door from which he had just emerged. "'This one?' That's the one. Station several men here. I want none of the individuals on the transport to leave the hold until I've given the order. Remember, please, that I'm ranking officer of this organization. Edwards, it was evident, remembered. Good. Come to the bridge when it's attended to. I'll need you. The day nav popped to her feet when Cornel entered the bridge area. Cornel smiled. Hold, Epps, and keep your ears open. She settled in the command seat and keyed the far calm to life. Fleet Central, this is Rother. Have all pods been notified of the change of command? It's been done, the voice from Maine assured her. Good. How many individual pod commanders has the second transport returned to pods? Pod Commander Nishura is now aboard Pod Jocasta. The second transport is holding there. The pilot requests clarification whether he is to continue delivering commanders or return to neutral. 
Tell him I want all pod commanders returned to neutral. Nishura is to reboard the transport in the company of the others. Please call me when they're in the air. Signing off, she relaxed in the seat, permitting herself a brief taste of the moments she had directed her years toward. Her head turned to survey the nav screens. Out there, in the North American sky, seventy-five pods, in addition to this one hung. Their occupants totaled more than twelve million. Twelve million individuals shocked at the news of Fleet Commander Hazlitt's sudden death. Twelve million individuals separated from their own pod commanders for the duration. And below, Battlefield America. Edwards entered the cabin. Guard posted with instructions. Corneille nodded. Good. Prepare to take the pod down. Edward's face went slack. Down? Down. I wanted to settle at the point of the Golden Triangle, near the juncture of the Allegheny and the Monongahela. But that's the siege. The siege is about to be lifted. There is a parade ground down there behind the battlements. We're going to decorate it with non-combatants. Her pale eyes were almost warm. Edwards was disconcerted, caught off balance. In that she hoped he was typical of all seventy-six junior officers who held pod bridges this morning in the absence of their superiors. Fleet Central was on the line again. The transport is in the air, Commander. Good. She kept repeating that word today. Good. Now, I want you to put me on the general line. I want to make an announcement directly to all pod occupants. Fleet Central complied. Corneille's voice crossed the skies to seventy-five hover pods, to their more than twelve million occupants. Despite the saddening death of Commander August Hazlitt, I have good news for you this morning. Last night at Fleet Command Conference, a general truce was signed between the Unipatrist High Command and the Nationalist Army Air Force. I am not free to disclose full details at this point, but one condition is that all hover pods are to land immediately and be dismantled by their occupants. Therefore, in accordance with this condition, acting as fleet commander, I am now instructing the acting commanders of all hover pods to take their craft down. Each pod is to be navigated to the nearest confrontation zone between the two armies, landed with due care, and immediately dismantled. Proceed. For a moment she thought the laws of the universe had been altered and the phenomenon of sound edited out. Silence on the bridge was total. Corneille swung, met the wide eyes of Epps and Edwards. Edwards, have you initiated lowering procedure? Ah, do so, immediately. Then she turned back to deal with the sudden burst of sound from the far con. Fleet Commander Neutral Authority requests, Central, please relay new instructions to the second transport. I wanted to put down at the Nationalist Airfield, north of Boston. To all pods calling in, please relay the assurance that my orders are just that. Orders. All pods are to lower immediately and dismantle. Any officer who maintains his pod aloft is subject to disciplinary action. Fleet Commander, neutral, central. Next, I would like you to relay messages to Unipatrist High Command and Nationalist Headquarters. Messages to read. Call fire on all fronts. Non-combatants lowering onto all contested areas immediately. End message. Fleet Commander, get on it, central. Central got on it. Ten minutes later, Cornille was on the farcom again. Fleet Central, is there any pod which refuses to lower? Pod Proetus is the only one. Cornille called direct to Proetus. Within minutes, that pod, too, prepared to comply. She called Central again. Central, it is time to publicly announce the truce to neutral America. Please arrange the announcement immediately. All ground personnel at your disposal are then instructed to begin the evacuation of neutral America non-combatants. All ground vehicles and aircraft are to be put to service. Non-combatants are to be distributed along the Atlantic coast and are instructed to request food and supplies from nationalist and unipatrist forces. Commander, neutral authority, Central pleaded desperately. Neutral authority will not be able to reach me, Central. My final instructions are that after you have instituted the evacuation of non-combatants from neutral America, you are to dismantle all communication equipment at Fleet Central and leave the area yourself. Half an hour later, under the capable guidance of Epps and Edwards, Podnester touched ground. Corneille emerged amid her shaken and stunned charges. Many had never stepped foot to earth before. Many had never felt a midday breeze or seen the sun without an interposing layer of glass. Today they did. 
Today, the soldiers of the Nationalist Army, just as stunned, laid down their weapons and closed around the down pod. Today, Pod Nestor was dismantled, not gently. When the first metal plate had been ripped from her side, the first bunk thrown through her cargo port, a new bloodlust gripped non-combatant and soldier alike. Together they slew Pod Nestor. They beat her and clubbed her and dismembered her with the savage fury of years. They torched her. At midday she lay dead and smoking. Gathered around her, unipatrists, nationalists, and non-combatants shouted obscene obsequies on her passing. Heron Rothler Helm stood at his mother's side. All the others, too? His voice was hoarse, his face still dazed. Every one, Corneille said with satisfaction. The pods were down. Most of them, she felt confident, were destroyed. Neutral America, a seething chaos, had been set aflame by its fleeing inhabitants. Twelve million non-combatants littered the battlefields of the continent, and more were streaming on their way. Both armies were neutralized, and savage with joy. Unipatrist High Command and Nationalist Army Air Force Headquarters both denied that there was a truce. But on the land, truce existed. And it was good. Introduction to Selina Without knowing very much about it, I've always been drawn to the dance. I've been known to go to incredible lengths, not to mention neighborhoods, to see some dancer work. Through writing a theatrical column in a trade magazine, I've gotten to know some dancers, and I find them almost as fascinating in a chair as on the stage. On alternate Tuesdays in months without R's in them, when I manage to believe in reincarnation, I remember some peculiar dreams I've had about dancing, and I've become convinced that I was a dancer in another life. When Selina arrived in the mail one day, it was love at first sight. Selina by Beverly Goldberg The doll in the box, I cannot think, I cannot do more. The doll in the box, shoes, my dancing shoes, tick, tick, tick. I will win. Earth shall know pride, and the vehicle will be Selina. Selina will dance as she's never danced before. Leave-taking will be hard and soon. Never again to see my dance-mates, it is not fair. Why be best? It is the cause of pain, for the glory of the state. World of Earth supreme in the universe, I dance, I, Selina, dance, and Earth is proud. Tick, tick, why do not the clocks of Earth talk? Tick, the old books say they do, but here it is only tick, tick. Selina, are you ready to leave? Have you taken the pills, as indicated? Have you said your goodbyes? I cannot say goodbye to those I love so dearly. I cry and thus earn great displeasure. I will not risk it. Let us go. Farewells unsaid. But, Selina, your dance-mates, I have said my farewells to those I grew together with. Yes, you too are going forever, but this hurts you little. And the reward for you is to be so small. Small, when I will be serving the world of earth? Let us go, then, to the ship. The voyage will be long, and I must practice much. But to dance without joy, that may cost us victory. Selina, I have seen you dance. You will bring us victory, and it will be worth the cost. And you, Trinda, will your cost bring Earth something of equal value? I will have helped you. We could not send a dance-mate alone. Trinda moved her solid body around the room, gathering the belongings Selina had not packed. She did not comment on the packing already done. She covered the doll protectively. There would be no chance for one such as Selina to win without the doll, the toy that was her personal tie to her past life, her early days, the days before her dancemates. The packing was done. Trinda led the silent, swaying Selina to the door for departure. Selina was the only one of those present who did not know the joy. She had her peace. She had taken it at three o'clock. Her leaving gave pleasure. The walk of beauty that was the walk of Selina was part of the joy. Her dancemates had come to see her leave, but being one with her, they were careful not to let her see them. For sorrow was not good on a day such as this. She was their perfection, and in her going was victory for them. 
The pursuit of victory, the aim of all mates of whatever order, was strong in them, and they would not peril it. Selina would go. She would be of them no more. It would be a sorrow, but a sorrow shared. Trinda guided Selina with gentle force, and soon they were on the ship for the long journey. Trinda would have to care for Selina in the body. She must not allow it to fall from the height of perfection her dancemate years had brought. Carefully Trinda stored the dancemate tapes to use in the training. For Selina was a true mate, and alone. The dance was not hers. Trinda was of the lone mates, those who could act without the complete sharing of those with whom they were raised, without the unity that gave strength. For the men of earth had not developed talents for large groupings, but for small. It was only thus that war was ended. The young were put in the homes of the mates to be raised with others of their own age, mates of gene-likeness kinship, of true talent. None had but joy in what he did. Thus all were happy. And the past, the past was the love toy, the gift of one's own creators, given by them with the love of the creator of all. And happiness was all, all mates together, the mates a part of an order. Selina was a mate of five, five and Selina, and they were dance mates to all the other groups of five or six or seven in the order of the dance. Selina was a child of a mate of the order of music and a mate of the order of art. And when Selina danced, the dance was music and art, and all knew how perfect the choosing had been. And now Selina was to be the symbol of the good life on earth. She was the perfection of generations, and she was to be victorious, for earth needed this victory. Pride had endured with beauty as the only offering left, and thus earth must be the possessor of the greatest beauty. Selina, the greatest beauty of earth when in motion, was settled on the ship by Trinda. With cool competence, Trinda made all the arrangements for the practice, and then she let Selina sleep. And while she slept, Trinda slipped the continuing medication under the skin. And Selina slept on and on. When Trinda wakened Selina for practice and necessity, she gave her the medication of the dance mates. Dancing needed strength and endurance, and the means for these were available. The state provided them. Dance mates were young, always. The medication kept them in their youth, but kept them from leaving their youth. For their hearts were not as strong as the state wished. But Selina was a dance mate, and she knew not pain, and she had a long youth, and she had the joy of the dance. The dance with her mates was a joy, the dance without mates a terror not to be contemplated. The group danced and joyed together, and sorrowed apart. But the other worlds would not agree, and so the earth had decided to relinquish Selina for victory. She would dance alone. She would dance with joy untrue. She would have to give more than did any other, for she would be dancing with a heart that could not rightly dance alone. The practice began. The music began. The mates appeared. Trinda had brought them to Selina by the miracle of the medication, and in the miracle of tri V tapes. Tick, tick. I, Selina, dance. I dance with you, my loves. I joy with the oneness of us, and I leap and I dance. Oh, yes. I, Selina, feel the wind and the trees and the love of the God in my breast and my body. I, Selina, dance, and I dance. Tick, tick. Again I hear no talk, but therefore I am home. For the tick, tick of earth is with me, world of earth supreme in the universe, and I, Selina, dance. Tick, tick. Trinda shut the metronome away and the tapes and the screens, and then she picked up the limp body. And watching the rapid rise and fall of the hard breasts, she murmured, Sleep, Selina, till the time of the dance. We will practice, and earth shall win. I will help earth win, and the victory will be good. But you must know you are oneness, a oneness I cannot make true. And Trinda slipped the medication under the skin of Selina, and when Selina's sleep was deep enough, she was spoken to by the voice tapes, and told of the tick. That was earth and joy and the dance mates together sharing, and there was practice and there was sleep, and there was Trinda and Selina, and time passed, and then there was the world of the contests. Selina was hurried to the earth station on five Orion and placed in the room for waiting. Trinda worked with her there, but Trinda saw that Selina, the dance mate, had much to do, for Trinda learned of all the entrance, and she feared the need for victory was strong in her. 
It was a need that grew as the separation from mates began to burden her. But she saw that Selina danced, and that Selina danced with the spirits of her dance mates, thinking she was dancing with the flesh. And Selina grew tired, and Trinda gave her more of the state's medication, so that she was again strong. The weeks passed, the time was near. Trinda began to give Selina the new medication, so that Selina danced always with her mates. She talked to her mates, and knew them to be a part of her again, and she was happy. Selina shared her doll with her mates, and the toy of the past brought comfort it had never brought before, and Selina was happy. The time had come, all was readiness. Trinda watched, as did all the members of the contest worlds, and Trinda feared. Selina, entrant of the oldest of the worlds, was to be the last. Selina had to be the best, as Trinda knew. Trinda had mates whose voices were echoing in her ears, and she answered that she would provide the best. And as Trinda slipped the gossamer veils over the lengths of Selina's hard slenderness, and as she slipped the shoes on Selina's feet, she slipped the medication under Selina's skin. And Selina began to feel the joy. Then Trinda slipped the disc that was on the pin into Selina's twisted locks, and Selina heard the tick, 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 and she knew she was with her mates. And Trinda watched her, and heard her name called, and heard the earth proclaimed. As the music began to sound, Trinda slipped still more of the medication under Selina's skin, and she moved Selina toward the stage, the great stage illuminated with myriad lights and shadows as requested by Earth. She whispered fiercely, Your mates! And Selina heard the tick, tick, and she rushed onto the stage to join her mates. Victory! For Selina danced, her body moved the shadows, and those who saw and who did not see knew beauty and knew the god. Selina moved, and the air danced. Selina danced, and the sounds of the worlds vibrated in motionless accord with sighs for the beauty and the grace, and Selina danced, and the hall was silent, the music stilled, and Selina danced. The dance was all, Selina was all, and Selina danced, and Selina danced. Trinda slowly walked up the steps and onto the stage. She stood over the body and intoned, Selina for the glory of the state, world of earth supreme in the universe. And Selina danced no more. Introduction to Uruguayan and I One of the first writers to submit a story to Cassandra Rising was Miriam Allen de Ford. I loved the story she sent, but had certain reservations— so I wrote and explained my feelings. She readily agreed to revise the story, but it was decided that the revision would wait because she was deeply involved in other projects. Ms. De Ford died before that revision was done. Miriam Allen De Ford was a great and gracious lady, and she is profoundly missed. I asked Juanita Coulson if she would undertake the revision along the lines Ms. De Ford had agreed to, and she kindly acquiesced. Ms. Coulson is the author of a number of science fiction novels. Crisis on Chiron, Singing Stones, War of Wizards, and is as well known for her excellent gothics and historical romances. She and her husband, Robert, edit and publish the Hugo Award-winning fanzine Yandro. Uruguayan and I, by Miriam Allen de Ford and Juanita Coulson. Only two things are certain about every human being you meet. He was born, and he's going to die but not Uruguayan. He was born, but he never had to die, not as long as he remained dictator of Valadian. At first, when he had been the bright young hope of the Lower Depths Revolt, there was a long list of volunteers. When the news of his illness leaked out, he was almost embarrassed, or said he was. Maybe in that period he really was, by the flood of offered kidneys. They said it was nephritis, but pretty soon everybody knew or guessed that it was the beginning of his long struggle with cancer. I should know I was one of the earliest of his old-time followers to offer myself. I'm glad now that somebody else was chosen. But we were sure that Uruguayan was indispensable. He had to be kept alive and well. Kidneys. Everybody has two of them. Everybody has two lungs, too, and can live with one if he has to. As time went on, and the doctors reluctantly announced they were still talking at that period, that Uruguayan was suffering from a tumor in the left lung, which was malignant, but had not yet metastasized, the volunteers thronged again. This time I was not one of them. 
I was beginning to have melancholy doubts about the way the LDR was going. You know what usually happens? First, the nearly hopeless rebellion against oppression, the riots, the guerrilla warfare, the imprisonment and torture and executions. Then the long, hard battle, the growing upsurge, and at last, victory. The condemned and excoriated leader of the rebels becomes the hero, and finally the king or emperor or president or whatever name is given to the head of that particular nation. Perhaps he does lead his nation into a better life, at least for a time, or stays what he was, the spokesman and inspiration of a new free regime. There have been such men and women. Morgos of Pythair was one such in our own era, and so was Gethera of Khan. Today, I hope, but let me go on. But all too often, now as in the remote past, once the new leader is settled in his dominance, little by little he hardens, and his rule hardens with him, until once more we find ourselves crushed beneath a despotism as unbearable as the one against which we had revolted. They say even good kind Sethir, as he liked to be called, whom we of the LDR overthrew and liquidated, came to the throne as the young commander of a dissident movement. We who marched with Uruguayan in the bright early days shut our eyes and ears as long as we could deceive ourselves. One by one our new freedoms vanished. One by one the old tyrannies against which we had fought and which we thought we had conquered returned, always in the name of plausible necessity— the secret arrests, the concentration camps, the torture chambers, the hidden murders, the appeals to security as a break on liberty, and peace as a substitute for justice. The day came when to be heard quoting passages from Uruguayan's own early speeches was a sure way to disappear suddenly and forever. Nevertheless, the old image remained. Uruguayan was no petty upstart who had attained power as if by accident and could be defeated when he abused it. Of his kind, the man was a genius. To the great mass, he remained not only the head of state, but the leader, superhuman and almost divine. From his own experience, he could sense the merest beginnings of rebellion and suppress them ruthlessly. He was guarded as few men have ever been. The slightest suspicion of less than fanatical devotion among his closest associates meant instantaneous exile from the palace, which he, who once had been mobbed in the streets by worshippers fighting to touch his garments— now seldom left, and never except surrounded by soldiers with laser guns. No such mass movement as the LDR originally was could hope to survive or even to be born. He could not be assassinated. The one deep secret dream of the disillusioned was that, like all living creatures, he must age and must die. But thanks to the miracles of science, that dream too was dissipated. They say that even on old Terra, in its last years before the Holocaust, organ transplantation had been tried with mixed success. How astonished and envious those pioneers would be if they could see our surgeons here on Valadian at work. There is literally no part of the human body which they cannot replace safely. That hard early experience in the guerrilla days of the LDR had taken its toll. At the time, Uruguayan had seemed as healthy and strong as any of us. But perhaps even then the seeds of the cancer lay within him, waiting a chance to strike. The stresses of that period gave the disease an opening wedge. He aged rapidly before his time. One organ after another became affected. However, with our marvelous surgical techniques, he could simply spend a few days closely guarded in a hospital wing of the palace, especially built for his needs, and then be back again as good as new. As I have said, in the earlier stages of the cancer and of his dictatorship, there were many willing volunteers. But it is one thing to donate a paired organ, an eye or a limb. It is another to lose one's heart or liver or both lungs, and with that one's life. That grim fact and Uruguayan's ever-increasing tyrannies choked off the stream of donors. He was alienating all those who had once loved him enough to die for him and there was not even a wife who might forgive and sacrifice herself that he might live. Why marry, he said to me once. There isn't a woman I would want who wouldn't be overcome with joy if I would take her. That ought to have warned me, but we were all blinded then. So when, about five years after his first series of transplants, it was found that the lung cancer had returned, and now affected both lungs, the new as well as the old one, there was no response to the subtle feelers encouraging volunteers. 
In view of his past actions, we anticipated some grasping excess, some obvious seizure of a victim, a thing so inhuman and outrageous that it might at last produce the explosion of revolt we hoped for. But Uruguayan was too clever to move openly. He had other solutions to his problem. There was purchase, generally the vital organs of those who had already chosen suicide. But few of those people were in the perfect physical condition required for transplantation purposes, and those few demanded astronomical prices for the bodies they were so soon to discard. It was their last chance to leave a legacy to their families, or to some worthy cause. And in a society such as ours, where suicide, like abortion, was a matter of private judgment, these people were looked on more often with admiration than odium. But then the abuses of the system gradually altered public opinion. Once those who had called such dealings cannibalism were regarded as cranks or reactionaries, now they were listened to and applauded, and another source of vital organs disappeared. But a very nasty rumor began to circulate among the growing, though hidden and much imperiled, anti-Uruguayan faction— we had long suspected that those within Uruguayan's inmost circle sometimes were taking advantage of death sentences passed upon criminals who happened to possess healthy organs. The condemned received no pay, of course, but most of them preferred death under anesthetic to our rather severe means of execution. It was an utterly corrupt practice, though few protested the callous exploitation of those they assumed were guilty of murder or other heinous crimes. But now it was whispered... What happens to the political dissidents who are arrested and then disappear? And how many of those supposed murderers were truly guilty of any wrongdoing? Could it be the people are seized and convicted not for crimes or because they are suspected of opposition to the dictatorship, but merely because some privileged man or woman needs, say, a new heart? And for privileged man or woman substitute above all only one name, Uruguayans. That realization was a catalyst, and there was an immediate result, a firm resolve among the rebels to find some way to kill the tyrant and stop his regime once and for all. To do that, however, we had to convert, subvert, or swindle noble Dr. Levengorn. Levengorn, the only being on Valadium whom Uruguayan trusted. Levengorn, the scientist who had received three Gasticos awards for his astonishing medical discoveries. Levengorn who alone with his specially trained nurse assistant was allowed to anesthetize the dictator and give him another kidney, heart, or pancreas, as Uruguayan's organs yielded to the onslaught of the cancer. Levin Gorm had not been one of us when Uruguayan had been the young and idealistic leader of the LDR. The doctor had entered the scene later, after the disease struck Uruguayan. Levin Gorm's skills had proved invaluable, and it was Levin Gorm who first proposed using criminals and then political prisoners as donors when the offers to purchase organs no longer met response. And the noble doctor had been well rewarded for his services. Next to Uruguayan himself, he was now the only really powerful man in our country, and he enjoyed that power. This was a man we must somehow win over to our cause, or buy over, or compel over. It seemed impossible, but there was no other chance. Uruguayan security forces blocked all other avenues to the throne. By now the LDR had a successor, the new revolutionary movement. It was triple hush-hush, naturally. If any of our names, mine most of all, had been known to Uruguayan, it would have meant a horrible and not very quick death. Of all the former rebels once close to him, Few were left, and fewer still retained that all-consuming passion to end the rotten system which was crushing Valadian. But I did, and they looked to me for leadership. I must spearhead this campaign. I could not, for good reasons connected with our common past, approach Uruguayan personally. I must not remind him of my existence, or give him any hint of the underground supporting me. But those same reasons out of our past determined that I alone of the NRM would be the one to bell this terrifying cat. To do that I must work with Levengorm, who I did not even know. But I must, because if the rumors were true, fate had now taken a hand, and if what we suspected were true, it was the one opportunity we would have to succeed. We have a gifted surgeon in our organization, no Levengorm, but one of the very best— he was the one person in whom I could and can confide totally, the one I could rely on no matter what would happen. He warned me repeatedly of the risks involved in the project I was contemplating, but I convinced him it had to be done. 
Like the rest of us in the NRM, our surgeon's revolutionary affiliations were a profound secret, and his professional standing remained unblemished. As a colleague and former classmate, he was able to socialize with Dr. Levengorn, and to subtly and indirectly discuss a hypothetical case. Of course, Levengorn did not chatter idly about his most important patient, his only patient, yet he must have felt his own crisis approaching, a growing threat to the power and position he enjoyed, because he let drop several clues that gave our surgeon the information we needed. As the transplantations had multiplied, the progress of Uruguayan's malady, even its continued existence, had ceased to be public property. All mention of it was crushed. But any intelligent person, even those among Uruguayan's scarce remaining faithful devotees, could see how tyranny was spreading. The ferocious security, the obsessive secrecy, the sadistic cruelties, and inevitably the whispers started. We began to ascribe Uruguayan's increasing inhumanity to a physical cause. I was far from the only one to guess that this time it was the one absolutely crucial organ in his body that was affected, and our surgeon's delicately probing conversation with Levengorm confirmed my suspicions. A tumor had been discovered in Uruguayan's brain, and it was found to be malignant. It was in the cerebral cortex. It was metastasizing. And it was inoperable, even for a genius like Levengorn. To operate would literally destroy that which he was trying to save. Not only did Levengorm and we know this awful truth, but so did Uruguayan. And the dilemma tortured him far more than it could have any ordinary man. Above all, he wanted to live and continue to reign. But though brains could be transplanted and had been, and though helpless victims, too many of them, were at his mercy, this operation involved problems unlike any other. A total brain transplant meant not only a transfer of living tissue, it meant that all that made Uruguayan himself would be exchanged for all that made some other human being himself. So far Uruguayan was still functioning normally, mentally. That is to say, normally for him, he was still in control, still making decisions, but he could fully comprehend the bitter reality of his situation. He must either die altogether, or he could live on with his body possessed by another mind. He was in the position of a king who had to abdicate, but who could pick his successor. Any other man on Valadium, I am positive, would have simply let it go, would have asked for euthanasia, and left the future to chance. But not this man. His colossal ego and lust for power continued even as he faced certain death. If he, as himself, must die, then he, as himself, must be resurrected, in the same body and with the same appearance, by somebody as like himself as possible. Such was his incredible demand, and if it was possible that he could find a brain and a personality very similar to his own to take his place, Valadian would lose its last hope for freedom. We could not allow that to happen. From now on we must control events, not Uruguayan. Time was on our side, the disease was progressing rapidly, and with each day chances lessened that a transplant candidate could be found in time. Uruguayan's insistence on receiving precisely the right brain threatened not only his life, but Levengorm's, for if the dictator died, his surgical power behind the throne would also fall with him. Levengorm was the key. His frantic search for a brain donor gave the NRN the entry it needed. Thanks to my all-important surgeon contact, I was able to plant the necessary suggestion. As one fellow professional to another, he broached to Levengorm the possibility of providing a donor for the proposed transplantation, and Levengorm instantly snapped at the bait. That in itself was an indication of the stage of Uruguayan's disease. If we did not act quickly, Levengorm might be driven to find his own donor. That could not be allowed. From that point on, my surgeon friend was the only person to be in my complete confidence. He wanted what I wanted, would dare anything for my sake and he could be counted on to replace Levengorm at the crucial stage, if that became necessary. He had connections no one else in our underground had. He could concoct the countless counterfeit records we must have if the scheme were to succeed. Oh, I was frightened, of course. Never believe in the cool and intrepid hero, or the calm, collected martyr. So many things could go wrong in half a dozen ways I couldn't foresee, and once the project was underway, I could never stop it. But I had to go on, for the sake of Valadian and her lost freedom. Scrupulously, carefully, running against time, 
I built up a case history, embodying point by point every detail I knew would appeal most strongly to Uruguayan. Without the help of my surgeon, conspirator, it would have been impossible. It is because of this, and because I assume my obligations to him, that you have noticed I have not mentioned, and will not mention, his name. I will protect him always, and give him every recompense within my power. Levengorm was becoming frantic, sensing time slipping through his grasp. Either a donor must be found soon, or even the rest of Uruguayan's body was doomed. He would not take a healthy brain from among the many at his mercy. He clung to his power-mad demand for a donor built, so to speak, to his order. And that was what I did to myself. Built a physical and psychological facade of data to convince Uruguayan, and to hide the real personality beneath. There were two major hurdles to jump. A plausible reason must be found for the person to be willing to sacrifice himself, and there would inevitably be some sort of face-to-face -face confrontation. Uruguayan would insist on seeing his victim, his replacement. It was physically impossible for me to disguise myself so that he would not recognize me at once. And he would never, for a minute, thanks to our intimate past acquaintance, believe that I could meet his high specifications or that I would offer to die that he might live. Donate him a kidney long ago, yes, but not my brain, then or ever. We surmounted the first hurdle without too much difficulty. We, the surgeon and I, concocted an applicant who was very near Uruguayan's own age, true, and shared in nearly every way Uruguayan's own ambitions and dreams. But this applicant had never had the breaks that Uruguayan had enjoyed. He, too, had once been a rebel in the LDR when he was younger. However, his post had been out on Valadian's frontiers, far from the seats of power. Item by item, he satisfied Uruguayan's requirements— as I had calculated, this was a psychic twin, Uruguayan demanded. The applicant's data went on. Now, with no financial means for transplantation, he was suffering an incurable cardiac disorder, the one flaw in an otherwise healthy body. Nothing awaited him but imminent, painful death. Therefore, having always been a dedicated follower of our ruler, as his last loyal gesture, he would offer his brain to Uruguayan, proud that he so much resembled the leader and asking only the honor of being of service to him. All this was thoroughly investigated by the security force, and the falsely documented history stood up against their inquiries, as it had been designed to do. But Levengorn was no fool. The uncanny perfection of the applicant's profile made him question matters privately. And that, too, was as I had planned, for without Levengorn's cooperation, willing or otherwise, the project would fail. Now, without either side ever fully revealing itself, we approached each other, and I felt sure Levengorm would work with us, for his own reasons. He did not care for the future good of Valadian, but for the survival of noble Dr. Levengorm. So be it, so long as he was our tool. The more difficult hurdle remained to be crossed, the necessary confrontation with Uruguayan. To be sure, only one such interview need take place— when the actual operation was performed, I would not be brought in before Uruguayan was already unconscious. The solution was amazingly simple. I was given a stand-in. An obscure and hungry professional actor from the distant part of Valadian, where I, the applicant, too, was supposed to reside, was hired for enough money to quiet his doubts. He was persuaded that this was a test of sorts, and that a successful outcome would bring him not only great wealth— but status far above his fellow performers. He was thoroughly coached, presented to Levengorm, and by him to Uruguayan, as the candidate, and accepted. It is regrettable that on his way back to his home the actor's one-man plane crashed, and he was killed. My surgeon-conspirator objected strenuously to the sabotage, but I patiently told him that it was impossible to trust any outsider— same consideration applies to the fatal explosion, soon after the operation, in noble Dr. Levengorm's laboratory, where he and his nurse were working. My surgeon protested that execution as well, arguing that, despite his perverted medical practices during Uruguayan's reign, Levengorm's death was a great loss to science, quite true. But Levengorm knew far too much, and his loyalty, as he had proved during the operation, was in question. It was too bad— but his death was therefore unavoidable. It may sound frivolous, but as a matter of fact, the one thing I most lamented in becoming or inhabiting Uruguayan was the inevitable death of my own body. 
which in truth was in excellent health and was much more attractive than Uruguayan's own. I had given up so many things precious to me, no longer mine to have. For the rest of my life I would be trapped in Uruguayan's flesh, and that grieved me for some time after the operation was successfully completed. But that was a childish reaction, and I was later ashamed of it. What I had done was to sacrifice everything for the most noble of goals, to create a new Uruguayan who would lift from Valadian the terrible burden of those years since he had taken over as our evil tyrant. The loss of my own body was, after all, a small price to pay for such a great victory in the name of freedom. It was done. I, who write this, am now, to all intents and purposes, Uruguayan. Since once I occupied his body, I became Valadian's absolute dictator. I was able to arrange immediate liquidation of those officials who had abetted him and install in their places my own loyal staff and begin to mold them to my wishes. But five years after the transplantation, I sometimes wonder if it was worth my terrible martyrdom. Why does it become increasingly necessary to forbid my natural impulses of compassion in the interests of security? Why am I forced to stamp out firmly the plots of those who stupidly question my enlightened policies? Why, I ask myself, have these subversive dissidents sprung up within the very organization to which I belonged and in whose name I sacrificed my own body? Is it fair that I should be so beset by these misguided fools? I have suffered and struggled for Valadian's sake. Surely I know what is best for her. My surgeon friend... One of the few from the old days who still stands staunchly by me keeps arguing tactics. I am afraid he is blind. He does not understand the ramifications as I do. Only the other evening, he said, have you ever considered simply letting go, allow freedom to grow of its own accord? It must be nourished, not forced. I tried to make him see reason, but it was futile. Imagine... He even had the audacity to remark that perhaps Uruguayan had meant well once. Did I not recall how idealistic Uruguayan had been in the early days, how much we had thought alike? Once Uruguayan had seized power, matters grew impossible. I refused to listen, outraged that my loyal friend would dare make such a comparison. His obstinate attitude presumes on our relationship. He, of all people, should understand why I must do the things I do to preserve all that is dear in Valadian. How quickly he has forgotten. He, who is willing to risk everything with me in order to save Valadian from Uruguayan's tyranny. But I will not chastise him, though his prattlings grow ever more irritating. For his own sake he must eventually see the truth and comprehend why I must keep a firm guiding hand on Valadian's helm. I shall and must persevere in the face of all opposition, even his. We must have security against our foes, without and alas within. We must have tranquility. I repudiate vehemently the malicious accusations brought me by my trusted investigators that Valadian, under, shall we say, this incarnation of its leader— is no better off than it was before. I know I am right, and therefore I have to yield to the political realities, even though it breaks my heart to suppress those who were my comrades. You may wonder why I am recording all this. Let us call it a confession, at all. I suppose it is simple vanity, though I may disguise it to myself as a desire for historical accuracy. I am making provision that it shall be concealed and remain unopened until fifty years after my death. Time will be the judge of my work. And those fifty years must be far in the future, must. I have so much yet to do for Valadian, and death waits upon me all too eagerly. It was a risk inherent in my original sacrifice, and the bill comes due often. The cancer recurs again and again, for the disease lurked within Uruguayan's body, too deep to be detected in all its hiding places, and I must pay the consequences, because when I assumed Uruguayan's power, I inherited his sickly shell of flesh as well. I have already had a few minor transplants, but I am determined never to have a major one, unless, of course, it becomes vitally necessary. My surgeon is not the genius Levengorn was— I am not sure he could successfully perform a brain operation of the delicacy required if— But that will not happen. I know better than anyone alive the dangers of such a procedure, 
the possibilities for deception within one's own ranks. It is only occasionally, in the super-busy life I now lead as ruler of Valadian, that I have time for personal reflection. When I do, most often I remember vividly the last time Uruguayan and I met face to face. It was when he was just beginning to display the signs of the brutality he later inflicted on all of us. I, as his chief lieutenant in the old LDR, was delegated to remonstrate with him. He had always been arrogant. We called it heroic self-confidence once. And he turned on me viciously. You, he sneered. What do you know of the necessities and prerogatives of power? Do you think I ever really shared that soft, sloppy idealism I had to pretend to in order to put myself where I am today? Go back and tell those fools and what's left of the LDR that I will tolerate no more of their nonsense. Tell them to knuckle under or expect the worst. I remember my helpless rage then, my fervent longing for the strength to answer him on his own terms. And now, in a strange way, I have that strength, his own strength. He carried out his threat, then, as I have. But let me acknowledge it, for the historians yet to be born. His last words to me still rankle. It is hard to expunge all the emotional impact of what one has experienced in childhood and youth. He laughed and said, As for you, little sister, you lie low and shut up, or you will meet as horrible a death as I can arrange, whether I am your brother or not. Introduction to the Vanilla Mint Tapestry Jacqueline Lichtenberg calls writing science fiction the entire definition of my existence, and quotes Carl Willenda about his return to the high wire after an accident killed some of his troop. To be on the wire is life. All the rest is waiting. That's the way I feel about science fiction writing. Everything else I do is done so that I can be permitted to write science fiction and nothing else. Her first publication was in If magazine in 1968, the first story in her Syme series. Her novel, House of Zior, also part of the Syme series, was published by Doubleday in 1974, and a new novel, Unto Zior Forever, was also published by Doubleday earlier this year. The Vanilla Mint Tapestry by Jacqueline Lichtenberg Raymond Yost didn't like the idea of working on loan to the intelligence agency. He was a scholar, not a spy. But his feet carried him relentlessly along the springy, floored, brightly utilitarian corridor toward the vesting chamber. He turned the last corner, squared his bony shoulders, and paced the final fifty yards with thin-lipped determination. He didn't like the idea of working so close to a partner's fission time, either. But he'd keep his word, even if it killed him. And it probably would. He'd said that many times in the last nine years, and each time he'd survived. Director Proken kept saying that experience would polish his technique, but privately Yost thought experience would polish him off. He'd never had the nerve to try the pun on the bald-headed, blue-skinned director of humanoid correlationists. At twenty-nine, all Yost had to show for his life's work was an interplanetary health certificate claiming that his six-foot, hundred-fifty-pound, Terran-born body was in excellent, if underweight, health. But every morning he searched for the first gray hair among the ashen blonde. He'd vowed that when it appeared, he'd quit the central correlationists for the sedentary life of a desk scholar. At the end of the corridor, he paused before the ornate ten-foot-high doors, took a deep breath, and placed his hand on the sensor plate. Yost gritted his teeth at the grinding whir of heavily taxed servos, badly in need of the attention of the very scarce maintenance crews. But slowly the door swung inward, revealing familiar red-velvet shadows. The well-upholstered hush, soft, reddish shadows, and mixed incenses of the vesting chamber created a wholly different world from the angular, polished chrome and fluorescent sterility of the rest of the station. Within that chamber, haunted by the distant moaning of thin, dark winds through jagged rocks, Yost always felt he could believe the stories about the Ballatine race memory being somehow connected with the spirit world, or the beyond, where God sat on his throne and created. The Ballatine reticence to discuss theology could be due to any number of things. Still, it would be nice to know if there really were a creator. As he crossed the threshold, allowing the doors to close behind him, 
Yost felt his post-hypnotic conditioning taking hold, and he yielded. Brushing aside the last wisp of mysticism, he checked his assignment card. It read G-12. Call it. The door closed, and Yost moved to the railing in front of him to survey the huge chamber, which was the off-duty home of C.C.'s resident colony of Ballatine. He was on a circular mezzanine, seven levels above the main floor. All the balconies were partitioned into smaller chambers by heavy hangings, richly woven in dark-hued patterns. Only the main floor showed hard, reflecting surfaces, and Yost knew those were merely the roofs of compartments, which were as thoroughly hung inside as the balconies. He could see some of the small, spidery humanoids that served the Ballatine on Bellet, the Ballatine homeworld. Friends of one part, the Ballatine called them, soulless host bodies to provide mobility for the symbiotes. It was their placid certainty in recognizing soul that had given rise to the rumors about the Ballatine. Yost had never been in a main floor compartment, and he knew he never would be. That was where the Ballatine conducted their conjugation and fission rites. Investiture and divestiture always took place in a balcony chamber. He was on level G. Now he needed to find number 12 and pick up his senior partner for this assignment. He stepped back to the door, looked both ways along the narrow aisle, spotted number 2, 3, and 4, and followed along until he found a hanging with the number 12, woven into the abstract design. He pushed the soft velour aside, allowing the tactile sensation to trigger another post-hypnotic command, and entered. The incense Collett had chosen for his tiny wedge-shaped home smelled like sandalwood, fresh air, and eucalyptus. Even without his hypnotic conditioning, the California-born human found it pleasantly relaxing. And then he saw the ballotine, ten pounds of amorphous red and black-veined blue-white tissue floating at ease in his nutrient bath of enriched bellet seawater. Yost checked his card against the clipboard, hung from the glassite bowl, double-checked the codes, and then clipped the card in place and lay down on the cot. He rolled up his left sleeve and dangled his arm in the water, brushing the ballotine gently to signal his readiness. Only the first contact occasioned a twinge of instinctive revulsion, the primeval human reaction to soft, warm, slimy creatures. Then Collett commanded the nerves locally, and Yost relaxed. The investiture would take a good twenty minutes, and for the most of that he would be blind, deaf, and dumb, and so he let his absent hypnotist talk him into a refreshing nap. Collett, like all his kind, would be considerate, but the procedure could still drive an unprotected human insane. Yost woke to an oddly alien environment that gradually converged on normality. Then the ballotine spoke silently in his mind. Friend of two parts, I greet you. Have I matched sensory inputs? Yost nodded. Perfectly. You are Collett? Correct. And you are Raymond Yost, among other things. Correct. Now, we've many grave matters to discuss. True. And meanwhile, you will make haste to consume calories lest I damage your health. Allow me to check my synapse linkages before we leave. Please do. Control is all yours. Take me to the commissary. Still lying on the cot, Yost felt his individual muscle fibers tensing and relaxing as the symbiote checked his control. Gaining coordination, his body rose to its feet, and then suddenly he blacked out. He didn't lose consciousness, so he had time to feel true panic before the room swam back into focus. He was seated on the cot. What happened? Deepest apologies, friend of two parts. Slight fibrillation. No damage. It won't happen again. Panic allayed for the moment, Yost asked the question that had haunted him since Proken had talked him into this madness. Call it, do you feel all right? The inward silence lengthened until Yost felt as if Collett were gone. Call it, I apologize. I didn't mean to offend. Yes, friend of two parts, our pride is sometimes our worst enemy. Yet, if you doubt me, We'd best undertake no mission together. A partnership such as ours can survive only on trust. If you tell me you can do it, I won't doubt. Yost considered Ballatine integrity, about the only constant in the shifting universe. After a moment the reply came, and Yost was able to read intonation in that silent voice. 
Ray, said Collett gravely, I have at least six months. I've been thoroughly briefed, and I believe we can perform the task set us. Then let's go. We certainly haven't time to waste. Collett went through his calisthenic routine, and then, with increasing smoothness, piloted their body to the commissary, and even displayed unusual talent in feeding themselves. Yost was surprised at such immediate proficiency, until he remembered he'd never worked with such a mature ballotine before. But Proken had wanted two seniors for this mission, and he'd wanted the most experienced ballotine on the staff, namely Collett. And Proken usually got exactly what he wanted. All through the meal they discussed the details of the mission. The Ballantine's skill at the quasi-telepathic form of communication grew steadily until Yost could read nuances of meaning, even more clearly than he could human facial expressions. All during their four-week journey to Harnowit, the technical details held their attention almost exclusively. They went over everything from local language, customs, and values, to planetary geography, political history, and economic resources. In short, they approached the field of operations as correlationists rather than as spies, simply because they knew no other method. They were still discussing their problem as their tiny ship fell toward the Harnowitz spaceport, the one and only spaceport on the planet. Yost relaxed and let the Ballantine cope with the antiquated, non-human-built landing grid. He watched his fingers flying over the complex board and reflected that next to women, symbiotes were the handiest kind of people to have around. Too bad the two were incompatible. A ballotine supplied absolute total recall, an enormous encyclopedic knowledge, assorted manual skills, freedom from parasitic invasions, swift repair of injuries, and most important to travelers, companionship. All at the cost of two or three thousand calories a day. And ballotines weren't even fussy about the original form of those calories. Yost had become close friends with every partner he'd ever had, and now found himself warming to Collett in the same way. It was becoming more and more difficult for him to accept the idea of Collett's approaching death. Though no further mention had been made of it, it was never far from Yost's thoughts. When their ship was safely grounded, Yost said silently, Okay, where to? It's your turn. I'm going to sleep. From Collett's heavy tone, Yost guessed that the landing had tired his partner, so he locked the ship and went to do battle with the local customs authorities. Despite their reputation, spies spent as much time on dreary routine as scholars or anybody else. Harnowitz's largest and capital city, Tubuin, sprawled in rural splendor, practically untouched by galactic civilization. The natives liked it that way, and they didn't welcome tourists. The terms of Harnewitz's confluence membership placed an absolute embargo on all rotsotronic devices, and practically all modern equipment depended on the ubiquitous room-temperature superconductor. What tourist could live even half a day on a strange planet without his personal translator, telepathic shield, and deodorizer? What scholar could operate without his computers and recorders, unless he was a partner of a ballotine? The Harnewitti were spindly-legged, green-skinned humanoids with large saucer eyes and tiny mouths equipped with double rows of needle-sharp teeth that their thin lips could scarcely cover. Yost knew that, despite appearances, they were not related to anything resembling a Terran frog. Their dental structure indicated a carnivorous ancestry, but they were omnivores. And like most other humanoids of NCO worlds, they could interbreed with almost any other NCO world's humanoid species, though the results weren't always viable. Unraveling the hows and whys of the strange, seemingly unnatural phenomenon of interbreeding had been Yost's life work until he took up spying, and a surge of new energy lifted his feet as he moved out of the spaceport area and into the city. Every assignment started with the elements of tackling a new planet, learning its languages and cultures, and finally moving out among its people to see it firsthand. He always got a thrill out of that first foray into the strange, and it didn't fail him now, even though his objectives were different. With his jump bag balanced on one bony shoulder, Yost bought a couple of the fist-sized, high-caloric hardnuts from a street vendor who fished them out of glowing coals and presented them wrapped in fleshy purple leaves while holding out one knobby green hand for Yost's wooden coins. Bowing his gratitude, Yost continued down the street, nimbly avoiding piles of dung. The light held a strange charcoal smoke quality, 
that lent colors a glare-free softness, very like the first lowering of ominous black storm clouds. It had a vaguely disturbing effect that hadn't been apparent from the tapes Yost had studied. To allay his nervousness, Yost had to keep reminding himself it was the nearly perpetual half-solar eclipse of this latitude that created the effect. Vaulting the open sewer trough, he crossed the boulevard and entered a likely-looking inn, whose sign was a faded half-circle under which was printed in native script only, the Inn of the Half-Sun. The interior was dark and deserted. A lone native drowsed on a high stool in a corner beside a patch of much bescribbled wall. The untailored length of dingy gray cloth wound around his emaciated, obviously male form emphasized his unhuman proportions. But the cloth's relatively clean, new look made it obvious this was the proprietor, desk clerk, and bellboy. Yost took up a stand at a respectful distance, swung his bag to the straw-strewn floor, and cleared his throat. The sound startled the frail old man, and he managed to pry his eyes open. The sight of Yost startled him into a puckered gape that revealed the brown-stained irregular teeth set loosely in shrunken gums. The old man said, yes, you want something? In the middle of siesta? At high noon, you want something? Yost knew the natives slept through the grueling 70-degree Fahrenheit heat. He said in the local dialect, I apologize for disturbing you, but I need a room. The old man peered at the human silently, estimating his worth. He eyed the stuffed bag, then turned to the wall to find a vacancy in his register. Top floor, west end. Twenty zuit a day. Yost knew he'd been offered the worst room in the house for twice the price of the best. He had the money, but he dickered the old man down to five a day and breakfast nuts, never letting on that he preferred top-floor corner rooms. When they'd concluded the deal, Yost hunted about the large, empty room that served as a tavern, found the local excuse for a broom, shouldered his bag, and climbed the stairs with a nonchalance that left the old man gaping at the human's enormous strength. That also was calculated. Now they wouldn't try to roll him. He found his room with the lockless door swinging gently in the breeze from the unglazed windows. As he expected, it was a long rectangular room with two inches of reeking soggy straw on the floor. He swept the straw out into a neat pile in the corridor, propped the broom beside it, and set up camp. It took him twenty minutes to arrange the tent, air mattress, cook stove, and security alarms to his satisfaction. Then he took his nuts to the window and surveyed the city, absorbing the sinister atmosphere created by the weird lighting. Presently his partner joined him. He made no overt sign, but Yost knew another being now shared his eyes. It was a comfortable, secure feeling. As he gnawed the warm blue nut flesh and savored the smoky taste, Yost said, I call a strategy conference. Convened came the silent agreement. Yost felt the wry smile that went with that. It raised his spirits a bit, as he said, That caravansary over there, he focused his eyes on the tallest structure in sight, a dun-colored adobe tower. Looks promising. Hire a native guide, some transport, and set out for Rogam Studio? Why don't we try the art gallery first? That's where the tapestry disappeared from, and they're the ones that have been complaining loudest. We're here to find out why, so why not ask? Could save a lot of trouble. That's what I like, a subtle ballotine. Walk right into a public building and start asking questions that are bound to alert the entire Harnewood underground. The Curiosity Corps could use a couple more like you. He gave their agency one of his favorite nicknames in hopes of maintaining his good spirits. Too late, the stony silence within alerted him to his mistake. Fission inevitably produced two ballotines. He hadn't meant to imply that Collett's children would be unwelcome. I'm sorry, Collett. I just mean that we think too much like CC data collectors and not enough like spies for this mission. Collett came back. Misunderstanding nullified, friend of two parts. He used the ballotine idiom for mutual apology. Yost knew it was a formula that erased the whole incident. But it seemed far more powerful than necessary and he'd never known a ballotine to toss that phrase off lightly. Collett continued, I don't think the frontal approach is out of order. Asking questions is our profession, so why not ask some? 
Okay, that's what we'll do first thing after sundown. He fell silent, nibbling at the second knot and at his latest pet worry. Finally, Collett said, All right, what's eating you? Yoss started a flip reply, then swallowed and said seriously, Listen, Collett, we've chewed this assignment over a hundred times. We've discussed every aspect of it except one. Go on. The first time you took control, you loused it up. That's never happened to me before. It's never happened to me before either. I thought I explained. No, you didn't, not really. It's not that I don't trust you, but if you run out of time, I'm in bad trouble, right? You have a point, friend of two parts. But you can count on at least twenty more weeks. What caused that first fumble? Silence. All right. Here's a worse one. Conjugation? The silence clicked off into abandonment. Call it? A few moments later, he replied, Here, friend of two parts. I don't want to embarrass you, Collett, but I feel I have a right to know. There practically isn't a race in the whole confluence that doesn't have strong emotions on such functions. Humans are no exceptions. Ray, I was on the verge of accepting a relationship when Proken called me for this assignment. I thought about it very hard for a long time and decided it would be best to wait. Do you understand now? Not exactly. I've never had a post-conjugal partner, but I understand there is a difference. Collett was amused. Yes, indeed. What caused that fumble? I was thinking too hard about someone else. That preoccupation is gone now, so there will be no further difficulty. Except that you're maybe a bit more nervous and sensitive than you used to be. The symbiote conceded. Maybe. Aren't you afraid? Of what? Dying? No. Disillusion of personality at the proper time and in the proper way is not frightening. It frightens me, Yost admitted. Since he'd probed so deeply into Collett's privacy, at least he could share his own private fears. He asked, where does a dissolved personality go? Is death the end? And if it is, does that mean that the whole frantic churning of life is meaningless? Is there a god to receive our souls? Or does the concept of soul have any reality? Does life have any meaning? Does death have any significance? It won't matter how long I live. Death will always frighten me. I am sorry. Yost read true sympathy in that, but also the ever-present refusal of the Ballatine to discuss any aspect of theology. They wouldn't even go so far as to assert that humans or any other species need not be frightened. The closest thing to a statement on theology that anyone had ever gotten out of a Ballatine was that friend of two parts appellation, and that was never really explained or discussed either. Yost was not surprised when Collett retired for the rest of the afternoon, refusing to engage in any conversation. As dusk fell and the town lit up with torches, hearth fires, and candles, Yost went in search of the local art gallery. Harnuit's art was not connected with the religions, and the Harnuiti didn't decorate everything in sight. They reserved their efforts for items called tapestries, displayed only in public art galleries. Yost found the capital city's gallery, down a narrow, dingy alley lined with tiny shops that overflowed onto the dung-paved ground. Across the end of the alley, two crude wooden doors opened in an unadorned wall, spilling a soft yellow radiance on the jumbled merchandise. Entering the flickering shadows, Yost dropped a coin in the metal box chained to a post and clasped his hands behind his back in the local gesture of concentrated reverence. The gallery was a single, large, low-ceilinged room divided into compartments by opaque draperies suspended from the insect-infested rafters. The first compartment opened directly before the door, and Yost nodded appreciatively at the way the clean black draperies focused the attention on the display piece hung across the end of the compartment. The tapestry was a rectangle, Yost estimated about six by seven feet, and it consisted of thousands of brightly colored translucent beads strung on a transparent fiber and woven into a richly detailed abstract design. By the dancing light that filtered through the tapestry, Yost distinguished several complementary shapes among the tightly packed beads. At first he thought he was on the wrong side of the hanging, but then he noticed that the light came from lanterns set in a very narrow space behind the tapestry and backed by a shiny material. Stepping back to admire the effect, 
Yost said silently, This looks like something you could appreciate, Collett. I shall reserve judgment, friend of two parts. The form seems to have possibilities. Surprised, the human said, Are you an artist? Not really. A connoisseur, perhaps? Yost sniffed. What's that? What? I smell something. Spice? Incense? There are no new olfactory signals of that description originating in your nasal passages. No? Well, that must be what Proken meant when he said Harnwood's art is quasi-olfactory. I suggest we speak to the proprietor of this establishment. Certainly. How do we find him? Walk about. He'll find us. Yost did as he was told, pausing occasionally to examine one or another piece. All of the designs seemed to be abstract, and each had its own scent. The proprietor found him as he was enjoying spiced peaches and brandy. The green-skinned, white-robed figure emerged from the shadowy maze to stand half-bathed in the eerie, flickering light. He seemed to be of a heavier build than the other natives. In a low-pitched, cultured voice, he said, "'Welcome. May I be of service?' Yost sorted himself into the native language and answered, "'Perhaps you can answer a few questions for me. Of course, I know every piece in my gallery.' There is one in particular I've heard about. The Newsnet Interstellar Review called it the Vanilla Mint Tapestry. Do you know it? Of course. However, you will not be able to view it. It has been stolen. No. We have taken the matter to the Interstellar authorities. However, we despair of ever getting it back. Was it that significant? You have so many excellent ones here. What could make any single one that important? Each one is unique. Until its theft, the vanilla mint gave much joy to many of my clients. Was it an item of great value? How does one measure the value of the unique? Perhaps the artist could be persuaded to sell me another one, like the vanilla mint. Could you tell me where to find him? Tapestries are not sold, sir. However, the creator of the vanilla mint is a novice, so I doubt that he has anything else as significant. Then how do artists make a living if they don't sell their work? Their hermit colonies are supported from the public treasury. Oh, then the creator of the vanilla mint, uh, what did you say his name was? Rogan. He lives in a hermit colony? Yes, of course. And you are the sole agent displaying his work? Yes. What else of his is here? Why, nothing. I told you he is a novice. The vanilla mint is the first of his works worthy of display. That is one reason he is so anxious to get it back. I thought you owned it. Oh, no. How could it be possible for a work of art not to be owned by its creator? I'm merely his legal representative. I see. I'm still curious about the creation of these tapestries. Would it be possible for me to visit Rogan's studio? I don't think so. Even I go there very seldom. It was on my last visit that I discovered the vanilla mint just being finished. He's certainly not had time to do anything significant since, and I assure you his previous work is quite worthless. If it's that worthless, perhaps he could be persuaded to part with one or two examples. I should like to visit him. It would be a very difficult trek through perilous and unpleasant desert, and I assure you quite fruitless. I've already come a long way, and... It's my time, my discomfort, and my curiosity, sir. If you could give me some clue how to find him, I would be most generously grateful. Yost allowed his hand to drift toward a pocket suggestively. Well, since you put it that way, I can do even more. I'll arrange for a guide. My own personal servant, Graumain. He's very reliable and a willing worker who can make your journey less unpleasant. That kindness will be unnecessary. I'm sure I can find someone. Oh, no, trouble. In fact, I insist. I couldn't take your servant from you, even for a short time. And he thought I could do without your spy. Oh, it's no hardship. I have others. Truly, I insist. They dickered over the price for several minutes and finally agreed that Graumain would assemble transport and camping equipment and meet Yost at the Inn of the Half Sun in two days. As they walked back to the inn through the teeming dark streets, Collett said, I believe Graumain may be in error. What? 
subtlety at last. I know he is. But how could I have refused? A good question, but utterly academic. We shall have to keep an eye on this, Graumain. You know, we shouldn't get too melodramatic. Central intelligence is out chasing thousands of clues on an important theft of a something or other which we aren't cleared to know about. Which you aren't cleared to know about. Oh, well, I guess one of us had to know. Anyway, they wouldn't have sent two amateurs on a really hot trail. They're not looking for the tapestry. It's just that it disappeared coincidentally. So I think we ought to stop seeing spies everywhere and just enjoy ourselves. I don't know about you, but I could use a vacation from chasing will of wisp theories about the evolution of intelligent life. A ride through picturesque desert country sounds inviting. Friend of two parts. Yost recognized the grave tone he'd come to associate with Collett's approaching demise. I'm incapable of enjoying this waste of time. The only reason I'm here at all is that Plokin is an unusually persuasive administrator, and my ancestors owed him a favor. Oh, I know what you mean. Yost couldn't count the times he'd been talked into tackling distasteful or dangerous jobs by the highly persuasive director. But I do hate having to sit here doing nothing for a whole day. So we'll look up our guide and watch the preparations. Fine idea. But first, another meal and a night's rest. You're determined to put some weight on me, aren't you? Not particularly. I'm more interested in putting some weight on me. But you could certainly use some reserve. The next morning found them waiting for Graumain at the caravansary as the smoky light of the half-sun grew slowly into full dawn. Yost stood beside the stone watering trough that occupied the center of the yard and watched the caravansary come to life under the crisp dew of a chill dawn. Discreet questioning of the handlers obtained excellent character references for Graumain, and when the native guide arrived, Yost was reassured by his appearance as well. Graumain was taller than most of the locals, well-fed, and of a healthy green hue. The length of cloth wound about his torso was a clean black, and he had a spring in his step that spelled self-sufficiency. As they watched him organizing transport and supplies, Yost and Collett both agreed he was more intelligent, efficient, and dominant than one expected in a slave. He was scrupulously honest in his dealings, and the fairness and firmness of his prices were unquestioned. When he'd rented a corner stall and hired a boy to clean it and care for the rented animals— Graumain came over to Yost, obviously appreciative that the human had not interfered with his work since introducing himself. Sir, perhaps you could give me some idea of how many maisu will be needed for your baggage. Yost eyed the huge, pad-footed, green-haired beasts with broad, flat rumps, bulging sides, and four spindly legs. They were something of a cross between a water buffalo and a camel, but with the vile disposition of a llama. I believe one will be sufficient for my kid. My master has informed me you require three times the food of an ordinary man. This is accurate? Yes. Then we'll need two maisu for supplies. It's a long way into the desert. With luck, two talu. Yost translated. About three weeks. Three weeks out, three weeks back, and four weeks home. Ten weeks, and they had only twenty. Nineteen and a half. He said, yes, I realize that. I have my own camping equipment, but I'll leave the food and water supplies to your judgment. Graumain looked around the rapidly emptying caravansary. The watering trough was deserted as the sun now shone weakly on it, and the walls surrounding the square stood on their own shadows. The Maisu huddled in their ground-floor stables with their attendants, and the caravan travelers, the few who were laying over for the day— had taken to their second-floor rooms, above the thickest of the animal stench. Graumain said, I'll complete our arrangements this evening, and we'll leave in the morning. Yost nodded. That will do. Of course, he'd check the arrangements. He was no stranger to deserts. The next morning Yost appeared with his bag on his shoulder, dressed in a crisp blue traveling coverall, almost before the nut vendors had fired up their coal basins for the day. He insisted on helping the stable boy load the maisu, and unobtrusively took inventory. The only problem would be water, and everyone he'd spoken to had said there was plenty in the northern desert, if you knew where to look. Yost checked his folding dousing rod, slung it on a chain around his neck, 
and pocketed his purification kit. They were both legal on Harnewit, since they employed nothing more sophisticated than solid-state, integrated circuits and basic chemistry. But some things were best not left to baggage. When Graumain arrived, they shared a quick meal, mounted their Maisu, and departed with the largest caravan Yost had yet seen assembled at the caravansary. The lead Maisu was carrying a boy and two huge ceramic jars of water with skin stretched across their mouths on which he beat out a rhythm. The sound had a musical boyoying reverberation that soon had the Maisu marching in step. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, over and over to a chanted tune that seemed the quintessence of movement. Yost breathed deeply, head high, thoroughly enjoying himself in spite of the dust, ripe dung, chafing crotch, assorted vermin, and depressing lighting. He thrived on strange and colorful experiences, primitive or sophisticated, and he'd certainly been in more miserable circumstances on many occasions, so he was prepared to enjoy an interlude of relative comfort. They followed the caravan for all of the first week, while segments of it split off almost daily to seek their own destinations. Each day the sun became dimmer, and they marched longer into the noon hour. Then one day, as the caravan settled down for siesta, around an oasis that consisted of an adobe-walled well with hand-drawn bucket, Graumain peeled off to the north. Now that it was gone, Yost noticed they'd actually been on a trail of sorts. But here the ground was almost virgin, and it wasn't long before Yost felt the lack of a drummer. The four Maitsu, ahead of him, now marched in random rhythm, and their load swayed sickeningly. They marched through the whole day as the gloom increased toward full eclipse. The sparse desert vegetation became even more scraggly and finally disappeared, leaving the sharp stones with only the wind to grind them to sand. The footing became so bad, the Maisu often refused to put weight on one foot or another in a random pattern of jarring limps. The days passed and Yost found himself relying more and more on Collet to keep his spirits up. Toward the end of the second week, as the watery gloom deepened toward dusk, and the lighting seemed particularly oppressive, he said, This artist's colony is supposed to be under the exact center of the fully eclipsed part of the continent. How do they stand it? You find the lighting has an emotional impact? Well, doesn't it? Not on me. Why? Because human nerve impulse codes aren't my natural aesthetic references. Now, if I were using a friend of one part, I might be able to judge the effect. But I doubt if their eyes could take this light intensity, so I'll never see it other than as a partner to a friend of two parts. Do you regret that? No. Working for C.C., I go places and see things that I'd never be able to experience otherwise. The price is high. Sharing the body of an intelligent creature, a friend of two parts, rather than being master of a domesticated non-entity that never talks back or vetoes or fails to eat enough. Was that a gentle hint? said Yost, unwrapping a nut as his Maisu plodded jerkily behind the others. Not so gentle, Ray. Yost read burbling laughter of embarrassment. I'm starving. So I'm eating. Just be sure this beast doesn't make me motion sick. Have I ever let it do that? No, but there's always a first time. Yost would never forget one particular first time. At least he wouldn't until he delivered his partner safely home. How are you feeling? As well as can be expected for my age. You have nothing to worry about. Nevertheless, I do worry. What do you mean, as well as can be expected? I require more sleep, and I'm always hungry, that's all. It shouldn't bother you. Your kidneys are sufficient for the task. You're growing? Spontaneously, an unavoidable necessity. Yost remembered the course in Ballatine physiology he'd taken nine years ago. He should have reread the text before this mission, but he'd been so rushed, and it would hardly have been polite for investiture. As I recall, the growth curve is unaffected by conjugation. Silence, total withdrawal. Yost felt a panic of abandonment and was instantly contrite. Call it? Here, friend of two parts. Another point. A friend of one part doesn't ask questions. I'm sorry. Partly my fault. Yes, it is unaffected. Then you'll be about double your size by the time we get home. Three quarters. And if we don't make it? Silence. Then Collett seemed to choke on his negation. Please, Yost prompted. It happens anyway, doesn't it? Anguish. God help me, no. Not like that. 
It was the first time Yost had ever known of a ballotine invoking a deity. The overwash of emotion almost knocked him off the Mysu. Call it I'm sorry, but it helps to face facts. Friend of two parts, believe me, I'd die first. If necessary, I'll simply leave you. But it won't be necessary. There's plenty of time. Yost couldn't help wondering if the ballotine would be able to commit suicide at such a point in the life cycle. As he recalled, the text had been vague on the subject. At any rate, he wasn't eager to try divestiture outside of chambers and without the protection of hypnotic conditioning. Yost said thoughtfully, Can God help us? Silence. Yost let the subject drop. A slip or a figure of speech picked up from a lifetime association with humans. He knew he'd draw no further comment from the ballotine, so he applied himself to eating the smoky nut and kept a careful eye on his compass. With Collett's memory, they should have no trouble finding their way back alone, but he was uncomfortably aware that he might be making the trip in true solitude. Through the long, dry, but not uncomfortably hot days, Graumain was the perfect servant. He was quiet, efficient, thoughtful, and industrious. He even made it his business to learn how to set up Yost's tent, and from then on refined his technique until he could make or break camp faster than Yost thought possible. Between a ballotine and such a servant, Yost often reflected traveling in primitive fashion was a real pleasure. Nevertheless, when Graumain announced that the next day would see them at Rogan's, Yost knew a lightning of spirit that only served to underscore the sense of doom from the watery charcoal smoke lighting. He found himself eager to get the job over with and get out of this forsaken land. They made camp for the night beside one of the typical adobe wells that dotted the trail at two-day intervals, and about midnight Yost woke to sharp hunger pains. Call it? Hungry again? Apologies, friend of two parts. I'm consuming energy at an increasing rate. I'll calm your stomach. You need your rest. I'm awake now. You must really be starving. I'll just take a walk, eat a nut, and look at the stars. At least the night sky isn't smoky. All right. Yost felt Collett's embarrassment at allowing his host to feel even slight discomfort. But friend of two parts, make it two nuts. Yost rolled out, thrust two nuts into the glowing remains of Graumain's fire, and scooted back to the tent for a warm coat against the desert night's chill. Dressed, he skewered his nuts on the slender metal rods Graumain had set out for their breakfast, and moved quietly out of camp, lighting his way with the lantern. Keep watch, Collett, so we don't get lost. Presently he found a nice boulder with a seat-like depression, and settled down to munch the warm nut flesh while admiring the night sky. That was another good thing about traveling with the ballotine. No matter what you ate or how much of it, it always tasted magnificent. Ray, let me— Collett commanded sharply as he took control of Yost's head and eyes. Yost relaxed and let the ballotine focus his gaze, knowing that the symbiote had no peripheral blindness. The streak of light across the northern sky was just fading when he found it. Collett said, I couldn't tell if it was a meteor or... or a ship landing, supplied Yost. There's no spaceport over there, only the hermit colony. And Rogam? Oh, bah! This is ridiculous. Send a couple of overly imaginative amateurs to chase... What? What in the universe are we after, anyway? Silent chuckle. Then, let's go back to sleep. I'm not sleepy anymore. I'll dream sinister spaceships. You're exhausted. I guarantee you'll be asleep the minute you zip yourself in. All I do all day is sit on that damn Mysu. Graumain is the one who fights with the contrary beasts. How come I get so tired? Because I'm working hard. Now move before I do it for you. Collett's tone reminded Yost of a soft-hearted parent trying to scold a lovable three-year-old. The valentine wasn't that much his senior. Smiling, Yost replied, climbing to his feet, Don't get tough with me, little partner. I'll starve you. Collett laughed. You already are. Chuckling, Yost made his way back to his sleeping bag. The next day about noon, they topped a final ridge and drew up to survey the hermit colony. The watery gloom threw the desert into a tricky, shadowless perspective, and Yost found it difficult to estimate the size of the crater that cupped the fifty or so huts of the colony. The glare-free lighting emphasized the brilliant colors of the stones that lay strewn about the floor of the crater, but somehow the harlequin patchwork of color lacked any trace of high-spirited gaiety. It wouldn't take much to make it sinister as mysterious spaceships— 
The garishly bright purples, greens, blues, blacks, and reds were mixed with whites and oranges that seemed to glow in the weird light. There were a dozen shades of scintillating browns and two vivid yellows and hundreds of hues he couldn't name. The effect was so grotesque he searched for a harmless commonplace simile. Yes, it looked like a paint laboratory's testing site. He could hardly believe it was natural. And yet he'd read the reports and knew, intellectually, that it was a work of nature, though it looked more like the work of the devil. There were no paths between the rectangular, pastel-colored huts that lay widely spaced among the rocks and around the sides of the crater. A single clean trail led from the rim near them straight across the floor and disappeared halfway up the other side. Yost moved his Mysu closer to Graumain's and said, "'Which house is Rogam's?' The guide pointed a long green finger. "'On the far rim, the pink one.' Collett said to Yost, "'If I'm not mistaken, that's on a direct line between our camp last night and the point where the ship landed, or meteor. To Graumain, he said, well, let's go. Silently, the native led off down the sloping side of the crater and struck a brisk pace along the cleared pathway. Soon they were climbing again, and before long they'd run out of path and dismounted to lead the Maisu the rest of the way up to the rim. From the top of the ridge, Rogam's hut commanded a view of the northern desert plain and all its boulder-strewn barrenness. Yost counted a dozen steep ravines within the first mile. If a ship had landed in that, well, it had probably crashed. And if it had crashed, they'd have heard the explosion, so it must have been a meteor. They circled the pink building and found that the northern wall was composed of a nearly hundred small panes of glass, revealing an interior as colorful as the plain it faced. The hut was filled with tapestries, hung on movable wands, suspended from tangled rigging that concealed the rafters. A native emerged from the depths of translucent veils and approached the door warily. He had a lighter green complexion than Yost had yet seen, and walked with a pronounced limp, favoring his right leg. His garment was a swirl of grays and whites, and when he got closer, Yost could make out what looked like a solid mass of burn scar on his torso and upper arms. When he opened the door, the native ignored Yost and growled tonelessly, I'm not ready to show, go home, and then he slammed the door. Graumain said, wait here, I'll see what I can do. He wrestled the door open and disappeared into the sparkling dimness, leaving the flimsy frame to slam lopsidedly shut behind him. Yost turned to inspect the rocky northern view. The impression of an impending storm was stronger here, even though the sky remained clear blue. Presently Graumain called Yost in. They found Rogam covering a large table with an enormous sheet to conceal his unfinished work. Beside the table were large basins filled with the unstrung beads, jumbled together without apparent regard for size or color. He grunted. Well, Graumain said, this is the human I was telling you about. Rogam measured Yost's length, mumbling under his foul breath. The answer's no. Now go away and leave me alone. Yost took a deep breath. He thought, that's why they call it a hermit colony. I'm really very interested in your work. Can't I just... Look around. I might find something over which we could come to some kind of agreement. Yost watched the fire of avarice kindle in those purple eyes and then cool. Rogam said, I don't sell my work. He made it sound obscene. But you do lend it for hanging where it might be viewed by more people. Your contract with the gallery is only for Harnuit. And what is worthless to Harnuit eyes may not be worthless off-world. That might be, he patted his pocket suggestively, Mutually satisfactory? Rogam hesitated, then grunted and turned away. Look, but be quick about it. Yost went to the end hanging and began working his way through the close-packed aisles. It was hard to get the total impression of any one piece, and he rarely found any quasi-aroma. But on the whole, he couldn't see any difference between these and the ones in the gallery. Colet said, This one? What about it? I like it, I think. At any rate, I'd like the chance to judge it in more familiar surroundings. If we are to bargain for any of these, let it be this one. Yost stood back to scrutinize the piece. As all the others, the colors were combined by no rules he knew. But yes, it did seem to have something of the sandalwood and eucalyptus air that Collett favored. Okay, it's all the same to me. He went in search of Rogam and found him seated on the floor, staring out at the eternal desert. I found something. As Rogam unfolded his crippled frame and struggled to his feet, Yost looked around. Where's Graumain? Prospecting. Yost shrugged. 
The gallery certainly had other artists in the colony. He led the way to Collett's choice and began the bargaining. He set his offer high enough to spark greed, but low enough not to seem too eager, and let himself be jacked up twenty percent. Then he held firm, refusing to be put off. He'd learned a thing or two from watching Graumain. Finally, Rogam grabbed one of the ropes hanging over the overhead pulleys and yanked. The eucalyptus tapestry rolled up as it fell to the floor. So take it and get out of here, and don't come back. Rogam stalked off into the obscuring layers of tapestries, leaving Yost to gather up his prize. The tapestry proved surprisingly light to his off-world muscles, and it took him only about fifteen minutes to lash the roll securely and carry it out to the Mysu. Graumane still hadn't appeared, so he tied it to one of the beasts, and then stood gazing out at the weird landscape, breathing deeply of the faint breeze. Well, partner, you've got your tapestry. What else have we got? I'm not sure. Let's take a walk around the building. What for? Come on, I'm in no mood to argue. All right. Yost suppressed a little thrill of alarm at his symbiote's shortness. Yost knew no Ballantyne would ever force a partner to do his bidding, but by the same token Yost was morally obligated not to deny a partner freedom of movement, since the Ballantyne had no other alternative. But considering Collett's condition, Yost wasn't sure just how far he could trust him if it came to a real clash of wills. He mooched all around the pink building and then leaned on the side wall again, gloomily examining the northern desert. Well, the building is about twenty percent larger outside than inside, is it? The studio had all the necessary living accommodations, and there were no obvious doors on the back wall. Yet there is an additional room. Probably storage. Probably. But storage of what, do you think? Well, all I can think about is a sense of doom radiating from that devil's rock garden out there. You know, it's stronger here than anywhere farther south. Truthfully, I hadn't noticed. It doesn't affect me. Let's go ask Rogam about his back room. Do we have to? He's already thrown us out. Friend of two parts, this will undoubtedly be my last mission, and my last report. I don't want that report to be any less perfect than my previous ones. And an uninvestigated observation leads to an imperfect report. Let's go. All right, but the sooner we get out of this gloomy atmosphere, the happier I'll be. He pushed his shoulder away from the wall, dusted the chalky pink dust off his coverall, and picked his way around to the door. There was nobody in sight, so he went in, checked the work area, and then poked among the hangings. He nosed along the back wall of the studio, and near the center, behind several thicknesses of tapestry and a clutter of dusty art supplies, he found an ordinary-looking door. You see, call it just a storage room. He pushed open the door and called, Rogan, before he noticed the strange quality of light. It was a steady white light, a fluorescent. And the room was no Harnuit storage chamber. It was a gleaming, confluent-style, lock-and-key installation. One end was an efficiency apartment. Down the center was a neat Rotsectronics workbench, and along the walls were rows of storage cabinets and lockers. Near the workbench, the door of a floor safe stood up on its hinges. Bent over some apparatus on the workbench were Rogam and an off-worlder. For twelve heartbeats, Yost stood there, staring at the pair, while they stared at him. The off-worlder appeared to be some mixed breed from the Sirius Cluster. He had blue skin and a bald head, but his eyes were golden, pupilless orbs set behind two nictitating membranes. His arms looked strong, but his tunic revealed a contoured back as if vestigial wings had grown there. No telling what other odd combinations were hidden under his grey jumpsuit. Yost found one corner of his mind, bemusedly returning to his lifelong professional problem. How could it be that so many different planets throughout the galaxy could develop such similar chemistry that such misogynous interbreeding could occur? The man existed, but it didn't take a scholar to guess that he was the many times illegitimate offspring of a long line of careless prostitutes. Anyone with such a bill was automatically tagged a criminal in modern society, and very often became criminal because of it. The mere sight of the Mixie sent chills of horror through Yost. He felt Collett's impatience as the Ballatine attempted to take control and retreat, but it was too late. The off-worlder's hand came up, leveling a gun at Yost. The gun, like the man, was a bastard, but he had no doubt of its effectiveness. 
One of the Mixie's huge blue fists jerked an order toward Yost's left, the end of the room he hadn't examined. The cage he saw there left no doubt of the Mixie's status. It was a plain, unfurnished cube, about seven feet on the side, and closed in front by a transparent energy barricade, generated by a unit housed in a bulge on one of the side walls. Sanitary facilities consisted of a hole in the back corner. This type of animal display cage had been outlawed five years ago. Now only outlaws had them. Call it. What do we do? Follow orders, friend of two parts. This type of hybrid tends to be very strong and proud of it. They love to use their strength against the society that hates them. And you appear to represent that society. Yost took a deep breath and glided carefully into the cage. His buttocks had barely cleared the sill when the field snapped on with an ear-tingling sizzle. He turned to watch his captors. Rogan was still bent over the Rotsuktronics bench, expertly adjusting some apparatus. He looked up to say to the Mixie, "'What are you going to do with him?' "'I told you to get rid of him. Now you'll have to take care of him until the boss decides if he can be of any use. Let's finish this up so I can get out of here quick.' While Yost watched, they bent to their work as if nothing had happened. Collin, what do you suppose they're up to? Quiet, I want to listen. The Mixie straightened up, dexterously twirling a long filament onto a spool with thick, blunt fingers. Then Yost saw they'd been duplicating a record fiber. The Mixie spoke the native language flawlessly. Now, he said to Rogan, if you hadn't let that fat leech talk you out of the tapestry in the first place, we wouldn't have to go to all this trouble. It wasn't my fault. How was I to know he'd like it? And how was I to know they'd go and steal it right out of the gallery? If I hadn't let him take it, he'd have known something was phony about this studio. Well, somebody sure as hell does. From now on, no more cute tricks with the tapestries. You take good care of that Snoopy character till the boss says what to do with him. He snapped a cover on the filament reel and picked up the duplicate from the bench. I've got to get moving. Check the... Just then there was a clatter as the front door opened, and Graumain's voice called, Rogan, have you seen my off-worlder? Rogam limped out into the studio, calling, No, probably wandered off into the desert to get lost. Had three of those up here last twenty day. Attracts them. Gramain said, Yeah, didn't strike me as the type, though. Never can tell with these weirdies. Won't take long for this guy to starve. Eats three times the rations of an ordinary man and never puts on a bit of padding. Maybe he was sick or something. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Why should he spend so much time bargaining over a tapestry and then just wander off? Sick in the head? Could be. Well, I'm not going to lug that worthless thing back with me. Help me bring it in. Maybe you could make something useful out of it. How much did he give you? Our cut... The door clattered again. The Mixie stood rock steady near the bench with his weapon leveled at Yost, as if it could penetrate the energy barrier. It probably could. He didn't feel like experimenting, so he stood silently as the outer door clattered again, and Graumain called, See you in twelve twenty days! Rogan came back, letting the door swing to behind him. The Mixie said, Well done for a change. He approached the cage, inspecting Yost skeptically. Maintaining the Harnuit dialect, he asked, Who are you? Raymond Yost. Why did you come here? To get a tapestry. Why? I heard they were interesting, and they are. You're a human. It was an accusation and condemnation. Yost didn't answer. The Mixie made a threatening gesture. Well... You might say so. He didn't dare admit to being a pure-blooded, Terran-born human. Who do you work for? Myself. And who else? Just me. The Mixie chewed his overly prominent lips as he glared at every stitch of Yost's trail-worn blue coverall. You're no art collector. Desert travel does that to one. How come you eat so much? The metabolism I was born with demands fuel, just like yours. Yost switched to confluential standard for that, but the Mixie didn't even blink one pair of eyelids. Instead, he asked, "'You got a ballotine?' Levelly Yost replied, "'No,' but he owed his steadiness to call it. The Mixie was silent for several minutes, then he said, "'We'll see about that.' He turned back to the bench, took one of the two spools, and tossed it into a floor safe. His back muscles bulged impressively as he heaved the plug into place and set the lock. Yost noted bemusedly that it was the same ordinary type safe he had in his office. If it was good enough for a criminal, it was certainly good enough for C.C. Yost leaned his back against the wall and slid down to sit on the floor. What do you think he meant? 
There's no way he can detect you, is there? Yost was shaking so badly he didn't see the Mixie drawing Rogam into the studio, saying, Check out front. I gotta get moving. See you in a twenty day. After they'd left, the Ballantine answered his partner. No, there's no way he can detect me. But, well, friend of two parts, all the races of the galaxy have those who are for society as it is, and those who are against it. You mean there are outlaw Ballantines? I wouldn't put it that way. But that is the effect. The fine points of the ethic hardly seem pertinent. Call it your senior agent on this mission. How do we get out of this? Yost was paralyzed by the thought of an outlaw Ballantine entering his body to do battle with Collet. He'd always dismissed such tales as the nightmares of the ignorant. All Ballantine were so damned ethical. But now an ethic of the outlaw? His partner interrupted his chill thoughts. Now that we have what we came for, we are free to return and make our report. Have you cracked up? Yost felt Collett's laughter before he realized his unfortunate choice of idiom. Fairly bubbling with mirth, the symbiote said, Not yet, friend of two parts, not yet. The successful completion of a mission always has a euphoric effect on me. He sobered. There is much danger ahead, but we are headed home. You keep saying that, but I don't see it. It's in the tapestry, Ray, the filament he used to make the tapestry. It's a recorder fiber. Confluential intelligence was chasing some information that was on a recorder fiber, the kind of information that can be sold. So we've completed our assignment. But what good is it going to do us or anybody? It will take time and luck to get out of here, and more. It will take good timing, but I think we can do it. You still have your dowsing rod and water kit? You have a plan? A few ideas? It all depends on how well he feeds us, and on what? I don't follow you. But you think we'll have enough time? We'll have enough time, if we have enough food. They heard the muffled clatter of the front door, and presumed the Mixie had just left. Call Rogam, and get him to feed us. Rogam! Rogam! Presently the artist limped in. What? Did he leave orders to starve me to death? Rogan looked disgusted and turned back to the studio. I've got work to do. I'll feed you when I get around to it. A corpse doesn't eat very well, or answer questions. The native turned back to his prisoner skeptically, and then shuffled to one of the cabinets to wrestle out a case of service field rations. Cracking it open, he extracted four of the packets and a tube of water. He set them on the sill of the cage and disappeared around the side to push the button. The field extended over the rations, and they were sucked into the cage. Yost said glumly, thank you. As the old man shuffled out of the room, Yost picked up his meal. T.Y.U.'s, he read the labels. Will this do you? Yes, friend of two parts, I believe it will, in sufficient quantity. But only if you eat it. Yost bit off the corner of the flexipack, chewed it, and then sucked on the pasty substance that was supposed to be a complete nutrient to his species. It tasted just marvelous, though he knew without the induced appetite it would be hard to choke down. He polished off all four of the packets before Collet was satisfied. Friend of two parts, I'm going to sleep. Yost didn't argue. The Ballotine needed his sleep for sorting the memories that he would pass on. So Yost settled down to being bored and lonely and scared. The days passed slowly. There were no outside windows, so Yost lost contact with the ebb and flow of the wan sunlight. He didn't regret the loss, particularly. He was accustomed to living under lights, and the blue-white floros didn't cast billows of doom clouds through his thoughts. But Collet became increasingly withdrawn, leaving Yost with nothing to do but feed the fires of his imagination with twigs from the tree of speculation. If the Mixie came back before he escaped, he might bring another ballotine. The uncertainty of what that would mean was more chilling than the thought of dying. But then again he might foil their plans by dying in his cage— the quantity of food was not proving adequate to Collet's appetite. And when Rogan failed to supply the rations, Yost could feel Collet's creeping starvation as a drain on every tissue of his body. In spite of the Ballotine's selfless efforts to limit his consumption and ease Yost's discomfort, the hunger became a kind of feverish nightmare heightened by the fetid closeness of the cage's air. It was during one such bout that Yost sat propped against one featureless wall of his prison, drowning in physical misery. He kept telling himself it was only a matter of lasting out a temporary sentence in hell until Rogam would feed them. But then he discovered he'd been panting until his throat was raw. 
and his limbs were twitching spasmodically. This would never do. He projected urgency into his silent call. Call it! Call it! But there was only the silence of abandonment. Almost sobbing, he tried again. Call it, please! Yes, friend of two parts. The symbiote's tone was quiet and assured. Call it, can't you do something? You can control my nerves. Why don't you damp my sensitivity to this hunger? There was a long silence, and then a projection of infinite sadness. I'm doing all I can, friend of two parts. Remember that I, too, suffer in desperation. I share with you only the most minor portion of that. I dare not do more to alleviate your misery for fear I might injure you permanently. The only thing more that I could do would be to leave you. That sobered Yost. Well, it's not that bad yet, call it. Is it? I had not judged it to be that serious, Ray. But if you find my presence intolerable despite my best efforts, I have no other recourse. It's not intolerable. To himself he thought, damn Valentine ethic. To them death was always preferable to risking damage to a host, and you couldn't argue with him. I guess I just forgot that it's even worse for you. I'm sorry I mentioned it. You need not be sorry. Partnership implies a claim on attention, even if only to, how do you put it, oh yes, to gripe. I understand that this is an activity essential to human mental health. You needn't be so damn snide about it. Ballatine are pretty queer people, too, you know. Now it's my turn to be sorry, friend of two parts. I didn't intend to be derogatory only to make conversation. I thought it might help break some of the positive feedback of the misery cycle. What? Oh, you mean take my mind off my problems? I believe I said that. Well, then maybe you'd care to speculate about what the immediate future holds for us? I hope that Rogam will come to feed us very soon. I hope so, too, but that's not what I meant. I know, friend of two parts, but I'm curiously reluctant to discuss the grimmer possibilities. Then let's not discuss it. Let's drive right to the heart of the matter. Call it. How much time do you have before you must... Well, leave me. The silence lasted so long, Yost was again becoming acutely aware of the throbbing ache of hunger. But finally, Call it said, It's very difficult to say... There are many factors to be considered. Starvation has affected me severely. I estimate roughly six, perhaps seven weeks. What? That's less than half. I'm well aware of that, friend of two parts. And it may not be time enough to complete our mission. Therefore I elect to exercise the prerogative of the senior field agent and tell you all I know of our mission before I reach the point where I might misplace such memories. It's not a great amount of information but it will have to go into our report. But call it, if intelligence didn't clear me. The impatience in the symbiote's reply was Yost's first hint of the nerve-wracking battle the Ballatine must be fighting. They should have cleared you, Ray, but I'm not responsible for the idiocies of desk-bound spy-chasers. Since our lead has turned out to be a hot one, you're entitled to know. What I don't know, they can't extract from me. You won't know anything they don't know already. And it won't make any difference if they know that you know. If we don't get away from here before the Mixie comes back, well, that crowd can be counted on to interrogate to destruction. Yost had contemplated just such a fate so often that he couldn't work up a new horror. Okay, what's the big secret? In a word, Rotsuck deposits, precise coordinates of nineteen deposits on ten planets in the empty wedge— all with S.A. values greater than the richest confluential deposit? Yost whistled. Nineteen deposits of the rarest mineral known to civilization, and all on uninhabited planets, unclaimed by any member of the confluence, and all rich? It could destroy the economy overnight. Rossug would be so cheap that devices based on room-temperature superconditions could be made disposable. Without even trying, he could think of three expensively impractical applications that could become common. And currency values were based on Rutzuk. Yost asked, And that's the information that was on that fiber? Apparently. Unless, of course, they're only involved in some ordinary deal. No wonder intelligence went chasing off in all directions and even borrowing manpower. Do they know the locations? No. It was the most closely kept secret of a private development company. The theft can't be announced without pulling the props out of the market. I can see that. 
Then you can also see that it is essential that one of us get home to file the report? Of course, but I don't see how we're going to make it inside of six weeks. There are no Maisu here in the colony, and we'd never make it back on foot. That is true, friend of two parts. Therefore, we shall have to commandeer transportation. What transportation? Jet assisted Maisu? Our Mixy friend should return next week. Whatever he uses should be suitable. Very nice. But how are we going to talk him out of his own personal ship? Friend of two parts, Collet was contrite. I hadn't intended to ask his permission. You mean just steal? Yost realized how ridiculous his reluctance sounded, but then it hit him. But I thought Ballantyne didn't steal. That was your choice of word, Ray. I had intended to commandeer his ship on an official priority and leave Director Proken to straighten out the legalities. That's his specialty, and I think he owes us something for our trouble. Don't you? We're not leaving the mix he's stranded. He can counter-commandeer our ship and call for his at the pound. Give a philosopher enough paper. I still call it stealing, but it doesn't bother my conscience. There's only one little problem. The Mixie may object to us leaving his cage. I hadn't intended to ask permission to leave. We're both free citizens, and he has no right to detain us. Agreed. I'm all for it. But how are we going to get out? That, friend of two parts, was the problem I was working on when you called me. I'm certain I have the information that will unlock this cage, but I seem to have misplaced it in my recent house-cleaning. Listen, is that Rogam coming now? Yost perked up. Yes. Now he could hear the shuffling limp of the native's distorted gait. With starvation postponed, Yost hoped time might pass a little faster. He laid himself out and pretended to faint when Rogam came in. Perhaps that would improve the food service. And it did. It hardly seemed like a whole week later, when Collet roused Yost from his reveries. Friend of two parts, I think it is time for us to leave. You still haven't told me how you intend to pull off this miracle. Silence, followed by that grave tone that had come to make Yost so nervous lately. My apologies, Ray, but I have only just located the memory of the final steps. Well, then, let's go. What do we do first? The power pack of your dousing rod will make a fine detonator for our bomb. Get it out and extract the power capsule. Yost fished a little cylinder out of his coverall, unfolded it into a Y, and unscrewed the stem. I don't get it. What bomb? It was an obscure item one of my ancestors read in a chemical safety journal. Now get out your purification kit. Yost dug the palm-sized sack of gelatin out of his shoulder pocket. Before we set off on any escape attempt, I think I'd better— I know, but don't put it down that hole. The TYU rations have provided us with a unique catalyst, which we'll need for our bomb. But first, squeeze half the gelatin out of the packet, and drop the dowsing power pack into the space. Then you can use the stem of the dowsing rod to fill the packet with catalyst. Yost did as he was told, surprised that the semi-solid his bowels produced was nearly odorless and an ashen gray color. The ballotine must have been up to some subtle tricks. Now what? You can locate the cage's generator by tapping along the wall with the dowsing rod's V portion. The rod's circuitry will react to the generator's rotating field. Yost followed directions, and sure enough, the half-dismantled dowsing rod reacted to the generator's fields, giving him a beautiful electric shock that sent him sprawling halfway across the cage. He picked himself up, saying, And why didn't you warn me? Friend of two parts, even Ballatine make mistakes. Fortunately, this wasn't a serious one. May I remind you that the electric shock is more uncomfortable for me than for you? Yeah, well, let's be more careful. Did you mark the spot? would take a ballotine to tell one point from another on that featureless gray wall. Of course, now we'll use the remaining gelatin to attach the bomb to the wall. That gelatin isn't a glue. It won't hold the weight. Mixed with a little dilute uric acid, it makes a fair plaster. Working with mounting skepticism, Yost said, What's going to set this thing off? When you poke the V portion of the rod into the force field barrier, the generator will hit the resonating frequency of the power pack. Are you sure it won't hit my resonating frequency first? And remember, humans aren't explosion-proof. Are you sure this won't kill us? 
sure enough to stake all our lives on it? Yost thought all our lives. By Collett's count, that was three. One human and two Ballatine infants. He shut up and worked grimly. The ship would probably ground any minute, and they'd have to be gone before Rogom and that Mixie got back, or they'd surely be finished. It should be easy enough to get lost in the night desert, but then how would they find the Mixie's ship and all those rocks? The explosion deafened Yost and stunned him almost senseless, but his body was up and moving before the reverberations had died. Making a supreme effort to collect his wits, Yost wrested control from the ballotine and dug in his heels. Call it, wait! What do you know about safe cracking? Nothing, friend of two parts. Let's go. We don't have much time. How much time? Perhaps fifteen minutes, but I can't guarantee that. I'm only guessing he'll cut through the customs, satellites, midnight blind spot. Yost knelt by the floor safe and examined it. Even at close range it looked just like the one he had in his office, and they had a reputation for being temperamental, especially when installed horizontally. Friend of two parts, the Mixie might have a surveillance neutralizer on his ship. He could come down at any time. I don't think so. He was in an awful hurry to get out of here. I think he was trying to make rendezvous with a hole in the customs net. Now that he was out of the cage, the heady aroma of cool, fresh air was going to his head. He was a man, and he was going to act like one. He spun the dials on the safe door and began thumping on the mechanism here and there. Ray, if they find us here, they'll surely kill us. The mission, exactly. Yost grunted as he pounded his way through the circular rim of the plug. The mission comes first. If that tape contained Rutsuk locations that intelligence doesn't have, we've got to bring it back. If it doesn't, we've got to know, because we don't want to send intelligence on a wild goose chase that could divert enough manpower to let the real thieves get away. But, the Ballotine adopting a reasoning tone, friend of two parts, you'll never open a safe with your bare hands. What do you know about safe cracking? Very little, but I know something about cracking this safe. I do it all the time. He continued pounding the safe in a spiral toward the center. Sweat beaded his brow, and he felt faint from the exertion after his long confinement. You know how it is around Central. You can never get a repair man when you need one. So one night I took the safe repair man out and got him drunk, and he taught me how to open these safes without the combination. It works on mine. Maybe it'll work here. Give me a few more minutes. I can't give you what I don't have. Ray, let's get out of here while we can. I thought you weren't afraid of death. This is not the proper time for me to relinquish personality. I thought you were afraid of death under any circumstances. Well, I am. He spun the four dials in reverse and began pounding them in sequence. Then let's go. To stay here is suicidal. Call it, remember, it was you who wanted to come poking our nose into Rogom's back room. You said you didn't want to file a faulty report. If we don't get this tape, it'll not only be a faulty report, it'll be an inconclusive one. At the moment I'm more afraid of Proken than I am of the devil. After a short silence, Call it said, I guess I don't understand humans as well as I thought I did. Nor do I understand ballotines. Is your own personal survival more important than this tape? No, not really. Then kindly stop my hands from shaking. I've got to adjust these dials. Collett said nothing, but Yost's fingers steadied and his breathing eased. He turned each of the four gently clockwise, past the zero and back to zero. When the fourth dial registered zero, Yost stood and twisted the handle set flush with the plug's surface. Then he heaved, feeling the ballotine add to his strength. He'd pay for that drain on vital resources later, but it would be worth it. He got the plug up on its hinges and knelt to rummage in the hole. It held only three fiber reels. He stuffed all three into his pockets and said, Let's go. You guide. My night vision is lousy. Crouched low, the ballotine guided them through the dark studio. He snatched up the rolled tapestry lying near the door and was out into the night, heading into the northern wilderness. Black boulders hulked on all sides, and tiny pebbles rolled and crunched underfoot. The stars decorated the moonless sky, but shed no light to see by. Yost knew that the ballotine had placed his own light-sensitive tissues between the rods and cones of the human retina, and could see perfectly now that the yellow sun was gone. Of course, the boulders wouldn't be surrealistic color splashes in the infrared. Finally, chest heaving, they crouched between the two large boulders to watch the clear sky. Okay, said Yost. Now what? If my time sense isn't too badly warped, 
Our friend is due to ground any second. Watch carefully. We must get the bearing exactly right if we are to pick up our ship before he discovers we've left. We'd make better time without lugging this tapestry along. Correct. But we may need it. Hang on to it. All right, but I can't imagine what we might need it for. Perhaps that is for the best friend of... There. Yost's head whipped around to follow the fire streak to ground, and almost before the after-image had faded from his retina, they were moving toward it, weaving through the black shadow of the moonless night, but always progressing toward the invisible landing field, in spite of countless detours. Eventually they crept to the edge of a ravine, and looked down the rock-strewn slope to a clear floor, just large enough for the one-man scout that stood silently on its struts. It was an aerodynamically veined, missile-shaped, surface-to-surface scout. The flat expanse of the vest pocket landing field was illuminated by a circle of glowing panels that cast a soft green luminescence on the underside of the ship and provided landing grid services of a sort. It appeared to be deserted. Friend of two parts, I recognize the model, and I have the skill to pilot it, but I must retire now to locate all the memories. Do you think you can get us inside? Leave it to me. Yost hefted the tapestry and made his way down the slope, bracing himself against the loneliness that struck as Collett withdrew. He watched the ship for a while, circling outside the perimeter among the boulders, trying to decide if the Mixie were still inside. Finally, he dashed under the ship's landing gear and attacked the hatch. Much to his surprise, it opened to the third standard combination he tried. He guessed that a professional thief wouldn't rely on fancy locks because he knew how simple they were to open. Suspiciously, Yost climbed into the brightly lit interior, pulled the tapestry up behind him, and dogged the hatch so that it couldn't be opened from outside. Then he prowled the empty compartment with a heart-racing caution until he completed a thorough inspection from drive to pilot's couch. He seated himself at the controls, secured the webbing, and surveyed the instruments. Very similar to what he knew, but a much older model. Not as many auto-circuits. Friend of two parts, allow me. Yost yielded to the ballotine, and in a neat twelve minutes they were space-born, hyper-light, and headed home. Yost had to admit he couldn't have done as clean a job. Race memory had some advantages. He said this was almost too easy. Ray, Collett reproached, there was nothing at all easy about it. I'm living on nervous energy, and if I don't get some nourishment very soon, you're going to have real trouble. Yost freed himself and rummaged about the tiny galley. While he prepared a meal, he munched on a few packets of rations and tasted everything that was open. The Mixie wasn't a very imaginative chef, but a hungry ballotine will make anything taste delicious. When he'd seated himself before a hot meal, Yost said, There's enough here for the four weeks it'll take to get home. We going to make it? The gravity was back as the ballotine replied, I honestly don't know, friend of two parts. If I don't make it, you'll deliver our report. There must be something I can do to help. Nothing except eat well. If I somehow improvise a nutrient bath, friend of two parts, I will not allow that to happen. Death is preferable. Before I left, I saw my conjugal brother safely through fission, so my duty to my line is discharged. Only my personal survival is at stake, and I do not wish to survive in that manner. Do you understand? Not really. Or maybe I do, I don't know. Yost thought about it for a few minutes. For a ballotine to fission prematurely and without conjugation would mean that the children would be the social equivalent of bastards, and they would probably have some sort of handicap, possibly too weak to survive. Yost remembered that overwash of violent emotion he'd gotten from Collis in the desert. If the ballotine felt so strongly about it, it must be worth a life. Yes, Collis, I think I do understand. Then there is something you can do, friend of two parts, yes? Hang the tapestry in the sleeping quarters, and then go to sleep. You're going to be very tired soon. This time Yost wasn't inclined to argue. If his partner could derive some comfort from the tapestry, the least he could do was to hang the thing. The minutes mounted to days, and the days to weeks. Yost spent a lot of time drowsing or exercising. Collett came less and less often to talk, and seemed lethargic and mentally disorganized. Cooking was a hobby of Yost's, and with six meals a day to prepare, he kept busy enough. When he wasn't busy, he found himself worrying fruitlessly. There was absolutely nothing he could do. 
In an effort to dispel the gloom, Yost took out the fiber reels he'd stolen and played them through the ship's main view screen. The first was a cryptic list of names and numbers, possibly a payroll, but to whom? The names were some sort of code. The second proved to be even less interesting. It contained nothing but binary digits. The computer identified it as a standard root tape to a local pleasure planet. But the third, it also was mostly numbers, but even Yost could see that it was a list of coordinates for ten planets and longitude and latitude listings for nineteen different sites. Using the excitement that Discovery generated, he composed their report. He made it completely detailed and scrupulously accurate, and when he'd finished, he took several days to polish it. Finally, he affixed his signature to the completed document and then called Collett. It took several tries, and when Collett finally answered, he was groggy. Friend of two parts, you want me to read and sign the report? Yes, at least that gets the formalities out of our hair. There was a long pause, as if the symbiote were laboring to think clearly. Then he said, I'm afraid my signature would be quite meaningless at this point. I trust you. Meaningless? Why? I'm... Another long, labored pause, then sharply, Ray, go lie down on the bed. What? I just got up. It's almost time to eat. The Ballatine's reply was weak, and Yost thought a bit ragged. Don't argue. Go. I haven't got... Yost felt Collett's mental gasp. Something was very wrong. Yost climbed to his feet and moved gingerly to the sleeping compartment, as if afraid that a sudden jar would dislodge a delicately poised disaster. He lay down on his back and said, There, is that better, Collett? Look at the tapestry. Turning his head, Yost examined the hanging. At Collett's request, he'd hung it in front of a glow panel so that something of the gallery's backlighting effect helped bring out the sandalwood and eucalyptus aura. The glistening beadwork was all swirling color and sparkling fire. The shades were dark, mostly reds and browns, but with black and gray patches, working into an optical illusion of three dimensions. Almost Yost could see why Collett liked it. It did remind one strongly of Collett's vesting chamber. Then Yost felt the familiar soothing relaxation taking hold. He shook himself and blinked hard at the ceiling. No, friend of two parts, look at the tapestry. I can't. It's too good. I. It can even trigger my hypnotic conditioning. I know. That's why we brought it along. Ray, please, don't make this any harder than it has to be. Suddenly suspicious, Yost said, Make what harder? Collett said in throbbing sadness overlaid with determination, I must leave you, Ray. You've been a good partner, and I dare not risk staying with you longer. No, Collett, what's the matter? I thought you had another two weeks at least. I'm not sure, friend of two parts. My judgment is slipping badly. I almost caused an injury to your brain just now. It was only luck that saved you. I'm becoming clumsy, awkward, and dangerous. I sense already the beginnings of disintegration. I can't tell if there are hours or days yet remaining, but I can't risk damaging you. Now, will you look at the tapestry and try to let yourself relax? It will be all over very quickly. No, call it. Look, you estimated four weeks ago that you had six, maybe seven weeks. We've been eating pretty well lately. Maybe you don't feel well, but you said yourself you can't trust your judgment. Why not trust your original estimate? We'll be home in a few days with a whole week to spare. Hang on a little longer. Take it one day at a time. I'm sure you can make it. Call it lectured tightly. Now that food is plentiful, the starvation-stimulated growth is accelerating. I cannot tell by exactly how much, nor can I predict the exact moment when I must leave you before I lose the power to do so. Divestiture is not simple, friend of two parts. My purpose would not be served if you were to die as a result of my clumsiness. Call it. We've beaten the odds fantastically so far. We're riding a streak of luck— I know it won't run out on us now. How terribly tragic to throw your life away for nothing. How horribly final and irrevocable is death. Very quietly, the Ballantine said, That is also true for you, Ray. You've told me how much you fear that ultimate end. I can't ask you to face that, or worse, life imprisoned in a useless body. It won't come to that. Which of us is in the better position to judge? You just admitted that your judgment is faulty right now. But mine is the same as ever. 
and I say don't panic. Wait. Life is a treasure that cannot be replaced. Fight for it. Your fear of death renders your judgment faulty, friend of two parts. You fear it so much you're unable to believe that it can happen to you. This is a typical human trait, I understand. It allows you to take illogical risks in the face of danger. You demonstrated that you have that blindness in full measure when you stayed to open the Mixie's safe. Yost suppressed a thrill of triumph. He succeeded in drawing the Ballatine into conversation. Argument was the Ballatine racial weakness. I was right, wasn't I? I did get the thing open, and the tape was of the Rutsick deposits, and we did get away. That, friend of two parts, is utterly irrelevant. The probability of success was unacceptably low. I can see you're no gambler. Very true. And I do not propose to gamble with your life. Damn! Yost thought hard. Then he said, But it's my life, and my right to gamble with it. What have you got to lose? Maybe you don't fear death, but some ways of dying are preferable to others. Also true, but you do fear death. But death is the inevitable destiny of all life. I must face it one day. Haven't I the right to choose my own way of dying? Would you rob me of the right to find the circumstances which would give my death meaning and give me the courage to face that ultimate fear? You surprise me, friend of two parts. I had no idea the average human could plumb such depths of the ethic. Yost didn't object to being called average. He knew the Ballatine was comparing him to the great human philosophers, from the Syrian Tautarch clear back to Aristotle. He said, But that doesn't answer my question. Do you have the right to rob me of choice? Very slowly, as if deliberating each word, Collett said, It is not I who robs you of right. In this case, you are assuming a right which the ethic does not grant you. But I'm human. I don't live by the ethic. You have labeled yourself an agnostic, and you speak like a philosopher, yet you claim not to subscribe to the ethic. Then, from what do you derive your morals? Have you considered what could happen if it were known that a ballotine had caused the death or injury of a friend of two parts? On what grounds do you claim the right to take that risk? Yost had to admit that Collett had him there. If the ship parked itself in orbit over Central, and his body were discovered, a thorough autopsy would be mandatory. They'd certainly discover the cause of death. The Ballotine's relationship with every other intelligent species was based on absolute trust. One incident, no matter how voluntary, would destroy their usefulness as partners and put a serious dent in Central's resources. It might even destroy the stability of the confluence. Being so huge and diverse, the confluence was a rickety political structure at best. Deprived of partners, could Central's agents hold it together at all? Yost didn't know. But somehow deep inside he knew that if something were right for society but wrong for the individual, it could not possibly be the correct course. And wasn't that a moral judgment? He started talking, not quite sure what he was going to say. You subscribe to a system called the ethic, which focuses on relating the individual to society. The good of society is the ultimate goal, and all actions and beliefs of the individual must be structured to that goal. Ballatine society bases its morals on the ethic. Such systems were not unknown to human philosophers. I think most humans consider such ideas as lofty goals full of praiseworthy idealism. They consider the ethic a standard of excellence. But I don't know any humans who actually live by such principles, and I don't know anyone who loses any sleep over their failings. The people I've grown up with gave me my morals. You see, Ballatines derive their morals from the ethic, but humans seem to do it, at least in practice, the other way around. We derive our ethics from our morals. But where do our morals come from? The segment of human society from which I come has a moral system based on an ancient, monotheistic religion. I've never considered myself a member of any religion, but I've accepted the morals of the religions most prevalent in my environment. All those religions are basically designed to help man deal with the racial fear of death. We all have a great emotional need to know what lies on the other side of the black curtain. You're right, Colin. We can't really conceive of personal disillusion. I suppose that looks pathologically egotistical to you, and maybe it is, but so is our moral system. Our religion is focused on the relation of a man to himself and to God, not to society. 
We're more interested in guiding the individual to right action so that ultimately he can stand in front of his maker with pride. I think, Collett, that I'm intellectually an agnostic, but emotionally, where it really counts when it comes to actually making a moral judgment, I do believe in a creator, and I can't believe that the creator would want a man to do wrong just to continue a social order. I don't know where that belief comes from. It may be irrational, illogical, and unethical, but nevertheless it is my firm conviction and I can't go against it. I suppose if there is no creator, no God, then the whole fabric of morals by which I've lived simply disintegrates. But I don't know. I have no way of knowing. If God exists or is merely the figment of our imagination, I don't have the intellectual faith of a religious person to sustain me. Therefore, I have the right to face death in whatever way seems meaningful to me. I choose to risk my life to save a life. Such risks are considered morally right among humans. Can you convince me that God does not exist, that our moral system is completely wrong? There was a long pause, but Yost didn't sense the total withdrawal he'd expected. Finally, Collett said, Does your moral system give you the right to impose your values on another who does not subscribe to the same system? Without hesitating, Yost said, Yes, I'm afraid it does, Collett. I told you our morals were based on religion. And it's a proselytizing religion. Most humans would deny it these days, but when the chips are down, we really believe we have the one and only right. But in a way, you really do share our values. You don't want to die like this. I'm not trying to save you from the proper death you seek. The only way you could convince me that I'm wrong is to prove to my emotions that God doesn't exist. The long silence showed that he'd made the Ballatine really think. Eventually, Collett said, You refuse to cooperate with divestiture unless I can prove God doesn't exist? I believe I said that. If I attempt to leave without cooperation, your sanity would certainly be forfeit. I think that if I insist, you will cooperate. Does the ethic allow you to take that risk? No, but neither does it allow me to remain with you. So we're both reduced to a choice between evils. A very sticky moral choice. Shall we adjourn to the galley while you think about it? You've made up your mind? Yes, apparently I have. I fear that no Ballatine will ever understand human psychology. You realize, of course, that if I leave without your cooperation, and you are rendered insane, it's the same as if I didn't leave, and you die? Yes, I have you over a barrel. A very colorful image, but somewhat inaccurate. When Collett's silence lengthened, Yost got up and went in search of a meal. What he was doing scared him more than all his imagined tortures at the hands of the Mixie. He hadn't planned on it. It had just happened. It was another one of those things a man just had to do, scared or not. Again the days began to pass, but ever more slowly. Yost spent many hours alternately arguing with and encouraging the Ballatine. He used every trick of Ballatine psychology he'd ever heard of, and even invented a few new ones. He knew that if Collett hadn't been suffering from disorganization, he'd never have held off even six hours. But six days later, the planetfall alarm went off. Yost was resting at the time, and Ballatine was in a long period of total withdrawal. Yost clambered up to the control room and threw himself into the pilot's couch. Collett, wake up, partner! We're home! What? Home! Where the devil did they hide the radio? We can't sit up here in orbit and wait for the tugs. Oh, Yost felt the groan as if Collett was pulling himself out of a feverish slumber by main force of will. Let me... You all right? No, the Ballatine snapped. I'm not all right and haven't been for days. I only hope I can still pilot this thing. Let me... All yours. Yost watched his hands fly as Collett worked the radio, got Ballatine central, and rattled off a command in his own language, ignoring the painful stretching of Yost's throat. The speaker snapped a crisp reply as Collett guided the ship down into the emergency berth near the gleaming gold Ballatine dome, nestled among the towers of the sprawling CC complex. As soon as they had touched down, Collett threw the lock seals to open and relinquished control of their body with the sluggishness that scared Yost. Friend of two parts, go down to the lock. Someone will meet you. Do as he says. Hurry. Yost moved. 
As he approached the lock, a friend of one part, undoubtedly guided by a ballotine, beckoned him urgently to follow. They descended three levels, and then hit a large main corridor lined with plush hangings, vague in the dim red light. The three-foot-tall anthropoid friend of one part sped along, never looking back. Yost stumbled and nearly fell as a strange sensation twisted his guts. Collett said, "'Hurry, Ray, it has begun. There are, at most, only minutes left before I can no longer accept—' Suddenly they came to a large ornate door that flew open at the ballotine's touch, and they were on the main floor of the vesting chamber. His guide scampered between the room-sized cubicles and finally opened one of the doors. Beckoning Yost on, the ballotine disappeared into the dim interior. Yost entered and stood surveying the fission chamber, wondering what to do. It was well upholstered and richly hung with soft velveteen, and was very dim even by ballotine standards. In the center of the carpeted floor was a pool of crystalline fluid— lit from below by a dim red light. Yost could see the silhouette of a very large, amorphous ballotine writhing strangely in the fluid nutrient. He'd never seen a ballotine undulate like that. Hurry, said the guide, lie down beside the pool here. Confused, Yost stood dumbly, unable to relate to the scene before him. The friend of one part took his arm and guided him gently into place, draping his arm deep into the warm, syrupy liquid, where it was promptly engulfed by the the gooey softness of flaccid ballotine flesh. Within him a crawling, creeping, seeping withdrawal made him choke on a scream. He struggled to rise, but the ballotine friend of one part was holding him down. Then he knew what was wrong. The unusual entryway hadn't triggered his conditioning. No velvet mystery, no velour hangings, no incense. He said, my... He couldn't control his throat. He tried again. Uh, he gagged. The friend of one part placed a hot, calloused hand on Yost's forehead, fingers gentle but firm. Easy, Mr. Yost. Call it doesn't have much time. Relax. Fix your eyes on the ceiling and relax. The valentine's voice droned on, a deep crooning that blended with his hypnotherapist's tones. Gradually he found himself letting go, falling into the limbo of complete trust. But it was different. He didn't go completely under. He could still feel the weird symphony of sensations— but it no longer sent him into a panic. The crawling continued for an eternity. He heard himself whimper as he lost visual and auditory contact, and then gradually his senses cleared, and there was only one thread of contact left. Dizzy, he almost surrendered consciousness before he heard Collett say, "'Thank you, friend of two parts, and good-bye. There is no way to disprove that which is. God does exist.' Yost succumbed to oblivion. And when he swam up to consciousness again, he wasn't sure if he'd heard that last. Had he imagined it? But if not, what did it mean? He propped himself up on one elbow and looked into the pool. Four red and black veined ballotine floated quietly in the crystal fluid. Two were smaller than the other pair, but they seemed alive and well. Yost said, wiping a tear off the corner of his eye, Thank you, friend of two parts. Introduction to Space-Time Arabesque I swore when I started this book that there would be no ecology stories in it. In a philosophic sense, I am deeply troubled by some aspects of the ecology movement. I do not hear in too many of its spokesmen a concern for fundamental human liberty. Too often it seems to me that the solutions being offered are potentially as devastating as the original problem. What shall it profit a man if he gains fresh air and loses the right to breathe? Sworn oaths aside, there are two ecology stories in this collection, Zena Henderson's There Was a Garden and Quinn Yarbrough's Space-Time Arabesque. Quinn has published a couple of dozen short stories and several novels, including Talent and Moon and The Time of the Fourth Horseman. Two more, Hotel Transylvania and False Dawn, are scheduled for publication in 1978. Quinn is also a serious musician, and is at work composing a suite of songs called Il Magnifico, for tenor and strings, with a text taken from the poetry of Lorenzo de' Medici. One final note on space-time arabesque. Despite appearances, it is the most carefully proofread story in the book. Space-time arabesque, a cautionary tale, by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough. With ponderous speed the stagecoach lumbered over the dusty plain pursued by the painted, befeathered hostels. "'Why the hell couldn't have been Indians?' complained the shotgun rider as he poured lead into the howling mob behind them. 
Bullets had proven ineffective, and it wasn't easy melting down his ammunition in a frying pan atop a wildly careening coach. It was not a good day for the shotgunner. Yeah! yelled the driver as he snaked his whip over the ears of the horses. The horde at their back was drawing nearer and looking uglier and weirder all the time. Crevasse ahead, warned the shotgunner, who had pulled up splinters from the roof and was seeing what he could do with improvised flaming arrows. Aside from setting the coach afire, not much. A creature remarkably like a spoon-billed dinosaur regarded the coach with dim curiosity as it rattled past. The driver stoically ignored it, tugging heartily on the reins, tethering the wheels precariously over the brink, jarred back to safety. In the stage's gritty wake, unheeding, the savages went down the yawning maw of the canyon wall, and just as unheedingly, up the other side. Consarn it! The shotgunner stomped on his hat as he scowled at the bounding backs of their tormentors. I thought we had him for fair that time. Not today. The driver knew what he was talking about. Any day that featured fissures like the one that had gaped beneath them, as the last one had, Bands of whooping, tripedal horrors. Well, those days you just didn't get ahead. What was more, he was over three hours late, and heaven only knew where, and it was certain that Wells Fargo didn't. The last time he'd looked, the sun was happily setting into the south. We're on again, sighed the shotgunner, and added with a lonesome note, It ain't Indians, but at least it ain't them things. And he pointed toward a far rim of the canyon, where the multicolored aliens undulated to wheatles and tweeps played on their own filigreed snouts. Wearily the driver urged his horses on to the south-setting sun. Amid the stiff sighs of brocades and ruff, Sir Walter Raleigh bent his knee to the Queen's grace and presumed upon their long acquaintance with the invitation, and she cared to blow a joint. God's teeth! Hath dashed some? He led her into the galliard, leaning slightly toward her when the movements of the dance allowed. I'll not reveal what thou'lt not share. She considered this, missing one step and wrapping him with her fan for her error. Let us draw aside some little while, my smiling privateer, and have some talk of this. With a gracious inclining of his head in what might be a bow, Sir Walter followed the Queen's grace off the floor. The sweet music of Thomas Tallis floated after them. Now, she declared as they stepped into an alcove, as she gave her farthingale an expert twitch to assure their privacy. Prithee vouchsafe me this intelligence. Where be the stuff? I charge thee on thy honour, and for the love you bear my crown, to make this known to me. It was dangerous to play with good Queen Bess when she got short-tempered, but Sir Walter was ever a bold man. But say the word that will take us from this place, and the secret is thine, good Queen. He grew even more audacious. Sweet lady, heartless lady. She showed the beginnings of a murderous frown. Well do I know the worst of your reputation, else I'll have thought that you do not love me. But listen, he said quickly, changing tactics. Ye now I have it hard by me, and were you but to slip away with me we could to the hind, whilst Drake is off a-wenching, and disport ourselves otherwise. Her shrewd eyes widened a bit as she struggled with her cravings and her position. Stay a while, she said at last, in a voice full of cajolery. On what pretext do I leave me called? from shrill to shuckenness. And I leave this room, t'will be a rare uproar. How's to succeed? Do but command it, and it must be as you wish. Who, he wheedled gently, mine radiant Lady Liege Gloriana be queen here. There's pleasure for you waiting if you but give me the word. All of the weed I brought with me is thine at the asking. And thou know'st it brings so sweet waking dreams. His eyes grew bright and his idle gloveless hand made bold to finger her great sleeve. A beatific smile spread over her rather pointed features. She extended her arm in the sweeping gesture that encompassed the entire gathering. Off with their heads, she commanded serenely. The study was completely draped in pink silk. The walls, the chairs, the curtains that shut out the bright Vienna afternoon, all was pink silk. For that matter, the body of... Richard Wagner was also covered in pink silk. Pink silk was his favorite. Reluctantly he wrenched his mind from the luxurious pageant of his sumptuous daydreams to his dear hatchet-faced Cosima. There were grim realities to be dealt with, 
Ah, the tragedy that genius should have to deal with realities. His friends had had the effrontery to refuse to lend him any more money. So far no one had offered to produce this latest opera, and he was becoming more broke than usual, and the other day the mercer had demanded at least partial payment on the silk. Wagner rose and paced the room, humming furiously off-key to himself his Rembrandt jacket of blue velvet sliding over the pink silk. How unfortunate that this picture must be denied to the world. Finally he sank artistically and unhappily onto the pink ottoman with a towering sigh. There was nothing for it. He would have to sell his patent on the electric tuba. The receptionist had the finest nose a plastic surgeon could make, pert, pretty, and almost natural enough to be real. She was the best advertisement her boss had ever had, and she looked at the tattered, bandaged man who smelled of turpentine. "'Your first appointment, sir?' she asked in her best professional voice, knowing it was, and doing her best to impress him. "'Yes, it is.' His speech was mildly accented. "'You'll find the doctor can work wonders,' she announced, wondering what wonders the strange man required. "'Now, sir, may I have your name, please?' "'It's Van Gogh. G-O-G-H. "'In a laboratory that exists to take care of this sort of thing, "'a young assistant fumbled with panic-stricken digits. "'He had meant no harm. He had been careful.' and it was such a little, new, unimportant world. He thought that a few things might not upset it, but he was wrong. It was so delicate. He twiddled the knobs again. The discrepancy might not be noticed, and he would be safe, but if it was, he would be out of the program forever. A serious threat to an immortal no one had told him that the balance on the tiny worlds was so blasted precise. Why, anything could throw it off. But he was relieved. Just one or two minor adjustments would put it all to rights, and no one the wiser. Everything would be fine as soon as he lined up that impulse with that graph. The fatherly man with the shiny head looked unhappily at the dignified Frenchman and quiet Oriental gentleman who stood with him beside the gigantic map. His hand rested on a flagged pin, tagged Saigon. "'I really am sorry,' he said, and he really was— but you must see that I can't commit this country to a course that might lead to armed conflicts somewhere other than our own continent. Korea proved that. The Frenchman looked at the Oriental, and the Oriental looked at the Frenchman. The Frenchman raised his brows. It wouldn't have to be a real war, he said. Oh, don't worry, the fatherly man said reassuringly, showing them his famous fatherly smile. I'm sure there are countries willing to take you on. Have you considered asking Pakistan? The trouble with crime, reflected the man in the alley, was its fascination. There was a pure, dreamlike intoxication to it, a passion that possessed the intellect as well as the baser parts of man. He toyed with a long surgical knife, hidden in the folds of his ample cape. Ah, the shine of it was hypnotic. It was so pristine, so neat. It was almost a shame to ruin it. Blood, after all, was a messy business. But there it was. He sighed. He shook his head. Pity about those poor women. Messy as well. Always so messy. There was an element of perfection in his murders. First of all, the women had meant nothing to him. They were the refuse of society, and although the papers might scream headlines of shock and capitalize on the horror, most would secretly agree that they had come to their proper ends. They were nothing more than a demonstration a necessary testing of a complicated theory, an experiment which required a control. But what had they been to others was also significant. Their used bodies were the crux of the matter. They had lured men, men who were weaker than he, had succumbed to their lusts rather than their passions, and secretly he felt that there was no harm in ridding the world of garbage. A cab went by in the grey darkness, "'visible for a moment in the fuzzy glare of the streetlights. "'A poorly disguised Bobby got out of it. "'The man in the shadows clucked his disapproval. "'Drawing nearer to the wall a precaution against what might be an untimely recognition, "'the man weighed the alternatives. "'Weighing alternatives was a specialty of his. "'There is no excuse for doing this thing foolishly or excessively,' he said to himself. "'Ergo, consider. It is well past midnight.' No women have gone by, and there are a great many police about. 
Certainly it was awkward. The circumstances did present a greater challenge, but without any genuine accomplishment in the final analysis. All that excitement wasted on poor, stupid, exhausted trollops. With a reluctant sigh, he put his knife away into the heavy folds of his Inverness cape. Now he would change his tactics, since he fully understood about murder. He could now plan other, more interesting killings. Of course, next time he would kill someone important. He ran over his mental list with relish. It would be difficult to pick and choose among so many. Remarkable, he thought, all this ripper nonsense. With a low chuckle, he sucked at his curly pipe as he wandered back toward Baker Street. He trusted that Watson would have tea ready. The red-headed girl in the van of the army adjusted the visor of her helm and pointed across the river to the fortress, held by the English. Above her the lily banner of France flapped listlessly in the sultry air. "'We cannot cross,' said her second-in-command. "'There is no possible way.' It was as if she had not heard. She did not turn, staring across the river, as if sight alone could build bridges. "'If we have faith in the good God, we can do anything. We will reach the other side. We will defeat the English. We will free France. God has said so. It is his promise. To think otherwise is blasphemy. We will but fulfill his world. Her lieutenants looked at each other and shrugged. Perhaps the maid was only a crazy farm girl. Convincing the foolish Dauphin was one thing, but crossing a river at flood was another. We can't do it, ventured the boldest of her men with a silent plea to the others for support. There is always a way with God on our side. God will defend the right. St. Michael and St. Catherine have promised us the victory this day. This was met with silence. The knights were too familiar with the whims of the ineffective Dauphin to rely on his support for long, and this girl could lead them into disaster, and the loss of France to the English. You are doubters of God's power. She turned to them, the shine of her armor making them wink. I say to you that God will help us. I tell you that St. Michael protects us with the sword of righteousness. I say that Jesus walks with the men of France, and the archangels guide our footsteps. Our weapons cannot fail. We have the victory. The river is too deep, they told her. She fairly snorted with indignation. Then, commending her soul to God and St. Michael, she turned a scornful gaze to her soldiers, and with an eloquent twist of her thirteen-year-old head she urged her great war-horse into the river. The valiant animal struggled. He thrashed and strove, and despite the heavy armor he and his rider wore, he did his best to swim. But the current was swift, and the river in deep flood. It was no use. A little beyond midstream, with the French looking on in despair and the English cheering from the walls of Orléans, Horse and rider went down for the third time. They stopped him at the Mexican border, telling him that he was too old for fighting wars. Damn it, he said irascibly. I have my rights. Deny me as you will. I can die any way I like. I want to die for freedom. Still he was refused. I hate the trappings of death. Just let me disappear. No, they said. He coughed, trying to hide the asthma that plagued him. I have nothing left here, nothing of worth, nothing is keeping me. But they sent him back to San Francisco, and poor Ambrose Bierce had to be content with the 1917 Nobel Prize for Literature. Not that he was content, but even he learned to be philosophical. The assistant had an uneasy feeling that all was not quite back to normal. To be sure, there was only a little unevenness in the matching lines, but that might be almost enough to alter the fragile balance. He squared his mandibles resolutely, took stock of the display board, and made a few, very few, very minor adjustments, holding his breath as he worked. He must take care. Slowly. Slowly. Which will you have, the Nazarene or Barabbas? The Nazarene! The Nazarene! roared the crowd. In the hazy August sun the Yorkists rested and gave thanks for victory. In his pavilion... Richard Plantagenet rubbed at his polio-twisted shoulder and brooded over the rebellion. Tudor had fought well at the last, when forced to fight, but had made his campaign by treachery. The accusations of his nephew's murder laid to his door. Even now the memory of his defense before Parliament was fresh in his mind. Richard knew well how little it would have taken to change the course of history. If Tudor had been able to win over his cousin, the Duke of Buckingham, 
then all might have been lost. Suddenly Richard the Just of England laughed. What if Tudor's stories of crook-backed Dick had caught on? What a monster his memory might have become for generations. The fairest king of England would seem a villain, and Tudor, instead of a treacherous bastard, an avenging angel. With resignation he rose to receive the nobles of the last vestiges of the Tudor armies. On the Yellow River a bargeman poled his boat, and the sound of the nightingale rippled through the gentle air. In the inn of three gold dragons the young poet waited for the concubine to come to him. Now he was a man, and within his rights in the laws of China, and tonight he would celebrate his age and his status with the woman his father had paid for. He would wander in the sweet garden of her thighs and touch the gates of heaven in their loving. The door behind him opened, and the beautiful moon maiden came toward him, holding out a flask of wine on a tray with delicate porcelain cups. The blue flowers in her gown shone in the lantern light. Her face was round, smooth, and pale, as delightful as the laughter of children, serene as the moon. She looked at him, and then sat demurely beneath the ornamental maple tree. "'You are most enchanting,' he said to her. "'I am honoured to be with you this night.' "'This is your first time?' She asked him, in her shy, silvery voice, hands lingering suggestively on the rim of the tray. I blush to admit it. Here, she whispered to him as she extended her arm toward him, this will make it easier the first time. Wine makes all living more beautiful and more pleasant. She handed him the cup. Already half drunk from the woman and the night, Lai Po took the cup dazedly, lifting it to his lips in the gauze of a dream. Drink, it brings much joy, she urged him. He tasted it. The worst of cold reality thrust in upon him with the acrid stuff as it rolled across his tongue. Ta! He spat it out. That is terrible, I cannot drink that. Never. Keep me from wine, always. Wilkie won. The assistant beseeched any power that might be nearby to keep the instructor away from the lab just a little while longer. He knew that he almost had the problem solved. There were one or two factors to line up and a couple of simple details to verify, but it was really quite simple now. All he needed was time. He curled around the console and groped for the gauge to settle the whole thing. Ah, oh, God damn!' whined the shotgunner as a procession of flagellants approached them. All carried whips that they flailed over themselves and each other impartially. They were thin, gaunt beings, hardly human, with the deadly tokens on their chests, armpits and groins. They chanted as they went, the whips beating out the terrible rhythm around them. They were possessed not of demons, but of disease. One Indian, the shotgunner pleaded, just one flaming Indian. The flagellants paid no heed to the coach, but continued on their masochistic way. The driver didn't even look around. The tall man, bearded and grey-eyed, looked at the dispatches on his desk. He was grateful for the end of the bloody civil war. But it had taken a toll of him. Laughter was rarer with him now than it had been, and he knew he needed perspective. So tonight he and Mrs. Lincoln would be going to the theatre. He was looking forward to the play. It was David Garrick, as lucky, in waiting for Godot, he had heard it was more fun than Congress. The bells of St. Basil's and the Annunciation boomed as ominously as the sound of guns, as Tsar Peter pulled himself up to his near seven feet and icily informed the boyars that their long patriarchal beards would no longer be tolerated at court. The boyars gesticulated helplessly, feigning ineptness. Here, said the Tsar, with an air of great patience, use this and he handed them his personal, portable, battery-powered Norelco shaver. "'Europe has much to teach us,' he said sardonically. The Battle of Thermopylae was won, as Darius was to remind himself morosely ever after, by a handful of Spartans. Three M1 rifles, two air pistols, a sack full of grenades, and one roving reporter with a walkie-talkie. Oh, give me a home where the mastodons roam and the trilobites romp through the clay, where a large reindeer herd is attacked by a bird that can carry a dozen away. Tetrazzini sang it, and Paris loved it. 
The thing was made of stone not unlike cinnabar, and it shone like metallic spicy in the torch-lit room. "'You see,' said the strange black man in the peculiar clothing emblazoned with the mystic symbols M.I.T., "'it will be much easier with this. This will simplify the task considerably, Pharaoh. He pressed the hidden button, and the weird artifact hummed to the waiting Egyptians. "'What does it do? The sound is remarkable.' Pharaoh conceded, but has it any worth? Is it a religious object? To what god? Watch, the black man commanded, and even as he spoke, the platform, with Pharaoh on it, rose into the air. The Egyptians fell back, awed. But Pharaoh, beyond initial surprise, showed nothing but absorbed interest. Yes, I see. But does it do more than make a sound and hang things in the air? It does. The black man gestured with it, and the platform with Pharaoh swung easily about the room, dodging frightened guards. I see, repeated Pharaoh, as the platform settled to the floor, careful as a spinster. But what is this to me? Exalted one, the black man said, place as many men on this platform as you like, and still it will sing and float for you. With this simple device, mountains will rise as high as you command. Slaves and mules will not be necessary to you any longer. All you need to do is have this little gadget, and men to load and unload your platforms. Hmm, Pharaoh mused. Then his sharp eyes became eager slits. My tomb, my tomb, he whispered. Then raising his voice, wizard, for wizard you surely are, I require you to build my tomb with that, so that it may be larger than any other and more beautiful. At that the black man smiled, murmuring to himself, I wonder how Caltech is making out with the Mayans. The last knob was meticulously eased into place. The dial sounded a decisive click. The assistant held his breath, ran a quick scan over the screens, just to be sure. This developing world project was ticklish business, as he was finding out. He heaved himself the equivalent of a sigh of relief. Then he admitted that for a while he was afraid that he would have had to take the whole thing back to let there be light to put it all back in order. But he had been lucky this time. All was secure, and no one the wiser. The door opened. His instructor strode in, somber and full of lore. He fairly crackled with all the things he knew. Quickly he regarded his assistant, an air of suspicion about him. His hoary wisdom included a knowledge of young assistants and their over-enthusiastic tendencies. The assistant returned the look with perfect blandness. The instructor was puzzled, but turned away. It had worked! The assistant congratulated himself on his success, and blithely led the instructor to the display board. And all went well for the first few ranks of screen, and then the instructor became attentive in his boredom. That was the trouble. The instructor waved aside the assistant's narration and looked closely for himself. Even then everything went along splendidly for the assistant, until a cry of, "'Lay to and prepare to board!' came from the display board, and the assistant watched helplessly as the three galleons, with the arms of Spain on their sails, swung wide and prepared to grapple the moon. End of Cassandra Rising Edited by Alice Lawrence Narrated by Barbara Caruso in the studios of American Foundation for the Blind, Incorporated, for the Library of Congress, November 1978. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, Doubleday and Company, Incorporated. End of book.